This is Audible. Blackstone Publishing presents Propaganda, The Formation of Men's Attitudes by Jacques Ellul, translated by Conrad Kellen and Jean Lerner. This book is read by Arthur Morey. Introduction Jacques Ellul's view of propaganda and his approach to the study of propaganda are new. The principal difference between his thought edifice and most other literature on propaganda is that Ellul regards propaganda as a sociological phenomenon rather than as something made by certain people for certain purposes. Propaganda exists and thrives. It is the Siamese twin of our technological society. Only in the technological society can there be anything of the type and order of magnitude of modern propaganda, which is with us forever, and only with the all-pervading effects that flow from propaganda can the technological society hold itself together and further expand. Most people are easy prey for propaganda, Elul says, because of their firm but entirely erroneous conviction that it is composed only of lies and tall stories, and that, conversely, what is true cannot be propaganda. But modern propaganda has long disdained the ridiculous lies of the past and outmoded forms of propaganda. It operates instead with many different kinds of truth. Half-truth, limited truth, truth out of context. Even Goebbels always insisted that Wehrmacht communiques be as accurate as possible. A second basic misconception that makes people vulnerable to propaganda is the notion that it serves only to change opinions. That is one of its aims, but a limited, subordinate one. Much more importantly, it aims to intensify existing trends, to sharpen and focus them, and, above all, to lead men to action or when it is directed at immovable opponents to non-action through terror or discouragement to prevent them from interfering. Therefore, Elul distinguishes various forms of propaganda and calls his book Propagande, that plural is one of the keys to his concept. The most trenchant distinction made by Elul is between agitation propaganda and integration propaganda. The former leads men from mere resentment to rebellion. The latter aims at making them adjust themselves to desired patterns. The two types rely on entirely different means. Both exist all over the world. Integration propaganda is needed especially for the technological society to flourish, and its technological means, mass media among them, in turn make such integration propaganda possible. A related point central in Elul's thesis is that modern propaganda cannot work without education. He thus reverses the widespread notion that education is the best prophylactic against propaganda. On the contrary, he says, education, or what usually goes by that word in the modern world, is the absolute prerequisite for propaganda. In fact, education is largely identical with what Elul calls pre-propaganda, the conditioning of minds with vast amounts of incoherent information, already dispensed for ulterior purposes and posing as facts and as education. Elul follows through by designating intellectuals as virtually the most vulnerable of all to modern propaganda, for three reasons. One, they absorb the largest amount of second-hand, unverifiable information. Two, they feel a compelling need to have an opinion on every important question of our time, and thus easily succumb to opinions offered to them by propaganda on all such indigestible pieces of information. 3. They consider themselves capable of judging for themselves. They literally need propaganda. In fact, the need for propaganda on the part of the propagandee is one of the most powerful elements of Elul's thesis. Cast out of the disintegrating microgroups of the past, such as family, church, or village, the individual is plunged into mass society and thrown back upon his own inadequate resources. 
his isolation, his loneliness, his ineffectuality. Propaganda then hands him in verifiable abundance what he needs, a raison d'etre, personal involvement and participation in important events, an outlet and excuse for some of his more doubtful impulses, righteousness, all factitious to be sure, all more or less spurious, but he drinks it all in and asks for more. Without this intense collaboration by the propagandee, the propagandist would be helpless. Thus propaganda, by first creating pseudo-needs through pre-propaganda, and then providing pseudo-satisfactions for them, is pernicious. Can wholesome propaganda be made for a wholesome cause? Can democracy, Christianity, humanism be propagated by modern propaganda techniques? Elude traces the similarities among all propaganda efforts, communist, Nazi, democratic. He thinks that no one can use this intrinsically undemocratic weapon, or rather abandon himself to it unscathed or without undergoing deep transformations in the process. He shows the inevitable unwilled propaganda effects of which the good propagandist is unaware the fallout from any major propaganda activity and all its pernicious consequences. Most pernicious of all, the process, once fully launched, tends to become irreversible. Elude critically reviews what most American authors have written on the subject of propaganda and mass media, having studied the literature from Laswell to Reisman with great thoroughness. Accepting some of their findings, he rejects others, particularly the efforts to gauge the effects of propaganda. Elul believes that, on the whole, propaganda is much more effective, and effective in many more ways than most American analysis shows. Particularly, he rejects as unrealistic and meaningless all experiments that have been conducted with small groups. Propaganda is a unique phenomenon that results from the totality of forces pressing in upon an individual in his society, and therefore cannot be duplicated in a test tube. To make his many original points, Elul never relies on statistics or quantification, which he heartily disdains, but on observation and logic. His treatise is a fully integrated structure of thought in which Every piece fits in with all the others, be they a hundred pages apart. In this respect, his work resembles Schopenhauer's The World as Will and Idea, of which the philosopher said that the reader really to understand the book must read it twice, because no page in the book could be fully understood without knowledge of the whole. This procedure can hardly be suggested to the reader in our busy days, but he ought to be warned that to leaf through this book, will not suffice. Paul Pickrell in Harper's Magazine said of Elul's The Technological Society that Elul, a great man, had written with monumental calm and maddening thoroughness a magnificent book. Elul's propaganda is no less maddening, monumental, and thorough. What, in Elul's view, can mankind do? At the end of this book, Elul reaches neither a pessimistic nor an optimistic conclusion with regard to the future. He merely states that, in his view, propaganda is today a greater danger to mankind than any of the other more grandly advertised threats hanging over the human race. His superanalysis ends with a warning, not a prophecy. Conrad Kellen, February. 1965. Preface Propaganda, by whatever name we may call it, has become a very general phenomenon in the modern world. Differences in political regimes matter little. Differences in social levels are more important, and most important is national self-awareness. In the world today, there are three great propaganda blocs, the USSR, China, and the United States. These are the most important propaganda systems in terms of scope, depth, and coherence. Incidentally, they represent three entirely different types and methods of propaganda. 
Next are the propaganda systems, in various stages of development and effectiveness, but less advanced than in the three, of a whole group of countries. These are the socialist republics of Europe and Asia, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, East Germany, North Vietnam. They model their propaganda on that of the USSR, albeit with some gaps, some lack of understanding, and without adequate resources. Then there are West Germany, France, Spain, Egypt, South Vietnam, and Korea, with less elaborate and rather diffuse forms of propaganda. Countries such as Italy and Argentina, which once had powerful propaganda systems, no longer use this weapon. Whatever the diversity of countries and methods, they have one characteristic in common. Concern with effectiveness. Footnote. Goebbels said, We do not talk to say something but to obtain a certain effect. And F. C. Bartlett accurately states that the goal of propaganda is not to increase political understanding of events, but to obtain results through action. Propaganda is made, first of all, because of a will to action, for the purpose of effectively arming policy and giving irresistible power to its decisions. Footnote. Harold D. Laswell's definition of the goal of propaganda is accurate to maximize the power at home by subordinating groups and individuals while reducing the material cost of power. Similarly, in war, propaganda is an attempt to win victory with a minimum of physical expense. Before the war, propaganda is a substitute for physical violence. During the war, it is a supplement to it. Whoever handles this instrument can be concerned solely with effectiveness. This is the supreme law, which must never be forgotten when the phenomenon of propaganda is analyzed. Ineffective propaganda is no propaganda. This instrument belongs to the technological universe, shares its characteristics, and is indissolubly linked to it. Not only is propaganda itself a technique, it is also an indispensable condition for the development of technical progress and the establishment of a technological civilization. And, as with all techniques, propaganda is subject to the law of efficiency. But whereas it is relatively easy to study a precise technique, whose scope can be defined, a study of propaganda runs into some extraordinary obstacles. From the outset, it is obvious that there is great uncertainty about the phenomenon itself, arising first of all from a, a priori moral or political concepts. Propaganda is usually regarded as an evil. This in itself makes a study difficult. To study anything properly, one must put aside ethical judgments. Perhaps an objective study will lead us back to them, but only later, and with full cognizance of the fact. A second source of confusion is the general conviction, derived from past experience, that propaganda consists mainly of tall stories, disseminated by means of lies. To adopt this view is to prevent oneself from understanding anything about the actual phenomenon, which is very different from what it was in the past. Even when these obstacles have been removed, it is still very difficult to determine what constitutes propaganda in our world and what the nature of propaganda is. This is because it is a secret action. The temptation is then twofold. To agree with Jacques Briancourt that everything is propaganda because everything in the political or economic spheres seems to be penetrated and molded by this force, or, as certain modern American social scientists have done, to abandon the term propaganda altogether, because it cannot be defined with any degree of precision. Either course is inadmissible intellectual surrender. To adopt either attitude would lead us to abandon the study of a phenomenon that exists and needs to be defined. We then came up against the extreme difficulty of definition. We can immediately discard such simplistic definitions as Marbury B. Ogle's 
Propaganda is any effort to change opinions or attitudes. The propagandist is anyone who communicates his ideas with the intent of influencing his listener. Such a definition would include the teacher, the priest, indeed any person conversing with another on any topic. Such a broad definition clearly does not help us to understand the specific character of propaganda. As far as definitions are concerned, there has been a characteristic evolution in the United States. From 1920 to about 1933, the main emphasis was on the psychological. Propaganda is a manipulation of psychological symbols having goals of which the listener is not conscious. Footnote. John Albig has named these elements of definition the secret character of the sources and goals of propaganda, the intention to modify opinions, the dissemination of conclusions of doubtful validity, the notion of inculcating ideas rather than explaining them. This is partially correct, but outdated. Since the appearance of Laswell's studies, propaganda by other means and with stated objectives has been considered possible. Attention then became focused on the intention of the propagandist. In more recent books, the aim to indoctrinate, particularly in regard to political, economic, and social matters, has been regarded as the hallmark of propaganda. Within this frame of reference, one could determine what constitutes propaganda by looking at the propagandist. Such and such a person is a propagandist, therefore his words and deeds are propaganda. But it appears that American authors eventually accepted the definition given by the Institute for Propaganda Analysis and inspired by Laswell. Propaganda is the expression of opinions or actions carried out deliberately by individuals or groups with a view to influencing the opinions or actions of other individuals or groups for predetermined ends and through psychological manipulations. Footnote the idea is often added that propaganda deals with controversial questions in a group. More profound is Daniel Lerner's idea that propaganda is a means of altering power ratios in a group by modifying attitudes through manipulation of symbols. However, I am not entirely in agreement with the exclusively psychological character of this definition. We could quote definitions for pages on end. An Italian author, Antonio Miotto, says that propaganda is a technique of social pressure which tends to create psychological or social groups with a unified structure across the homogeneity of the affective and mental states of the individuals under consideration. For Leonard W. Doob, the well-known American specialist, it is an attempt to modify personalities and control the behavior of individuals in relation to goals considered non-scientific or of doubtful value in a specific society and time period. And we would find even more remote definitions if we examined the German or Russian literature on the subject. I will not give a definition of my own here. I only wanted to show the uncertainty among specialists on the question. I consider it more useful to proceed with the analysis of the characteristics of propaganda as an existing sociological phenomenon. It is perhaps proper to underline this term. We shall examine propaganda in both its past and present forms. For obviously, we cannot eliminate from our study the highly developed propaganda systems of Hitler's Germany, Stalin's Russia, and fascist Italy. This seems obvious, but is not. Many writers do not agree with this approach. They establish a certain image or definition of propaganda and proceed to the study of whatever corresponds to their definition. Or, yielding to the attraction of a scientific study, they try to experiment with some particular method of propaganda on small groups and in small doses, at which moment it ceases to be propaganda. To study propaganda, we must turn not to the psychologist, but to the propagandist. We must examine not a test group, but a whole nation subjected to real and effective propaganda. 
Of course, this excludes all so-called scientific, that is, statistical types of study, but at least we shall have respected the object of our study, unlike many present-day specialists who establish a rigorous method of observation, but in order to apply it, lose the object to be studied. Rather, we shall consider what the nature of propaganda is wherever it is applied and wherever it is dominated by a concern for effectiveness. Finally, we take the term propaganda in its broadest sense, so that it embraces the following areas. Psychological action. The propagandist seeks to modify opinions by purely psychological means. Most often he pursues a semi-educative object and addresses himself to his fellow citizens. Psychological warfare Here the propagandist is dealing with a foreign adversary whose morale he seeks to destroy by psychological means, so that the opponent begins to doubt the validity of his beliefs and actions. Footnote Maurice Maigret's analysis distinguishes three parts a propaganda agency, support of military operations, a politico-military action to ensure the submission of the population by technical, non-violent means, a coherent thought system. Re-education and brainwashing, complex methods of transforming an adversary into an ally, which can be used only on prisoners. Public and human relations. These must necessarily be included in propaganda. This statement may shock some readers, but we shall show that these activities are propaganda because they seek to adapt the individual to a society, to a living standard, to an activity. They serve to make him conform, which is the aim of all propaganda. Propaganda in its broad sense includes all of these. In the narrow sense, it is characterized by an institutional quality. In propaganda, we find techniques of psychological influence combined with techniques of organization and the envelopment of people with the intention of sparking action. This, then, will be the broad field of our inquiry. From this complete universe of propaganda, I have deliberately excluded the following subjects found in most propaganda studies. Historical accounts of propaganda, particularly of the recent past, Propaganda in 1914 or 1940, and so forth. Propaganda and public opinion as an entity, considering public opinion, its formation, and so forth as the major problem, and propaganda as a simple instrument for forming or changing opinion as the minor problem. Psychological foundations of propaganda. On what prejudices, drives, motivations, passions, complexes does the propagandist play? What psychic force does he utilize to obtain his results? The techniques of propaganda. How does the propagandist put the psychic force into action? How can he reach people? How can he induce them to act? The media of propaganda. The mass media of communication. Such are the five chapter headings found everywhere. Somewhat less common are studies on the characteristics of the great examples of propaganda. Hitlerite, Stalinist, American, and so on. These are omitted here precisely because they have been frequently analyzed. The reader will find in the bibliography all that is useful to know on each of these questions. I have instead tried to examine aspects of propaganda very rarely treated, to adopt a point of view, a perspective, an unorthodox view. I have sought to use a method that is neither abstract nor statistical, but occasionally relies on existing studies. The reader should know that he is not dealing with an encyclopedia of propaganda, but with a work that assumes his familiarity with its psychological foundations, techniques, and methods, and that endeavors to bring contemporary man a step closer to an awareness of propaganda, the very phenomenon that conditions and regulates him. On the other hand, I have considered propaganda as a whole. It is usual to pass ethical judgments on its ends, judgments that then redound on propaganda considered as a means, such as, because democracy is good and dictatorship bad, 
Propaganda serving a democracy is good, even if, as a technique, it is identical with propaganda serving a dictatorship. Or, because socialism is good and fascism bad, propaganda is not altogether evil in the hands of socialists, but is totally evil in fascist hands. Footnote. This is what Sergei Chakotin claims. I repudiate this attitude. Propaganda as a phenomenon is essentially the same in China or the Soviet Union or the United States or Algeria. Techniques tend to align themselves with one another. The media of dissemination may be more or less perfected, more or less directly used, just as organizations may be more or less effective, but that does not change the heart of the problem. Those who accept the principle of propaganda and decide to utilize it will inevitably employ the most effective organization and methods. Footnote As Maigret has said, the officers in Indochina who came in contact with North Vietnamese propaganda had an overall political view that substituted itself for the fragmented use of the technical means of propaganda. All this is part of the progression from old ideas to new phenomena. Moreover, the premise of this book is that propaganda, no matter who makes it, be he the most upright and best-intentioned of men, has certain identical results in communism or Hitlerism or Western democracy, inevitable results on the individual or groups, and different from the doctrine promulgated or the regime supported by that propaganda. In other words, Hitlerism as a regime had certain effects and the propaganda used by the Nazis undeniably had certain specific characteristics. But whereas most analysts stop at this specificity, I have tried to eliminate it in order to look only at the most general characteristics, the effects common to all cases, to all methods of propaganda. Therefore I have adopted the same perspective and the same method in studying propaganda as in studying any other technique. I shall devote much space to the fact that propaganda has become an inescapable necessity for everyone. In this connection, I have come upon a source of much misunderstanding. Modern man worships facts. That is, he accepts facts as the ultimate reality. He is convinced that what is, is good. He believes that facts in themselves provide evidence and proof, and he willingly subordinates values to them. He obeys what he believes to be necessity, which he somehow connects with the idea of progress. This stereotyped ideological attitude inevitably results in a confusion between judgments of probability and judgments of value. Because fact is the sole criterion, it must be good. Consequently, it is assumed that anyone who states a fact, even without passing judgment on it, is therefore in favor of it. Anyone who asserts, simply stating a judgment of probability, that the communists will win some elections, is immediately considered pro-communist. Anyone who says that all human activity is increasingly dominated by technology is viewed as a technocrat, and so on. As we proceed to analyze the development of propaganda to consider its inescapable influence in the modern world and its connection with all structures of our society, the reader will be tempted to see an approval of propaganda. Because propaganda is presented as a necessity, such a work would therefore force the author to make propaganda, to foster it, to intensify it. I want to emphasize that nothing is further from my mind. Such an assumption is possible only by those who worship facts and power. In my opinion, necessity never establishes legitimacy. The world of necessity is a world of weakness, a world that denies man. To say that a phenomenon is necessary means for me that it denies man. Its necessity is proof of its power, not proof of its excellence. However, confronted by a necessity, man must become aware of it if he is to master it. As long as man denies the inevitability of a phenomenon, as long as he avoids facing up to it, 
he will go astray. He will delude himself by submitting in fact to necessity, while pretending that he is free in spite of it, and simply because he claims to be free. Only when he realizes his delusion will he experience the beginning of genuine freedom, in the act of realization itself, be it only from the effort to stand back and look squarely at the phenomenon and reduce it to raw fact. The force of propaganda is a direct attack against man. The question is to determine how great is the danger. Most replies are based on unconscious a priori dogmas. Thus, the communists who do not believe in human nature but only in the human condition believe that propaganda is all-powerful, legitimate, whenever they employ it, and instrumental in creating a new type of man. American sociologists scientifically try to play down the effectiveness of propaganda because they cannot accept the idea that the individual, that cornerstone of democracy, can be so fragile, and because they retain their ultimate trust in man. Personally, I too tend to believe in the preeminence of man, and consequently in his invincibility. Nevertheless, as I observe the facts, I realize man is terribly malleable, uncertain of himself, ready to accept and to follow many suggestions, and is tossed about by all the winds of doctrine. But when, in the course of these pages, I shall reveal the full power of propaganda against man, when I advance to the very threshold of showing the most profound changes in his personality, it does not mean I am anti-democratic. The strength of propaganda reveals, of course, one of the most dangerous flaws of democracy. But that has nothing to do with my own opinion. If I am in favor of democracy, I can only regret that propaganda renders the true exercise of it almost impossible. But I think it would be even worse to entertain any illusions about a coexistence of true democracy and propaganda. Nothing is worse in times of danger than to live in a dream world. To warn a political system of the menace hanging over it does not imply an attack against it, but is the greatest service one can render the system. The same goes for man. To warn him of his weakness is not to attempt to destroy him, but rather to encourage him to strengthen himself. I have no sympathy with the haughty aristocratic intellectual who judges from on high, believing himself invulnerable to the destructive forces of his time, and disdainfully considers the common people as cattle to be manipulated, to be molded by the action of propaganda in the most intimate aspects of their being. I insist that to give such warning is an act in the defense of man, that I am not judging propaganda with Olympian detachment, and that having suffered, felt, and analyzed the impact of the power of propaganda on myself, having been time and again and still being the object of propaganda, I want to speak of it as a menace which threatens the total personality. In order to delineate the real dimensions of propaganda, we must always consider it within the context of civilization. Perhaps the most fundamental defect of most studies made on the subject is their attempt to analyze propaganda as an isolated phenomenon. This corresponds to the rather prevalent attitude that separates socio-political phenomena from each other and of not establishing any correlation between parts an attitude that in turn reassures the student of the validity of the various systems. Democracy, for example, is studied as if the citizen were an entity separate from the state, as if public opinion were a thing in itself. Meanwhile, the scientific study of public opinion and propaganda is left to other specialists, and the specialist in public opinion in turn relies on the jurist to define a suitable legal framework for democracy. The problems of the technological society are studied without reference to their possible influence on mental and emotional life. The labor movement is examined without attention to the changes brought about by psychological means, and so on. Again, I want to emphasize that the study of propaganda must be conducted within the context of the technological society. Propaganda is called upon to solve problems created by technology, 
to play on maladjustments, and to integrate the individual into a technological world. Propaganda is a good deal less the political weapon of a regime. It is that also than the effect of a technological society that embraces the entire man and tends to be a completely integrated society. At the present time, propaganda is the innermost and most elusive manifestation of this trend. Propaganda must be seen as situated at the center of the growing powers of the state and governmental and administrative techniques. People keep saying, everything depends on what kind of a state makes use of propaganda. But if we really have understood the technological state, such a statement becomes meaningless. In the midst of increasing mechanization and technological organization, propaganda is simply the means used to prevent these things from being felt as too oppressive and to persuade man to submit with good grace. When man will be fully adapted to this technological society, when he will end by obeying with enthusiasm, convinced of the excellence of what he is forced to do, the constraint of the organization will no longer be felt by him. The truth is, it will no longer be a constraint, and the police will have nothing to do. The civic and technological goodwill, and the enthusiasm for the right social myths, both created by propaganda, will finally have solved the problem of man. Jacques Ellul, 1962 Chapter 1 The Characteristics of Propaganda True modern propaganda can only function within the context of the modern scientific system. But what is it? Many observers look upon propaganda as a collection of gimmicks and of more or less serious practices. Footnote. Most French psychologists and psychosociologists do not regard propaganda as a serious practice or as having much influence. And psychologists and sociologists very often reject the scientific character of these practices. For our part, we completely agree that propaganda is a technique rather than a science. Footnote. In this connection, Albig is right to stress that propaganda cannot be a science, because in the field in which it applies, there can be neither valid generalizations nor constant factors. But it is a modern technique. That is, it is based on one or more branches of science. Propaganda is the expression of these branches of science. It moves with them, shares in their successes, and bears witness to their failures. The time is past when propaganda was a matter of individual inspiration, personal subtlety, or the use of unsophisticated tricks. Now science has entered propaganda, as we shall reveal from four different points of view. First of all, modern propaganda is based on scientific analyses of psychology and sociology. Step by step, the propagandist builds his techniques on the basis of his knowledge of man, his tendencies, his desires, his needs, his psychic mechanisms, his conditioning, and as much on social psychology as on depth psychology. He shapes his procedures on the basis of our knowledge of groups and their laws of formation and dissolution of mass influences, and of environmental limitations. Without the scientific research of modern psychology and sociology, there would be no propaganda. Or, rather, we still would be in the primitive stages of propaganda that existed in the time of Pericles or Augustus. Of course, propagandists may be insufficiently versed in these branches of science. They may misunderstand them go beyond the cautious conclusions of the psychologists, or claim to apply certain psychological discoveries that, in fact, do not apply at all. But all this only shows efforts to find new ways. Only for the past fifty years have men sought to apply the psychological and sociological sciences. The important thing is that propaganda has decided to submit itself to science and to make use of it. Of course, psychologists may be scandalized and say that this is a misuse of their science, but this argument carries no weight. 
The same applies to our physicists and the atomic bomb. The scientist should know that he lives in a world in which his discoveries will be utilized. Propagandists inevitably will have a better understanding of sociology and psychology, use them with increasing precision, and as a result, become more effective. Second, propaganda is scientific in that it tends to establish a set of rules, rigorous, precise, and tested, that are not merely recipes but impose themselves on every propagandist, who is less and less free to follow his own impulses. He must apply increasingly and exactly certain precise formulas that can be applied by anybody with the proper training, clearly a characteristic of a technique based on science. Third, what is needed nowadays is an exact analysis of both the environment and the individual to be subjected to propaganda. No longer does the man of talent determine the method, the approach, or the subject. All that is now being calculated, or must be calculated. Therefore, one type of propaganda will be found suitable in one situation and completely useless in another. To undertake an active propaganda operation, it is necessary to make a scientific, sociological, and psychological analysis first, and then utilize those branches of science which are becoming increasingly well-known. But here again, proper training is necessary for those who want to use them with their full effectiveness. Finally, one last trait reveals the scientific character of modern propaganda the increasing attempt to control its use, measure its results, define its effects. This is very difficult, but the propagandist is no longer content to have obtained or to believe he has obtained a certain result. He seeks precise evidence. Even successful political results do not completely satisfy him. He wants to understand the how and why of them and measure their exact effect. He is prompted by a certain spirit of experimentation and a desire to ponder the results. From this point on, one can see the beginning of scientific method. Admittedly, it is not yet very widespread, and those who analyze results are not active propagandists, but philosophers. Granted, that reveals a certain division of labor, nothing more. It indicates that propaganda is no longer a self-contained action covering up for evil deeds. It is an object of serious thought and proceeds along scientific channels. Some people object to this. One frequently hears psychologists ridicule the claim to a scientific basis advanced by the propagandist and reject the latter's claims of having employed scientific techniques. The psychology he uses is not scientific psychology. The sociology he uses is not scientific sociology. But after a careful look at the controversy, one comes to this conclusion. Stalinist propaganda was in great measure founded on Pavlov's theory of the conditioned reflex. Hitlerian propaganda was in great measure founded on Freud's theory of repression and libido. American propaganda is founded in great measure on Dewey's theory of teaching. Now, if a psychologist does not accept the idea of the conditioned reflex and doubts that it can be created in man, he then rejects Pavlov's interpretation of psychological phenomena and concludes that all propaganda based on it is pseudoscientific. It is obviously the same for those who question the findings of Freud, Dewey, or anybody else. What does this mean, then? That propaganda does not rest on a scientific base? Certainly not. Rather, that scientists are not agreed among themselves on the domains, methods, or conclusions of psychology and sociology. A psychologist who rejects the theory of one of his colleagues rejects a scientific theory and not merely the inferences that a technician may draw from it. One cannot blame the propagandist if he has confidence in a particular sociologist or psychologist whose theory is generally accepted and who is, at a given time and in a given country, considered a scientist. Moreover, let us not forget that if this theory, put to use by the propagandist, brings results and proves to be effective, it thereby receives additional confirmation, and that simple doctrinal criticism 
can no longer demonstrate its inaccuracy. 1. External Characteristics The Individual and the Masses Any modern propaganda will, first of all, address itself at one and the same time to the individual and to the masses. It cannot separate the two elements. For propaganda to address itself to the individual, in his isolation apart from the crowd, is impossible. The individual is of no interest to the propagandist. As an isolated unit, he presents much too much resistance to external action. To be effective, Propaganda cannot be concerned with detail, not only because to win men over one by one takes much too long, but also because to create certain convictions in an isolated individual is much too difficult. Propaganda ceases where simple dialogue begins. And that is why, in particular, experiments undertaken in the United States to gauge the effectiveness of certain propaganda methods or arguments on isolated individuals are not conclusive. They do not reproduce the real propaganda situation. Conversely, propaganda does not aim simply at the mass, the crowd. A propaganda that functioned only where individuals are gathered together would be incomplete and insufficient. Also, any propaganda aimed only at groups as such, as if a mass were a specific body having a soul and reactions and feelings entirely different from individuals' souls, reactions, and feelings, would be an abstract propaganda that likewise would have no effectiveness. Modern propaganda reaches individuals enclosed in the mass, and as participants in that mass. Yet it also aims at a crowd, but only as a body composed of individuals. What does this mean? First of all, that the individual never is considered as an individual, but always in terms of what he has in common with others, such as his motivations, his feelings, or his myths. He is reduced to an average, and, except for a small percentage, action based on averages will be effectual. Moreover, the individual is considered part of the mass and included in it, and so far as possible is systematically integrated into it, because in that way his psychic defenses are weakened, his reactions are easier to provoke, and the propagandist profits from the process of diffusion of emotions through the mass, and at the same time from the pressures felt by an individual when in a group. Emotionalism, impulsiveness, excess, etc., all these characteristics of the individual caught up in a mass are well known and very helpful to propaganda. Therefore, the individual must never be considered as being alone. The listener to a radio broadcast, though actually alone, is nevertheless part of a large group, and he is aware of it. Radio listeners have been found to exhibit a mass mentality. All are tied together and constitute a sort of society in which all individuals are accomplices and influence each other without knowing it. The same holds true for propaganda that is carried on by door-to-door -door visits, direct contacts, petitions for signatures. Although apparently one deals here with a single individual, one deals in reality with a unit submerged into an invisible crowd composed of all those who have been interviewed, who are being interviewed, and who will be interviewed because they hold similar ideas and live by the same myths, and especially because they are targets of the same organism. Being the target of a party or an administration is enough to immerse the individual in that sector of the population which the propagandist has in his sights. This simple fact makes the individual part of the mass. He is no longer Mr. X, but part of a current flowing in a particular direction. The current flows through the canvasser, who is not a person speaking in his own name with his own arguments, but one segment of an administration, an organization, a collective movement, when he enters a room to canvas a person, the mass, and moreover the organized leveled mass, enters with him. No relationship exists here between man and man. The organization is what exerts its attraction on an individual already part of a mass because he is in the same sights as all the others being canvassed. 
Conversely, when propaganda is addressed to a crowd, it must touch each individual in that crowd, in that whole group. To be effective, it must give the impression of being personal. For we must never forget that the mass is composed of individuals and is, in fact, nothing but assembled individuals. Actually, just because men are in a group and therefore weakened, receptive, and in a state of psychological regression, they pretend all the more to be strong individuals. The mass man is clearly subhuman, but pretends to be superhuman. He is more suggestible, but insists he is more forceful. He is more unstable, but thinks he is firm in his convictions. If one openly treats the mass as a mass, the individuals who form it will feel themselves belittled and will refuse to participate. If one treats these individuals as children, and they are children because they are in a group, they will not accept their leader's projections or identify with him. They will withdraw, and we will not be able to get anything out of them. On the contrary, each one must feel individualized. Each must have the impression that he is being looked at, that he is being addressed personally. Only then will he respond and cease to be anonymous, although in reality remaining anonymous. Thus all modern propaganda profits from the structure of the mass, but exploits the individual's need for self-affirmation, and the two actions must be conducted jointly simultaneously. Of course, this operation is greatly facilitated by the existence of the modern mass media of communication, which have precisely this remarkable effect of reaching the whole crowd all at once, and yet reaching each one in that crowd. Readers of the evening paper, radio listeners, movie or TV viewers certainly constitute a mass that has an organic existence although it is diffused and not assembled at one point. These individuals are moved by the same motives, receive the same impulses and impressions, find themselves focused on the same centers of interest, experience the same feelings, have generally the same order of reactions and ideas, participate in the same myths, and all this at the same time. What we have here is really a psychological, if not a biological, mass and the individuals in it are modified by this existence even if they do not know it. Yet each one is alone. The newspaper reader, the radio listener, he therefore feels himself individually concerned as a person, as a participant. The movie spectator also is alone. Though elbow to elbow with his neighbors, he still is, because of the darkness and the hypnotic attraction of the screen, perfectly alone. This is the situation of the lonely crowd, or of isolation in the mass, which is a natural product of present-day society, and which is both used and deepened by the mass media. The most favorable moment to seize a man and influence him is when he is alone in the mass. It is at this point that propaganda can be most effective. We must emphasize this circle which we shall meet again and again. The structure of present-day society places the individual where he is most easily reached by propaganda. The media of mass communication, which are part of the technical evolution of this society, deepen this situation while making it possible to reach the individual man, integrated in the mass, and what these media do is exactly what propaganda must do in order to attain its objectives. In reality, propaganda cannot exist without using these mass media. If, by chance, propaganda is addressed to an organized group, it can have practically no effect on individuals before that group has been fragmented. Footnote Edward A. Schills and Morris Janowitz have demonstrated the importance of the group in the face of propaganda. The Germans, they claim, did not yield earlier in World War II because the various groups of their military structure held fast. Propaganda cannot do much when the social group has not disintegrated. The play of opinions has relatively little importance. This is discussed later in Appendix 1. Such fragmentation can be achieved through action. 
but it is equally possible to fragment a group by psychological means. The transformation of very small groups by purely psychological means is one of the most important techniques of propaganda. Only when very small groups are thus annihilated, when the individual finds no more defenses, no equilibrium, no resistance exercised by the group to which he belongs, does total action by propaganda become possible. This will be discussed in Appendix 2. Total Propaganda Propaganda must be total. The propagandist must utilize all of the technical means at his disposal. The press, radio, TV, movies, posters, meetings, door-to-door -door canvassing. Modern propaganda must utilize all these media. There is no propaganda as long as one makes use, in sporadic fashion and at random, of a newspaper article here, a poster or a radio program there, organizes a few meetings and lectures, writes a few slogans on walls. That is not propaganda. Each usable medium has its own particular way of penetration, specific but at the same time localized and limited. By itself it cannot attack the individual, break down his resistance, make his decisions for him. A movie does not play on the same motives, does not produce the same feelings, does not provoke the same reactions as a newspaper. The very fact that the effectiveness of each medium is limited to one particular area clearly shows the necessity of complementing it with other media. A word spoken on the radio is not the same, does not produce the same effect, does not have the same impact as the identical word spoken in private conversation or in a public speech before a large crowd. To draw the individual into the net of propaganda, each technique must be utilized in its own specific way, directed toward producing the effect it can best produce, and fused with all the other media, each of them reaching the individual in a specific fashion, and making him react anew to the same theme, in the same direction, but differently. Thus, one leaves no part of the intellectual or emotional life alone. Man is surrounded on all sides, man and men, for we must also bear in mind that these media do not all reach the same public in the same way. Those who go to the movies three times a week are not the same people who read the newspapers with care. The tools of propaganda are thus oriented in terms of their public and must be used in a concerted fashion to reach the greatest possible number of individuals. For example, the poster is a popular medium for reaching those without automobiles. Radio newscasts are listened to in the better circles. We must note, finally, that each medium includes a third aspect of specialization, saving for later our analysis of the fact that there are quite diverse forms of propaganda. Each medium is particularly suited to a certain type of propaganda. The movies and human contacts are the best media for sociological propaganda in terms of social climate, slow infiltration, progressive inroads, and overall integration. Public meetings and posters are more suitable tools for providing shock propaganda, intense but temporary, leading to immediate action. The press tends more to shape general views. Radio is likely to be an instrument of international action and psychological warfare, whereas the press is used domestically. In any case, it is understood that because of this specialization, not one of these instruments may be left out. They must all be used in combination. The propagandist uses a keyboard and composes a symphony. It is a matter of reaching and encircling the whole man and all men. Propaganda tries to surround man by all possible routes, in the realm of feelings as well as ideas, by playing on his will or on his needs, through his conscious and his unconscious, assailing him in both his private and his public life. It furnishes him with a complete system for explaining the world and provides immediate incentives to action. We are here in the presence of an organized myth that tries to take hold of the entire person. Through the myth it creates, Propaganda imposes a complete range of intuitive knowledge, susceptible of only one interpretation, unique and one-sided, and precluding any divergence. 
This myth becomes so powerful that it invades every area of consciousness, leaving no faculty or motivation intact. It stimulates in the individual a feeling of exclusiveness and produces a biased attitude. The myth has such motive force that, once accepted, it controls the whole of the individual, who becomes immune to any other influence. This explains the totalitarian attitude that the individual adopts, wherever a myth has been successfully created, and that simply reflects the totalitarian action of propaganda on him. Not only does propaganda seek to invade the whole man, to lead him to adopt a mystical attitude and reach him through all possible psychological channels, but more, it speaks to all men. Propaganda cannot be satisfied with partial successes, for it does not tolerate discussion. By its very nature, it excludes contradiction and discussion. As long as a noticeable or expressed tension or a conflict of action remains, propaganda cannot be said to have accomplished its aim. It must produce quasi-unanimity, and the opposing faction must become negligible or, in any case, cease to be vocal. Extreme propaganda must win over the adversary and at least use him by integrating him into its own frame of reference. That is why it was so important to have an Englishman speak on the Nazi radio or a General Paulus on the Soviet radio, why it was so important for the propaganda of the Falaga to make use of articles in Le Serviteur and L'Express, and for French propaganda to obtain statements from repentant Falaga. Clearly, the ultimate was achieved by Soviet propaganda in the self-criticism of its opponents. That the enemy of a regime, or of the faction in power, can be made to declare, while he is still the enemy, that this regime was right, that his opposition was criminal, and that his condemnation is just. That is the ultimate result of totalitarian propaganda. The enemy, while still remaining the enemy, and because he is the enemy, is converted into a supporter of the regime. This is not simply a very useful and effective means of propaganda. Let us also note that, under the Khrushchev regime, the propaganda of self-criticism continued to function just as before. Marshal Buganin's self-criticism was the most characteristic example. Here we are seeing the total, all-devouring propaganda mechanism in action. It cannot leave any segment of opinion outside its sphere. It cannot tolerate any sort of independence. Everything must be brought back into this unique sphere of action, which is an end in itself and can be justified only if virtually every man ends up by participating in it. This brings us to another aspect of total propaganda. The propagandist must combine the elements of propaganda as in a real orchestration. On the one hand, he must keep in mind the stimuli that can be utilized at a given moment and must organize them. This results in a propaganda campaign. Footnote. Many analyses of various possible topics of gimmicks have been made often. The most elementary was made in 1942 by the Institute for Propaganda Analysis, C. Eugene L. Hartley, Fundamentals of Social Psychology, New York, Alfred A. Knopf, 1952. A more profound analysis is that of Lenin's strategy of propaganda. First stage, the creation in each organization of solid cores of well-indoctrinated men. Second stage, cooperation with allies in political tasks that can compromise them. Third stage, when the maximum advantage is reached, propaganda to demoralize the adversaries, inevitably of the communist victory, injustice of the adversary's cause, failure of his means, etc. The analysis of the type of campaign conducted by Hitler has been well done. Kurt Rice, Joseph Goebbels, a Biography, New York, Doubleday and Company, 1948, demonstrating the precise timing of the moment when a campaign should start and when it should stop, the silences and the verbal assaults, a schedule of the use of rumors, neutral information, commentaries, monumental mass meetings, crowning all and aiming at concentrating the fire of all media on one particular point, 
a single theme, a single enemy, a single idea, the campaign uses this concentration of all media, but progressively, for the public will take better to gradual attacks. A good analysis of a Hitlerian campaign has been made by Jerome S. Bruner in Cats et al., Public Opinion and Propaganda, New York, Dryden Press, 1954, and on propaganda campaigns in general by Leonard W. Doob. Propaganda, Its Psychology and Technique, New York, Henry Holt and Campaign, 1935. On the other hand, the propagandist must use various instruments, each in relation to all the others. Alongside the mass media of communication, propaganda employs censorship, legal texts, proposed legislation, international conferences, and so forth, thus introducing elements seemingly alien to propaganda. We should not only consider the mass media. Personal contacts are considered increasingly effective. Educational methods play an immense role in political indoctrination. Lenin, Mao. A conference on Lenin's doctrine of the state is propaganda. Information is extremely helpful to propaganda, as we shall demonstrate. To explain correctly the present state of affairs is the great task of the agitator. Mao emphasizes that in 1928, an effective form of propaganda was the release of prisoners after they had been indoctrinated. The same was true of the care given to the enemy wounded. All this was to show the goodwill of the communists. Everything can serve as a means of propaganda, and everything must be utilized. In this way, diplomacy becomes inseparable from propaganda. We shall study this fact in Chapter 4. Education and training are inevitably taken over, as the Napoleonic Empire demonstrated for the first time. No contrast can be tolerated between teaching and propaganda, between the critical spirit formed by higher education and the exclusion of independent thought. One must utilize the education of the young to condition them to what comes later. The schools and all methods of instruction are transformed under such conditions, with the child integrated into the conformist group in such a way that the individualist is tolerated not by the authorities but by his peers. Religion and the churches are constrained to hold on to their own places in the orchestra if they want to survive. Footnote This was the case in the Orthodox Church and the USSR during the war. Napoleon expressly formulated the doctrine of propaganda by the Church. The judicial apparatus is also utilized. Footnote In France, an example is the trial of the Janson Network, September 1960, which aided the propaganda against insubordination and aid to the FLN. It is interesting to find this same idea of educational trials in Goebbels and Soviet jurists. The law itself in the USSR is an instrument of propaganda intended to make people like the Soviet order. The tribunal is a means of preaching to the public. Finally, Mao has shown how the army can become a most effective propaganda instrument for those who are in it and for the occupied peoples. The French army tried to do the same in Algeria, but with less success. It is evident that information itself becomes propaganda. Or rather, wherever propaganda appears, there follows an inextricable confusion between propaganda and information. Amusements, distractions, or games can be instruments of propaganda, as well as films for children in the USSR and the games used in American social group work. Of course, a trial can be an admirable springboard of propaganda for the accused who can spread his ideas and his defense and exert an influence by the way he suffers his punishment. This holds true in the democracies. But the situation is reversed where a totalitarian state makes propaganda. During a trial there, the judge is forced to demonstrate a lesson for the education of the public. Verdicts are educational and we know the importance of confessions in the great show trials. For example, the Reichstag fire, the Moscow trials of 1936, 
the Nuremberg trials, and innumerable trials in the people's democracies after 1945. Finally, propaganda will take over literature, present and past, and history, which must be rewritten according to propaganda's needs. We must not say this is done by tyrannical, autocratic, totalitarian governments. In fact, it is the result of propaganda itself. Propaganda carries within itself, of intrinsic necessity, the power to take over everything that can serve it. Let us remember the innocent example of democratic, liberal, republican propaganda, which without hesitation took over many things in the 19th century. Perhaps without realizing it and in good faith, but that is not an excuse. Let us remember the Athenian democracy, the Roman Republic, the movement of the medieval communes, the Renaissance, and the Reformation. History was hardly less modified then than Russian history was by the Bolsheviks. We know, on the other hand, how propaganda takes over the literature of the past, furnishing it with contexts and explanations designed to reintegrate it into the present. From a thousand examples, we will choose just one. In an article in Pravda in May 1957, the Chinese writer Mao Dun wrote that the ancient poets of China used the following words to express the striving of the people toward a better life. The flowers perfume the air, the moon shines, man has a long life. And he added, Allow me to give a new explanation of these poetic terms. The flowers perfume the air. This means that the flowers of the art of socialist realism are incomparably beautiful. The moon shines. This means that the Sputnik has opened a new era in the conquest of space. Man has a long life. This means that the great Soviet Union will live tens and tens of thousands of years. When one reads this once, one smiles. If one reads it a thousand times and no longer reads anything else, one must undergo a change. And we must reflect on the transformation of perspective already suffered by a whole society in which texts like this, published by the thousands, can be distributed and taken seriously not only by the authorities, but by the intellectuals. This complete change of perspective of the Weltanschauung is the primary totalitarian element of propaganda. Finally, the propagandist must use not only all of the instruments, but also different forms of propaganda. There are many types of propaganda, though there is a present tendency to combine them. Direct propaganda aimed at modifying opinions and attitudes must be preceded by propaganda that is sociological in character, slow, general, seeking to create a climate, an atmosphere of favorable preliminary attitudes. No direct propaganda can be effective without pre-propaganda, which, without direct or noticeable aggression, is limited to creating ambiguities, reducing prejudices, and spreading images apparently without purpose. The spectator will be much more disposed to believe in the grandeur of France when he has seen a dozen films on French petroleum, railroads, or jetliners. The ground must be sociologically prepared before one can proceed to direct prompting. Sociological propaganda can be compared to plowing, direct propaganda to sowing. You cannot do the one without doing the other first. Both techniques must be used, for sociological propaganda alone will never induce an individual to change his actions. It leaves him at the level of his everyday life and will not lead him to make decisions. Propaganda of the word and propaganda of the deed are complementary. Talk must correspond to something visible. The visible, active element must be explained by talk. Oral or written propaganda, which plays on opinions, not sentiments, must be reinforced by propaganda of action, which produces new attitudes and thus joins the individual firmly to a certain movement. Here again, you cannot have one without the other. We must also distinguish between covert propaganda and overt propaganda. The former tends to hide its aims, identity, significance, and source. The people are not aware that someone is trying to influence them, 
and do not feel that they are being pushed in a certain direction. This is often called black propaganda. It also makes use of mystery and silence. The other kind, white propaganda, is open and above board. There is a ministry of propaganda. One admits that propaganda is being made. Its source is known. Its aims and intentions are identified. The public knows that an attempt is being made to influence it. The propagandist is forced to use both kinds, to combine them, for they pursue different objectives. Overt propaganda is necessary for attacking enemies. It alone is capable of reassuring one's own forces. It is a manifestation of strength and good organization, a token of victory. But covert propaganda is more effective if the aim is to push one's supporters in a certain direction, without their being aware of it. Also, it is necessary to use sometimes one, sometimes the other on the same group. The Nazis knew very well how to alternate long silences, mystery, the secret revealed, the waiting period that raises anxiety levels, and then, suddenly, the explosive decision, the tempest, the sturm that seems all the more violent because it breaks into the silence. Finally, we well know that the combination of covert propaganda and overt propaganda is increasingly conducted so that white propaganda actually becomes a cover and mask for black propaganda. That is, one openly admits the existence of one kind of propaganda and of its organization, means, and objectives, but all this is only a facade to capture the attention of individuals and neutralize their instinct to resist, while other individuals, behind the scenes, work on public opinion in a totally different direction seeking to arouse very different reactions, utilizing even existing resistance to overt propaganda. Footnote. The secret element can be a theoretically independent faction, a network of rumors, and so on. The same effect is obtained by contrasting the real methods of action, which are never acknowledged, with totally different overt propaganda proclamations. This is the most frequently used system in the Soviet Union. In this case, it is necessary to have an overt propaganda, in accordance with Goebbels. We openly admit that we wish to influence our people. To admit this is the best method of attaining it. Hence the creation of an official ministry of propaganda. In any case, as Goebbels also said, when the news to be disseminated is unbelievable, it must be disseminated by secret black propaganda. As for censorship, it should be as hidden and secret as possible. Moreover, all serious propagandists know that censorship should be used as little as possible. Let us give one last example of this combination of differing types of propaganda. Laswell divides propaganda into two major streams according to whether it produces direct incitement or indirect incitement. Direct incitement is that by which the propagandist himself acts, becomes involved, demonstrates his conviction, his belief, his good faith. He commits himself to the course of action that he proposes and supports, and in order to obtain a similar action, he solicits a corresponding response from the propagandee. Democratic propaganda, in which the politician extends a hand to the citizen, is of this type. Indirect incitement is that which rests on a difference between the statesman, who takes action, and the public, which is limited to passive acceptance and compliance. There is a coercive influence and there is obedience. This is one of the characteristics of authoritarian propaganda. Although this distinction is not altogether useless, we must again point out that every modern propagandist combines the two types of propaganda— because each responds to different sectors of agitation. These two types no longer belong to different political regimes, but are differing needs of the same propaganda and of the various levels on which propaganda is organized. Propaganda of action presupposes positive incitement. Propaganda through mass media will generally be contrasted incitement. Similarly, on the level of the performer in direct contact with the crowd, there must be positive incitement. It is better if the radio speaker believes in his cause. 
on the level of the organizer, that of propaganda strategy, there must be separation from the public. We shall return to this point later. These examples suffice to show that propaganda must be total. Continuity and Duration of Propaganda Propaganda must be continuous and lasting, continuous in that it must not leave any gaps, but must fill the citizen's whole day and all his days, lasting in that it must function over a very long period of time. Footnote The famous principle of repetition, which is not in itself significant, plays a part only in this situation. Hitler was undoubtedly right when he said that the masses take a long time to understand and remember, thus it is necessary to repeat, but the emphasis must be placed on a long time. The public must be conditioned to accept the claims that are made. In any case, repetition must be discontinued when the public has been conditioned, for at that point repetition will begin to irritate and provoke fresh doubts with respect to former certainties. Propaganda tends to make the individual live in a separate world. He must not have outside points of reference. He must not be allowed a moment of meditation or reflection in which to see himself vis-a-vis -vis the propagandist, as happens when the propaganda is not continuous. At that moment, the individual emerges from the grip of propaganda. Instead, successful propaganda will occupy every moment of the individual's life through posters and loudspeakers, when he is out walking, through radio and newspapers at home, through meetings and movies in the evening. The individual must not be allowed to recover, to collect himself, to remain untouched by propaganda during any relatively long period, for propaganda is not the touch of the magic wand. It is based on slow, constant impregnation. It creates convictions and compliance through imperceptible influences that are effective only by continuous repetition. It must create a complete environment for the individual, one from which he never emerges. And to prevent him from finding external points of reference, it protects him by censoring everything that might come in from the outside. The slow building up of reflexes and myths, of psychological environment and prejudices, requires propaganda of very long duration. Propaganda is not a stimulus that disappears quickly. It consists of successive impulses and shocks aimed at various feelings or thoughts by means of the many instruments previously mentioned. A relay system is thus established. Propaganda is a continuous action, without failure or interruption. As soon as the effect of one impulse is weakened, it is renewed by another. At no point does it fail to subject its recipient to its influence. As soon as one effect wears off, it is followed by a new shock. Continuous propaganda exceeds the individual's capacities for attention or adaptation, and thus his capabilities of resistance. This trait of continuity explains why propaganda can indulge in sudden twists and turns. Footnote the propagandist does not necessarily have to worry about coherence and unity in his claims. Claims can be varied and even contradictory, depending on the setting. For example, Goebbels promised an increase in the price of grain in the country and, at the same time, a decrease in the price of bread in the city. And the occasion. For example, Hitler's propaganda against democracy in 1936 and for democracy in 1943. It is always surprising that the content of propaganda can be so inconsistent that it can approve today what it condemned yesterday. Antonio Miotto considers this changeability of propaganda an indication of its nature. Actually, it is only an indication of the grip it exerts, of the reality of its effects. We must not think that a man ceases to follow the line when there is a sharp turn. He continues to follow it because he is caught up in the system. Of course, he notices the change that has taken place, and he is surprised. He may even be tempted to resist, as the communists were at the time of the German-Soviet pact. But will he then engage in a sustained effort to resist propaganda? Will he disavow his past actions? 
Will he break with the environment in which his propaganda is active? Will he stop reading a particular newspaper? Such breaks are too painful. Faced with them, the individual, feeling that the change in line is not an attack on his real self, prefers to retain his habits. Immediately thereafter, he will hear the new truth reassessed a hundred times. He will find it explained and proved, and he does not have the strength to fight against it each day on the basis of yesterday's truth. He does not even become fully involved in this battle. Propaganda continues its assault without an instant's respite. His resistance is fragmentary and sporadic. He is caught up in professional tasks and personal preoccupations, and each time he emerges from them he hears and sees the new truth proclaimed. The steadiness of the propaganda prevails over his sporadic attention and makes him follow all the turns from the time he has begun to eat of this bread. That is why one cannot really speak of propaganda in connection with an election campaign that lasts only two weeks. At such a time, some intellectual always will show that election propaganda is ineffectual, that its gross methods, its inscriptions on walls can convince nobody, that opposing arguments neutralize each other. And it is true that the population is often indifferent to election propaganda, but it is not surprising that such propaganda has little effect. None of the great techniques of propaganda can be effective in two weeks. Having no more relation to real propaganda are the experiments often undertaken to discover whether some propaganda method is effective on a group of individuals being used as guinea pigs. Such experiments are basically vitiated by the fact that they are of short duration. Moreover, the individual can clearly discern any propaganda when it suddenly appears in a social environment normally not subject to this type of influence. If one isolated item of propaganda or one campaign appears without a massive effort, the contrast is so strong that the individual can recognize it clearly as propaganda and begin to be wary. That is precisely what happens in an election campaign. The individual can defend himself when left to himself in his everyday situation. This is why it is fatal to the effectiveness of propaganda to proceed in spurts with big, noisy campaigns separated by long gaps. In such circumstances, the individual will always find his bearings again. He will know how to distinguish propaganda from the rest of what the press carries in normal times. Moreover, the more intense the propaganda campaign, the more alert he will become, comparing this sudden intensity with the great calm that reigned before. What is needed, then, is continuous agitation produced artificially even when nothing in the events of the day justifies or arouses excitement. Therefore, continuing propaganda must slowly create a climate first, and then prevent the individual from noticing a particular propaganda operation in contrast to ordinary daily events. Organization of Propaganda To begin with, propaganda must be organized in several ways. To give it the above-mentioned characteristics, continuity, duration, combination of different media, an organization is required that controls the mass media, is capable of using them correctly, of calculating the effect of one or another slogan, or of replacing one campaign with another. There must be an administrative organization. Every modern state is expected to have a ministry of propaganda, whatever its actual name may be. Just as technicians are needed to make films and radio broadcasts, so one needs technicians of influence, sociologists and psychologists. But this indispensable administrative organization is not what we are speaking of here. What we mean is is that propaganda is always institutionalized to the extent of the existence of an apparat, in the German sense of the term, a machine. It is tied to realities. A great error which interferes with propaganda analysis is to believe that propaganda is solely a psychological affair, a manipulation of symbols, an abstract influence on opinions. A large number of American studies on propaganda are not valid for that reason. 
These studies are concerned only with means of psychological influence and regard only such means as propaganda. Whereas all great modern practitioners of propaganda have rigorously tied together psychological and physical action as inseparable elements. No propaganda is possible unless psychological influence rests on reality. And the recruiting of individuals into cadres or movements goes hand in hand with psychological manipulation. Footnote. Obviously, propaganda directed at the enemy succeeds when it is coupled with victories. German propaganda in France during the occupation failed because of the presence in France of German soldiers. Thus, the more victories, the more necessary propaganda becomes, said Goebbels. As long as no physical influence is exerted by an organization on the individual, there is no propaganda. This is decidedly not an invention of Mao Zedong, or merely an accessory of propaganda, or the expression of a particular type of propaganda. Separation of the psychological and physical elements is an arbitrary simplification that prevents all understanding of exactly what propaganda is. Of course, the physical organization can be of various types. It can be a party organization, Nazi, fascist, communist, in which those who are run over are absorbed and made to participate in action. Such an organization, moreover, uses force and fear in the form of Macht Propaganda. Or such physical organization can be the integration of an entire population into cells by agents in each block of residences. In that case, it operates inside a society by integrating the whole social body. Of course, this is accompanied by all the psychological work needed to press people into cells. Or an effective transformation can be made in the economic, political, or social domain. We know that the propagandist is also a psychological consultant to governments. He indicates what measures should or should not be taken to facilitate certain psychological manipulations. It is too often believed that propaganda serves the purpose of sugarcoating bitter pills of making people accept policies they would not accept spontaneously. But in most cases, propaganda seeks to point out courses of action desirable in themselves, such as helpful reforms. Propaganda then becomes this mixture of the actual satisfaction given to the people by the reforms and subsequent exploitation of that satisfaction. Propaganda cannot operate in a vacuum. It must be rooted in action in a reality that is part of it. Some positive and welcome measure may be only a means of propaganda. Conversely, coercive propaganda must be tied to physical coercion. For example, a big blow to the propaganda of the Force de Libération Nationale, FLN, in France in 1958, was the noisy threat of the referendum that the roads leading to the poles would be mined and booby-trapped that voters would be massacred and their corpses displayed, that there would be a check in each dwar of those who had dared to go to the polls. But none of these threats was carried out. Failure to take action is in itself counter-propaganda. Because propaganda enterprises are limited by the necessity for physical organization and action, without which propaganda is practically non-existent, effective propaganda can work only inside a group principally inside a nation. Propaganda outside the group, toward other nations, for example, or toward an enemy, is necessarily weak. Footnote. Discussed later in Appendix 1. The principal reason for this is undoubtedly the absence of physical organization and of encirclement of the individual. One cannot reach another nation except by way of symbols, through press or radio, and even then, only in sporadic fashion. Such an effort may at best raise some doubts, plant some sense of ambiguity, make the people ask themselves questions, influence them by suggestion. In case of war, the enemy will not be demoralized by such abstract propaganda unless he is at the same time beaten by armies and pounded by bombers. We can hardly expect great results from a simple dissemination of words unless we prepare for it by education, pre-propaganda, and sustain it by organization and action.
This points up a major difference between communist and Western countries. Western countries conduct their propaganda against Soviet nations solely by psychological means, with the propaganda clearly emanating from a base situated in the democratic countries themselves. Footnote. Nevertheless, the Soviet Union's concern with this form of purely psychological propaganda confirms its effectiveness. By contrast, the Soviet Union makes very little propaganda itself. It does not seek to reach Western peoples by its radio. It confines its propaganda to organizations in the form of national communist parties inside the national boundaries of the people to be propagandized. Because such parties are external propaganda structures of the Soviet Union, their propaganda is effective precisely because it is attached to a concrete organization capable of encirclement and continuity. One should note here the tremendous counter-propagandistic effect that ensued when the United States, after all the promises by the Voice of America, failed to come to the aid of Hungary during the 1956 rebellion. To be sure, it was hardly possible for the Americans to come to the aid of the Hungarians. Nevertheless, all propaganda that makes false promises turns against the propagandist. The fact that the presence of an internal organization is indispensable to propaganda explains in large measure why the same sentiments advanced by a democracy and by an authoritarian government do not have the same credibility. When France and England proclaimed that the elections held in Syria and Egypt in connection with the formation of the United Arab Republic had been a fraud and evidence of a dictatorial government, they aroused no repercussions. It was a simple affirmation from the outside which was not repeated often enough and not heard by the people. Yet when Nasser launched a propaganda campaign a year later on the same theme, claiming that the election results in Iraq had been falsified by the imperialists and that the Iraqi parliament was mockery, he set off reverberations. The Egyptian people reacted, the Iraqi people followed suit, and international opinion was troubled. Footnote. The Egyptian campaign, launched in May 1958, was to get a hearing before the United Nations and to lead to the decision of August 22nd, whereas the Anglo-French protestations on the annexation of Syria in 1957 led to no action. Thus, the propaganda apparatus moves the people to action, and the popular movement adds weight to the argument abroad. Propaganda, then, is no longer mere words. It incites an enormous demonstration by the masses and thus becomes a fact, which gives strength to the words outside the frontiers. We must not, however, conclude from the decisive importance of organization that psychological action is futile. It is one, but not the only one, indispensable piece of the propaganda mechanism. The manipulation of symbols is necessary for three reasons. First of all, it persuades the individual to enter the framework of an organization. Second, it furnishes him with reasons, justifications, motivations for action. Third, it obtains his total allegiance. More and more, we are learning that genuine compliance is essential if action is to be effective. The worker, the soldier, and the partisan must believe in what they are doing, must put all their heart and their good will into it. They must also find their equilibrium, their satisfactions in their actions. All this is the result of psychological influence which cannot attain great results alone, but which can attempt anything when combined with organization. Finally, the presence of organization creates one more phenomenon. The propagandist is always separated from the propagandee. He remains a stranger to him. Footnote A note that appeared in Le Monde, August 2, 1961, criticizing the psychological campaign in Algeria, shows clearly that its ineffectiveness was due in part to the self-intoxication of the propagandists, who came to believe so much in their system that they were no longer capable of considering reality. They were caught in their own trap. Even in the actual contact of human relations, at meetings, in door-to-door -door visits, the propagandist is of a different order. 
He is nothing else and nothing more than the representative of the organization, or rather a delegated fraction of it. He remains a manipulator in the shadow of the machine. He knows why he speaks certain words and what effect they should have. His words are no longer human words, but technically calculated words. They no longer express a feeling or a spontaneous idea, but reflect an organization even when they seem entirely spontaneous. Thus, the propagandist is never asked to be involved in what he is saying, for, if it becomes necessary, he may be asked to say the exact opposite with similar conviction. He must, of course, believe in the cause he serves, but not in his particular argument. On the other hand, the propagandee hears the words spoken to him here and now, and the argument presented to him in which he is asked to believe. He must take them to be human words, spontaneous and carried by conviction. Obviously, if the propagandist were left to himself, if it were only a matter of psychological action, he would end up by being taken in by his own trick, by believing it. He would then be the prisoner of his own formulas and would lose all effectiveness as a propagandist. What protects him from this is precisely the organization to which he belongs which rigidly maintains a line. The propagandist thus becomes more and more a technician who treats his patients in various ways, but keeps himself cold and aloof, selecting his words and actions for purely technical reasons. The patient is an object to be saved or sacrificed according to the necessities of the cause. But then, the listener may ask, why the system of human contacts? Why the importance of door-to-door visits? Only a technical necessity dictates them. We know how important human relations can be to the individual and how essential personal conduct is in making decisions. We know that the distant word of the radio must be complemented by the warmth of a personal experience. This is exactly what puts the human relations technique of propaganda into play. But this human contact is false and merely stimulated. The presence is not that of the individual who has come forward, but that of the organization behind him. In the very act of pretending to speak as man to man, the propagandist is reaching the summit of his mendacity and falsifications, even when he is not conscious of it. Orthopraxy We now come to an absolutely decisive fact. Propaganda is very frequently described as a manipulation for the purpose of changing ideas or opinions, of making individuals believe some idea or fact, and finally of making them adhere to some doctrine, all matters of mind. Or, to put it differently, propaganda is described as dealing with beliefs or ideas. If the individual is a Marxist, it tries to destroy his conviction and turn him into an anti-Marxist, and so on. It calls on all the psychological mechanisms, but appeals to reason as well. It tries to convince, to bring about a decision, to create a firm adherence to some truth. Then, obviously, if the conviction is sufficiently strong, after some soul-searching, the individual is ready for action. This line of thinking is completely wrong. To view propaganda as still being what it was in 1850, is to cling to an obsolete concept of man and to the means to influence him. It is to condemn oneself to understand nothing about modern propaganda. The aim of modern propaganda is no longer to modify ideas, but to provoke action. It is no longer to change adherence to a doctrine, but to make the individual cling irrationally to a process of action. It is no longer to lead to a choice, but to loosen the reflexes. It is no longer to transform an opinion, but to arouse an active and mythical belief. Let us note here in passing how badly equipped opinion surveys are to gauge propaganda. We will have to come back to this point in the study of propaganda effects. Simply to ask an individual if he believes this or that, or if he has this or that idea, gives absolutely no indication of what behavior he will adopt or what action he will take. Only action is of concern to modern propaganda, for its aim is to precipitate an individual's action with maximum effectiveness and economy. 
Footnote. When one analyzes the great modern systems of propaganda, one always finds this primary aim of producing action, of mobilizing the individual. Occasionally, it is expressly stated, as when Goebbels distinguished between Haltung, behavior, and Stimmung, morale. But the former is of greater importance. After a bloody raid, Goebbels could state, The Stimmung is quite low, but that means little. The Haltung holds well. The Stimmung is volatile and varies readily. Therefore, above all, the right action must be obtained, the right behavior maintained. In the analysis of propaganda, specialists have especially noted this desire to obtain immediate action rather than a change of opinion. The same idea is held by Mao Zedong. Propaganda aims at mobilizing the masses. Thus, it is not necessary to change their opinions but to make all individuals jointly attack a task. Even political education, so important with Mao, aims essentially at mobilization. And in the Soviet Union, political education has occasionally been criticized for taking some intellectual and purely domestic turn to secure action, and then failing in its aim. The task of agitation is not to educate but to mobilize people. And there is always the matter of actual involvement in precise tasks defined by the party. For example, to obtain increased productivity. The propagandist, therefore, does not normally address himself to the individual's intelligence. The process of intellectual persuasion is long and uncertain, and the road from such intellectual conviction to action even more so. The individual rarely acts purely on the basis of an idea. Moreover, to place propaganda efforts on the intellectual level would require that the propagandist engage in individual debate with each person. An unthinkable method. It is necessary to obtain at least a minimum of participation from everybody. Footnote. This passive participation is what Goebbels meant when he said, I conceive of a radio program that will make each listener participate in the events of the nation. But at the same time, the listener is forced into passivity by the dictator. Participation can be active or passive, but in any case, it is not simply a matter of public opinion. To see propaganda only as something related to public opinion implies a great intellectual independence on the part of the propagandee, who is, after all, only a third party in any political action, and who is asked only one opinion. This obviously coincides with the conception of liberal democracy, which assumes that the most one can do with a citizen is to change his opinion in such fashion as to win his vote at election time. The concept of a close relationship between public opinion and propaganda rests on the presumption of an independent popular will. If this concept were right, the role of propaganda would be to modify that popular will, which, of course, expresses itself in votes. But what this concept does not take into consideration is that the injection of propaganda into the mechanism of popular action actually suppresses liberal democracy, after which we are no longer dealing with votes or the people's sovereignty. Propaganda, therefore, aims solely at participation. The participation may be active or passive, Active if propaganda has been able to mobilize the individual for action. Passive if the individual does not act directly but psychologically supports that action. But one may ask, does this not bring us right back to public opinion? Certainly not. For opinion leaves the individual a mere spectator who may eventually, but not necessarily, resort to action. Therefore, the idea of participation is much stronger. The supporter of a football team, though not physically in the game, makes his presence felt psychologically by rooting for the players, exciting them, and pushing them to outdo themselves. Similarly, the faithful who attend Mass do not interfere physically, but their communicant participation is positive and changes the nature of the phenomenon. These two examples illustrate what we mean by passive participation obtained through propaganda. 
Such an action cannot be obtained by the process of choice and deliberation. To be effective, propaganda must constantly short-circuit all thought and decision. Footnote. The application of motivational research studies to advertising also leads to this. It must operate on the individual at the level of the unconscious. He must not know that he is being shaped by outside forces. This is one of the conditions for the success of propaganda. But some central core in him must be reached in order to release the mechanism in the unconscious which will provide the appropriate and expected action. We have just said that action exactly suited to its ends must be obtained. This leads us to state that if the classic but outmoded view of propaganda consists in defining it as an adherence of man to an orthodoxy, true modern propaganda seeks, on the contrary, to obtain an orthopraxy, an action that in itself, and not because of the value judgments of the person who is acting, leads directly to a goal, which for the individual is not a conscious and intentional objective to be attained, but which is considered such by the propagandist. The propagandist knows what objective should be sought and what action should be accomplished, and he maneuvers the instrument that will secure precisely this action. This is a particular example of a more general problem, the separation of thought and action in our society. We are living in a time when systematically, though without our wanting it so, action and thought are being separated. In our society, he who thinks can no longer act for himself. He must act through the agency of others, and in many cases he cannot act at all. He who acts cannot first think out his action, either because of lack of time and the burden of his personal problems, or because society's plan demands that he translate others' thoughts into action. And we see the same division within the individual himself for he can use his mind only outside the area of his job in order to find himself, to use his leisure to better himself, to discover what best suits him, and thus to individualize himself. Whereas in the context of his work, he yields to the common necessity, the common method, the need to incorporate his own work into the overall plan. Escape into dreams is suggested to him while he performs wholly mechanized actions. Propaganda creates the same division. Of course it does not cancel out personality, it leaves man complete freedom of thought, except in his political or social action where we find him channeled and engaged in actions that do not necessarily conform to his private beliefs. He even can have political convictions and still be led to act in a manner apparently contradictory to them. Thus the twists and turns of skillful propaganda do not present insurmountable difficulties. The propagandist can mobilize man for action that is not in accord with his previous convictions. Modern psychologists are well aware that there is not necessarily any continuity between conviction and action, and no intrinsic rationality in opinions or acts. Footnote there is a certain distance and divergence between opinion and action, between morale and behavior. A man may have a favorable opinion of Jews and still exhibit hostile behavior. The morale of a military unit may be very low, and yet it may still fight well. Similarly, we observe that people rarely know in advance what they want, and even less what they want to do. Once they have taken action, they are capable of declaring in good faith that they acted in a way other than the way they actually did act. Man does not obey his clear opinions or what he believes to be his deliberate will. To control opinion, one must be aware that there is an abyss between what a man says and what he does. His actions often do not correspond to any clear motive, or to what one would have expected from a previous impression he made. Because of this difference between opinion and action, the propagandist who seeks to obtain action by changing opinions cannot be at all certain of success. He must therefore find other ways to secure action. Into these gaps in continuity, propaganda inserts its lever. 
It does not seek to create wise or reasonable men, but proselytes and militants. This brings us back to the question of organization. For the proselyte incited to action by propaganda cannot be left alone, cannot be entrusted to himself. If the action obtained by propaganda is to be appropriate, it cannot be individual. It must be collective. Propaganda has meaning only when it obtains convergence, coexistence of a multiplicity of individual action reflexes whose coordination can be achieved only through the intermediary of an organization. Moreover, the action reflex obtained by propaganda is only a beginning, a point of departure. It will develop harmoniously, only if there is an organization in which, and thanks to which, the proselyte becomes militant. Footnote. We must insist again that organization is an intrinsic part of propaganda. It is illusory to think one can separate them. Since 1928, an agitator in the Soviet Union must be an organizer of the masses. Before that, Lenin said that a newspaper is propaganda, collective agitation and collective organization. Similarly, Mao Zedong insists on the difference between communist and capitalist armies, reminding us that the former is responsible for mobilizing the masses through propaganda and organization. He always ties these two elements together. Propaganda among the masses goes hand in hand with organization of the masses. And Maurice Maigret recalls the relationship between the two elements in connection with the May 13th demonstrations in Algiers. These examples demonstrate the error made by writers who want to separate propaganda and organization. Without organization, psychological incitement leads to excesses and deviation of action in the very course of its development. Through organization, the proselyte receives an overwhelming impulse that makes him act with the whole of his being. He is actually transformed into a religious man in the psychosociological sense of the term. Justice enters into the action he performs because of the organization of which he is a part. Thus his action is integrated into a group of conforming actions. Not only does such integration seem to be the principal aim of all propaganda today, it is also what makes the effect of propaganda endure. For action makes propaganda's effect irreversible. Footnote This recourse to action permits the propagandist to compensate for a particular weakness of propaganda at the psychological level and to engage the individual in action, either because he is included in a small group which, as a whole, is action-oriented, or because the role of the propagandist, located on the level of human relations, is to give an example of action and to bring others into this action. Thus the Soviet agitator's first duty is to set a shining example of effort, discipline, and sacrifice. He who acts in obedience to propaganda can never go back. He is now obliged to believe in that propaganda because of his past action. He is obliged to receive from it his justification and authority, without which his action will seem to him absurd or unjust, which would be intolerable. He is obliged to continue to advance in the direction indicated by propaganda, for action demands more action. He is what one calls committed, which is certainly what the Communist Party anticipates, for example, and what the Nazis accomplished. The man who has acted in accordance with the existing propaganda has taken his place in society. From then on, he has enemies. Often he is broken with his milieu or his family. He may be compromised. He is forced to accept the new milieu and the new friends that propaganda makes for him. Often he has committed an act reprehensible by traditional moral standards and has disturbed a certain order. He needs a justification for this, and he gets more deeply involved by repeating the act in order to prove that it was just. Thus he is caught up in a movement that develops until it totally occupies the breadth of his conscience. Propaganda now masters him completely, and we must bear in mind that any propaganda that does not lead to this kind of participation is mere child's play.
But we may properly ask how propaganda can achieve such a result, a type of reflex action by short-circuiting the intellectual process. The claim that such results are indeed obtained by propaganda will beget skepticism from the average observer, strenuous denial from the psychologist, and the accusation that this is mere fantasy contradicted by experience. Later, we shall examine the validity of experiments made by psychologists in these fields and their adequacy in regard to the subject. For the moment, we shall confine ourselves to stating that observation of men who were subjected to a real propaganda, Nazi or communist, confirms the accuracy of the schema we have just drawn. We must, however, qualify our statement. We do not say that any man can be made to obey any incitement to action in any way, whatever, from one day to the next, we do not say that in each individual prior elementary mechanisms exist on which it is easy to play and which will unfailingly produce a certain effect. We do not hold with a mechanistic view of man. But we must divide propaganda into two phases. There is pre-propaganda, or sub-propaganda, and there is active propaganda. This follows from what we have said earlier about the continuous and permanent nature of propaganda. Obviously, what must be continuous is not the active, intense propaganda of crisis, but the sub-propaganda that aims at mobilizing individuals, or in the etymological sense, to make them mobile and mobilizable in order to thrust them into action at the appropriate moment. Footnote. The term to mobilize is constantly applied by Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Goebbels, and others to the work that precedes propaganda itself. It is obvious that we cannot simply throw a man into action without any preparation, without having mobilized him psychologically and made him responsive, not to mention physically ready. The essential objective of pre-propaganda is to prepare man for a particular action to make him sensitive to some influence, to get him into condition for the time when he will effectively, and without delay or hesitation, participate in an action. Seen from this angle, pre-propaganda does not have a precise ideological objective. It has nothing to do with an opinion, an idea, a doctrine. It proceeds by psychological manipulations, by character modifications, by the creation of feelings or stereotypes useful when the time comes. It must be continuous, slow, imperceptible. Man must be penetrated in order to shape such tendencies. He must be made to live in a certain psychological climate. The two great routes that this sub-propaganda takes are the conditioned reflex and the myth. Propaganda tries first of all to create conditioned reflexes in the individual by training him so that certain words, signs, or symbols even certain persons or facts provoke unfailing reactions. Despite many protests from psychologists, creating such conditioned reflexes collectively as well as individually is definitely possible. But of course, in order for such a procedure to succeed, a certain amount of time must elapse, a period of training and repetition. One cannot hope to obtain automatic reactions after only a few weeks' repetition of the same formulas. A real psychic reformation must be undertaken, so that after months of patient work a crowd will react automatically in the hoped-for direction to some image. But this preparatory work is not yet propaganda, for it is not yet immediately applicable to a concrete case. What is visible in propaganda, what is spectacular and seems to us often incomprehensible or unbelievable, is possible only because of such slow and not very explicit preparation. Without it, nothing would be possible. On the other hand, the propagandist tries to create myths by which man will live, which respond to his sense of the sacred. By myth, we mean an all encompassing, activating image a sort of vision of desirable objectives that have lost their material, practical character and have become strongly colored, overwhelming, all-encompassing, and which displace from the consciousness all that is not related to it. 
Such an image pushes man to action precisely because it includes all that he feels is good, just, and true. Without giving a metaphysical analysis of the myth, we will mention the great myths that have been created by various propagandas. The myth of race, of the proletariat, of the Fuhrer, of communist society, of productivity. Eventually, the myth takes possession of a man's mind so completely that his life is consecrated to it, but that effect can be created only by slow, patient work by all the methods of propaganda, not by any immediate propaganda operation. Only when conditioned reflexes have been created in a man and he lives in a collective myth can he be readily mobilized. Although the two methods of myth and conditioned reflex can be used in combination, each has separate advantages. The United States prefers to utilize the myth. The Soviet Union has, for a long time, preferred the reflex. The important thing is that when the time is right, the individual can be thrown into action by active propaganda, by the utilization of the psychological levers that have been set up, and by the evocation of the myth. No connection necessarily exists between his action and the reflex or the content of the myth. The action is not necessarily psychologically conditioned by some aspect of the myth. For the most surprising thing is that the preparatory work leads only to man's readiness. Once he is ready, he can be mobilized effectively in very different directions. But, of course, the myth and the reflex must be continually rejuvenated and revived, or they will atrophy. That is why pre-propaganda must be constant, whereas active propaganda can be sporadic, when the goal is a particular action or involvement. Footnote Political education in Lenin and Mao's sense corresponds exactly to our idea of sub-propaganda or basic propaganda, as Goebbels would say. For this education is in no way objective or disinterested. Its only goal is to create in the individual a new Weltanschauung, inside which each of the propositions of propaganda will become logical. Each of its demands will be indisputable. It is a matter of forming new presuppositions, new stereotypes that are prior justifications for the reasons and objectives which propaganda will give to the individual. But while the prejudices and stereotypes in our societies are created in a somewhat incoherent fashion, singly and haphazardly, in political education we have the systematic and deliberate creation of a coherent set of presuppositions that are above challenge. Probably, at the beginning of the Soviet Revolution, such political education did not have precise objectives or practical aims, Indoctrination was an end in itself. But since 1930, this concept has changed, and political education has become the foundation of propaganda. Mao has done this even earlier. In the Soviet Union, ideological indoctrination is now the means of achieving an end. It is the foundation on which propaganda can convince the individual, hic et nunc, of whatever it wants to convince him. To make this clear, we will use the classic terms of propaganda and agitation, taken in a new sense. Propaganda is the elucidation of the Marxist-Leninist doctrine and corresponds to pre-propaganda. Agitation's goal is to make individuals act, hic et nunc, as a function of their political education and also in terms of this education, which corresponds to what we call propaganda. Active experience, in effect, makes further education easier. The different elements are easily mixed. The radio network is given the task to increase political knowledge and political awareness, pre-propaganda, and to rally the population to support the policy of the party and the government, propaganda. The film industry is given orders that even comedies must organize the thoughts and feelings of the audience in the required proletarian direction. The effects of such political education are often described by Mao. It creates class consciousness. 
It destroys the individualist and petty bourgeois spirit while assimilating the individual in a collectivity of thought. It creates ideological conformity in a new framework. It leads to understanding the necessity for the sharing of property, obedience to the state, creation of authority and hierarchy. It leads the comrade to vote for suitable representatives and to withstand the weariness and the difficulties of the battle for increased production. This describes perfectly the role of infrastructure assigned to political education in the process of propaganda. 2. Internal Characteristics Knowledge of the Psychological Terrain The power of propaganda to incite action has often been challenged by the alleged fact that propaganda cannot really modify or create anything in man. We frequently find that psychological manipulations do not appreciably change in an individual's firmly established opinion. A communist or a Christian with strong beliefs is very little, if at all, shaken by adverse propaganda. Similarly, a prejudice or a stereotype is hardly ever changed by propaganda. For example, it is almost impossible to break down racial prejudice by propaganda. What people think of Negroes, Jews, bourgeois, or colonialists will be only slightly altered by propaganda attempts. Similarly, a reflex or myth cannot be created out of nothing, as if the individual were neutral and empty ground on which anything could be built. Furthermore, even when the reflex has been created, it cannot be utilized to make an individual act in just any direction. The individual cannot be manipulated as if he were an object, an automaton. The automatic nature of created reflexes does not transform him into a robot. We can conclude from a large body of experience that the propagandist cannot go contrary to what is in an individual. He cannot create just any new psychological mechanism or obtain just any decision or action. But psychologists who make these observations draw a very hasty conclusion from them that propaganda has very little effect, that it has so limited a field of action that it hardly seems useful. We shall show later why we consider this conclusion incorrect. But the observations themselves give us some very good indications as to what is effective propaganda. The propagandist must first of all know as precisely as possible the terrain on which he is operating. He must know the sentiments and opinions, the current tendencies and the stereotypes among the public he is trying to reach. Footnote the propagandist must know the principal symbols of the culture he wishes to attack and the symbols which express each attitude if he is to be effective. The communists always make a thorough study of the content of opinion before launching their propaganda. A person is not sufficient unto himself. He belongs to that whole called culture by the Americans. Each person's psychology is shaped by that culture. He is conditioned by the symbols of that culture, and it is also a transmitter of that culture. Each time its symbols are changed, he is deeply affected. Thus one can change him by changing these symbols. The propagandist will act on this, keeping in mind that the most important man to be reached is the so-called marginal man, that is, the man who does not believe what the propagandist says, but who is interested because he does not believe the opposition either the man who in battle has good reason to lay down his arms. An obvious point of departure is the analysis of the characteristics of the group and its current myths, opinions, and sociological structure. One cannot make just any propaganda any place for anybody. Methods and arguments must be tailored to the type of man to be reached. Propaganda is definitely not an arsenal of ready-made valid techniques and arguments suitable for use anywhere. Footnote. Beyond this, propaganda must vary according to circumstances. The propagandist must constantly readjust it according to changes in the situation and also according to changes made by his opponent. The content of propaganda has special reference to the opponent and must therefore change if he changes. 
Obvious errors in this direction have been made in the recent course of propaganda's history. Footnote. Here one can see the famous boomerang. When he is wrong in his analysis of a milieu, the propagandist may create the reverse effect of what he expected, and his propaganda can turn against him. There are innumerable examples of this. For instance, during the Korean War, the Americans, who wanted to show that prisoners were well treated, distributed in China and Korea pictures of war prisoners at play, engaging in sports, and so forth, so that the prisoners should not be recognized and persecuted by the communists after the war. Their eyes were blacked out in the pictures. These photos were interpreted by the Chinese to mean the Americans gouge out the eyes of their prisoners, an interpretation which stemmed from their prior belief that it is impossible to treat prisoners well and normal to gouge out their eyes. The technique of propaganda consists in precisely calculating the desired action in terms of the individual who is to be made to act. A second conclusion seems to us embodied in the following rule. Never make a direct attack on an established, reasoned, durable opinion, or an accepted cliché, a fixed pattern. The propagandist wears himself out to no avail in such a contest. A propagandist who tries to change mass opinion on a precise and well-established point is a bad propagandist. But that does not mean that he must then leave things as they are and conclude that nothing can be done. He need only understand two subtle aspects of this problem. First of all, we recall that there is not necessarily any continuity between opinion or fixed patterns and action. There is neither consistency nor logic, and a man can perfectly well hold on to his property, his business, and his factory, and still vote communist. Or he can be enthusiastic about social justice and peace as described by the communists and still vote for a conservative party. Attacking an established opinion or stereotype head-on would make the propagandi aware of basic inconsistencies and would produce unexpected results. Footnote. The most frequent response is that of flight. In the face of direct propaganda against a prejudice, the propagandee flees. He rejects, often unconsciously, what he is told. He wants no part of it. He justifies himself by dissociating himself from what is attacked, projecting the attack onto another person, and so on. But he does not change. The skillful propagandist will seek to obtain action without demanding consistency without fighting prejudices and images, by taking his stance deliberately on inconsistencies. Second, the propagandist can alter opinions by diverting them from their accepted course, by changing them, or by placing them in an ambiguous context. Footnote. Other methods of altering opinion are to offer forms of action, or to provoke rifts in a group, or to turn a feeling of aggression toward some specified object. Starting from apparently fixed and immovable positions, we can lead a man where he does not want to go, without his being aware of it, over paths that he will not notice. In this way, propaganda against German rearmament organized by the partisans of peace, and ultimately favorable to the Soviet Union, utilized the anti-German sentiment of the French right. Thus, existing opinion is not to be contradicted, but utilized. Each individual harbors a large number of stereotypes and established tendencies. From this arsenal, the propagandist must select those easiest to mobilize, those which will give the greatest strength to the action he wants to precipitate. Writers who insist that propaganda against established opinion is ineffective would be right if man were a simple being, having only one opinion with fixed limits. This is rarely the case among those who have not yet been propagandized, although it is frequently the case among individuals who have been subjected to propaganda for a long time. But the ordinary man in our democracies has a wide range of feelings and ideas. Footnote. This is true of individuals and groups. 
It has been said quite accurately, for example, that if public opinion were really unanimous, there would be no way for propaganda to work. It is only because in any body of public opinion there are groups of private opinions that propaganda can use these as seeds with which to reverse the trend of opinion. Propaganda need only determine which opinions must not be attacked head-on, and be content to undermine them gradually, and to weaken them by cloaking them in ambiguity. Footnote It goes without saying that propaganda must also change its character according to the results it wishes to attain in given circumstances. For example, propaganda must be strongly personalized when it seeks to create a feeling of guilt in the adversary. For example, the French are colonialists. On the other hand, it must be impersonal when it seeks to create confidence and exaltation. For example, France is great. The third important conclusion drawn from experiments made chiefly in the United States is that propaganda cannot create something out of nothing. It must attach itself to a feeling, an idea. It must build on a foundation already present in the individual. The conditioned reflex can be established only on an innate reflex or a prior conditioned reflex. The myth does not expand helter-skelter. It must respond to a group of spontaneous beliefs. Action cannot be obtained unless it responds to a group of already established tendencies or attitudes stemming from the schools, the environment, the regime, the churches, and so on. Propaganda is confined to utilizing existing material. It does not create it. This material falls into four categories. First, there are the psychological mechanisms that permit the propagandist to know more or less precisely that the individual will respond in a certain way to a certain stimulus. Here, the psychologists are far from agreement. Behaviorism, depth psychology, and the psychology of instincts postulate very different psychic mechanisms and see essentially different connections and motivations. Here, the propagandist is at the mercy of these interpretations. Second, opinions, conventional patterns, and stereotypes exist concretely in a particular milieu or individual. Third, ideologies exist which are more or less consciously shared, accepted, and disseminated, and which form the only intellectual, or rather para-intellectual, element that must be reckoned with in propaganda. Fourth, and finally, the propagandist must concern himself above all with the needs of those whom he wishes to reach. Footnote. At the most elementary level, propaganda will play on the need for physical survival in time of war. This can be further utilized either to weaken resistance or to stiffen it. For example, Goebbels used this theme in 1945 to prolong resistance. By fighting, you have a chance for survival. All propaganda must respond to a need whether it be a concrete need, bread, peace, security, work, or a psychological need. Footnote. Propaganda must also consider the image that the propagandee has of the ways in which his needs can be satisfied. Structure of expectation. Propaganda also aims at modifying this image of what people expect. We shall discuss this last point at length later on. Propaganda cannot be gratuitous. The propagandist cannot simply decide to make propaganda in such and such a direction on this or that group. The group must need something, and the propaganda must respond to that need. One weakness of tests made in the United States is that far too often the experimental propaganda used did not correspond to a single need of the persons tested. A frequent error on the part of propagandists pushing something is the failure to take into account whether or not the propagandee needs it. Of course, when we say that the propagandist has to use existing elements, we do not mean that he must use them in direct or unequivocal fashion. We have already indicated that he often must use them in indirect and equivocal fashion. When he does so, he can indeed create something new. The propagandist's need to base himself on what already exists does not prevent him from going further. 
If committed to a particular opinion, would he be obligated simply to repeat it indefinitely? Because he must pay lip service to a certain stereotype, is he limited to do nothing but reproduce that stereotype? Obviously not. What exists is only the raw material from which the propagandist can create something strictly new, which in all probability would not have sprung up spontaneously. Take, for example, unhappy workers, threatened by unemployment, exploited, poorly paid, and without hope of improving their situation. Karl Marx has clearly demonstrated that they might have a certain spontaneous reaction of revolt and that some sporadic outbursts might occur, but that this will not develop into anything else and will lead nowhere. With propaganda, however, this same situation and the existing sentiments might be used to create a class consciousness and a lasting and organized revolutionary trend. Similarly, if we take a population not necessarily of the same race or language or history, but inhabiting the same territory, oppressed by the same conqueror, feeling a common resentment or hatred toward the occupying force, a sentiment generally found at a purely individual level, and in the group of the enemy administration, only a few individual acts of violence will occur spontaneously, and, more often, nothing at all. But propaganda can take it from there and arouse a nationalism, the foundations of which are perfectly natural but which as an integrated force is entirely fabricated. This is true for Algerian, Yugoslavian, or African nationalism. In this way, propaganda can be creative, and it is in complete control of its creations. The passions or prejudices that it instills in a man serve to strengthen its hold on him and thus make him do what he would never have done otherwise. It is not true that propaganda is powerless simply because at the start it is limited to what already exists. It can attack from the rear, wear down slowly, provide new centers of interest which cause the neglect of previously acquired positions, it can divert a prejudice or it can elicit an action contrary to an opinion held by the individual without his being clearly aware of it. Finally, it is obvious that propaganda must not concern itself with what is best in man, the highest goals humanity sets for itself, its noblest and most precious feelings. Propaganda does not aim to elevate man, but to make him serve. It must therefore utilize the most common feelings, the most widespread ideas, the crudest patterns, and in so doing place itself on a very low level with regard to what it wants man to do, and to what end. Footnote. Propaganda must stay at the human level. It must not propose aims so lofty that they will seem inaccessible, this creates the risk of a boomerang effect. Propaganda must confine itself to simple elementary messages. Have confidence in our leader, our party, hate our enemies, etc. Without fear of being ridiculous, it must speak the most simple everyday language, familiar, individualized, the language of the group that is being addressed and the language with which a person is familiar. Hate Hunger and pride make better lovers of propaganda than do love or impartiality. Fundamental Currents in Society Propaganda must not only attach itself to what already exists in the individual, but also express the fundamental currents of the society it seeks to influence. Propaganda must be familiar with collective sociological presuppositions, spontaneous myths, and broad ideologies. By this, we do not mean political currents or temporary opinions that will change in a few months, but the fundamental psychosociological bases on which a whole society rests. The presuppositions and myths, not just of individuals or of particular groups, but those shared by all individuals in a society, including men of opposite political inclinations and class loyalties. A propaganda pitting itself against this fundamental and accepted structure would have no chance of success. Rather, all effective propaganda is based on these fundamental currents and expresses them. Footnote. It must be associated with the dominant cultural values of the entire society. 
Only if it rests on the proper collective beliefs will it be understood and accepted. It is part of a complex of civilization, consisting of material elements, beliefs, ideas, and institutions, and it cannot be separated from them. No propaganda could succeed by going against these structural elements of society, but propaganda's main task, clearly, is the psychological reflection of these structures. It seems to us that this reflection is found in two essential forms, the collective sociological presuppositions and the social myths. By presuppositions we mean a collection of feelings, beliefs, and images by which one unconsciously judges events and things without questioning them, or even noticing them. This collection is shared by all who belong to the same society or group. It draws its strength from the fact that it rests on general tacit agreement. Whatever the differences of opinion are among people, one can discover beneath the differences the same beliefs in Americans and in Russians, in communists and in Christians. These presuppositions are sociological in that they are provided for us by the surrounding milieu and carry us along in the sociological current. They are what keeps us in harmony with our environment. It seems to us that there are four great collective sociological presuppositions in the modern world. By this we mean not only the Western world, but all the world that shares a modern technology and is structured into nations, including the communist world, though not yet the African or Asian worlds. These common presuppositions of bourgeois and proletarian are that man's aim in life is happiness, that man is naturally good, that history develops in endless progress, and that everything is matter. Footnote. Formulated in this way, they seem to be philosophical notions, but are not. We certainly do not see here any of the philosophical schools, hedonism or materialism, but only the instinctive popular belief marking our epoch and shared by all, expressing itself in very concrete terms. The other great psychological reflection of social reality is the myth. The myth expresses the deep inclinations of a society. Without it, the masses would not cling to a certain civilization or its process of development and crisis. It is a vigorous impulse, strongly colored, irrational, and charged with all of man's power to believe. It contains a religious element. In our society, the two great fundamental myths on which all other myths rest are science and history. And based on them are the collective myths that are man's principal orientations, the myth of work, the myth of happiness, which is not the same thing as the presupposition of happiness, the myth of the nation, the myth of youth, the myth of the hero. Propaganda is forced to build on these presuppositions and to express these myths, for without them nobody would listen to it, and in so building it must always go in the same direction as society. It can only reinforce society. A propaganda that stresses virtue over happiness and presents man's future as one dominated by austerity and contemplation would have no audience at all. A propaganda that questions progress or work would arouse disdain and reach nobody. It would immediately be branded as an ideology of the intellectuals, since most people feel that the serious things are material things because they are related to labor, and so on. It is remarkable how the various presuppositions and aspects of myths complement each other, support each other, mutually defend each other. If the propagandist attacks the network at one point, all myths react to the attack. Propaganda must be based on current beliefs and symbols to reach man and win him over. On the other hand, propaganda must also follow the general direction of evolution, which includes the belief in progress. A normal, spontaneous evolution is more or less expected, even if man is completely unaware of it and in order to succeed, propaganda must move in the direction of that evolution. The progress of technology is continuous. Propaganda must voice this reality, which is one of man's convictions. All propaganda must play on the fact that the nation will be industrialized, more will be produced, greater progress is imminent, and so on. 
No propaganda can succeed if it defends outdated production methods or obsolete social or administrative institutions. Though occasionally advertising may profitably evoke the good old days, political propaganda may not. Rather, it must evoke the future. The tomorrows that beckon, precisely because such visions impel the individual to act. Footnote. But in this straining toward the future, the propagandist must always beware of making precise promises, assurances, commitments. Goebbels constantly protested the affirmations of victory emanating from the Fuhrer's headquarters. The pull toward the future should refer to general currents of society rather than to precise events. Nevertheless, the promise made by Khrushchev that communism would be achieved by 1980 leaves enough margin, for though the desired effect is obtained in 1961, the promise will be forgotten in 1980 if it has not been fulfilled. Propaganda is carried along on this current and cannot oppose it. It must confirm it and reinforce it. Thus, propaganda will turn a normal feeling of patriotism into a raging nationalism. It not only reflects myths and presuppositions, it hardens them, sharpens them, invests them with the power of shock and action. It is virtually impossible to reverse this trend. In a country in which administrative centralization does not yet exist, one can propagandize for centralization because modern man firmly believes in the strength of a centrally administered state. But where centralization does exist, no propaganda can be made against it. Federalist propaganda, true federalism, which is opposed to national centralism, not such supranationalism as the so-called Soviet or European federalism, can never succeed because it is a challenge to both the national myth and the myth of progress. Every reduction, whether to a work unit or an administrative unit, is seen as regression. Of course, when we analyze this necessary subordination of propaganda to presuppositions and myths, we do not mean that propaganda must express them clearly all the time. It need not speak constantly of progress and happiness although these are always profitable themes, but in its general line and its infrastructure it must allow for the same presuppositions and follow the same myths as those prevalent in its audience. There is some tacit agreement. For example, the speaker does not have to say that he believes man is good. This is clear from his behavior, language, and attitudes, and each man unconsciously feels that the others share the same presuppositions and myths. It is the same with propaganda. A person listens to a particular propaganda because it reflects his deepest unconscious convictions without expressing them directly. Similarly, because of the myth of progress, it is much easier to sell a man an electric razor than a straight-edged one. Finally, alongside the fundamental currents reflected in presuppositions and myths, we must consider two other elements. Obviously, the material character of a society and its evolution, its fundamental sociological currents, are linked to its very structure. Propaganda must operate in line with those material currents and at the level of material progress. It must be associated with all economic, administrative, political, and educational development. Otherwise, it is nothing. It must also reflect local and national idiosyncrasies, Thus, in France, the general trend towards socialization can be neither overridden nor questioned. The political left is respectable. The right has to justify itself before the ideology of the left, in which even rightists participate. All propaganda in France must contain and evoke the principal elements of the ideology of the left in order to be accepted. But a conflict is possible between the local milieu and the national society. The tendencies of the group may be contrary to those of the broader society. In that case, one cannot lay down general rules. Sometimes the tendencies of the local group win out because of the group's solidarity. Sometimes the general society wins out because it represents the mass and therefore unanimity. In any case, propaganda must always choose the trend that normally will triumph 
because it agrees with the great myths of the time, common to all men. The Negro problem in the American South is typical of this sort of conflict. The local Southern milieu is hostile to Negroes and favorable to discrimination, whereas American society as a whole is hostile to racism. It is almost certain, therefore, despite the deep-rooted prejudices and the local solidarities, that racism will be overcome. The Southerners are on the defensive. They have no springboard for external propaganda, for example, toward the European nations. Propaganda can go only in the direction of world opinion, that of Asia, Africa, almost all of Europe. Above all, when it is anti-racist, it is helped along by the myth of progress. It follows that propaganda cannot be applied everywhere alike, and that, at least up to now, propaganda in both Africa and Asia must be essentially different from propaganda in the rest of the world. We stress, at least up to now, because these countries are being progressively won over by Western myths and are developing national and technological forms of society. But for the moment, these myths are not yet everyday reality, flesh and blood spiritual bread, sacred inheritance, as they are with us. To sum up, propaganda must express the fundamental currents of society. Footnote. In this respect, a high-ranking officer made a completely valid criticism of the psychological campaign in Algeria, Le Monde, August 2, 1961, when he pointed out that the weakness of the La Chua system was to stress the material environment of the Algerian population without taking into account its instincts and myths, its nationalism, and its adherence to Western ideologies. Timeliness Propaganda in its explicit form must relate solely to what is timely. Footnote the history of Soviet propaganda is full of such reminders of the necessity for a propaganda of timeliness relating to practical problems, and it rejects vague and dogmatic propaganda. For example, public acceptance must be obtained for new work norms, salary reforms, and so on. Man can be captured and mobilized only if there is consonance between his own deep social beliefs and those underlying the propaganda directed at him, and he will be aroused and moved to action only if the propaganda pushes him toward a timely action. These two elements are not contradictory but complementary, for the only interesting and enticing news is that which presents a timely, spectacular aspect of society's profound reality. A man will become excited over a new automobile, because it is immediate evidence of his deep belief in progress and technology. Between news that can be utilized by propaganda and fundamental currents of society, the same relationship exists as between waves and the sea. The waves exist only because the underlying mass supports them. Without it, there would be nothing. But man sees only the waves. They are what attracts, entices, and fascinates him. Through them, he grasps the grandeur and majesty of the sea, though this grandeur exists only in the immense mass of water. Similarly, propaganda can have solid reality and power over man only because of its rapport with fundamental currents, but it has seductive excitement and a capacity to move him only by its ties to the most volatile immediacy. Footnote. Propaganda must remember. Goebbels said that the face of politics changes each day, but the lines of propaganda must change only imperceptibly. And the timely event that man considers worth retaining, preserving, and disseminating is always an event related to the expression of the myths and presuppositions of a given time and place. Besides, the public is sensitive only to contemporary events. They alone concern and challenge it. Obviously, propaganda can succeed only when man feels challenged. It can have no influence when the individual is stabilized, relaxing in his slippers in the midst of total security. Neither past events nor great metaphysical problems challenge the average individual, the ordinary man of our times. 
He is not sensitive to what is tragic in life. He is not anguished by a question that God might put to him. He does not feel challenged except by current events, political or economic. Therefore, propaganda must start with current events. It would not reach anybody if it tried to base itself on historical facts. We have seen Vichy propaganda fail when it tried to evoke the images of Napoleon and Joan of Arc in hopes of arousing the French to turn against England. Even facts so basic and deeply rooted in the French consciousness are not a good springboard for propaganda. They pass quickly into the realm of history and consequently into neutrality and indifference. A survey made in May 1959 showed that among French boys of 14 and 15, 70% had no idea who Hitler and Mussolini were. 80% had forgotten the Russians in the list of victors of 1945, and not a single one recognized the words Danzig or Munich as having figured in relatively recent events. We must also bear in mind that the individual is at the mercy of events. Hardly has an event taken place before it is outdated, even if its significance is still considerable. It is no longer of interest, and if man experiences the feeling of having escaped it, he is no longer concerned. In addition, he obviously has a very limited capacity for attention and awareness. One event pushes the preceding one into oblivion. And as man's memory is short, the event that has been supplanted by another is forgotten. It no longer exists. Nobody is interested in it anymore. Footnote Man remembers no specific news. He retains only a general impression, which propaganda furnishes him, inserted in the collective current of society. This obviously facilitates the work of the propagandist and permits extraordinary conditions. What the listener retains in the long run determines his loyalties. A remarkable study by Carl I. Hovland and Walter Weiss has shown that the individual who questions an item of information because he distrusts the informant ultimately forgets the suspicious nature of the source and retains only the impression of the information. In the long run, belief in a reliable source of information decreases, and belief in information from the suspicious source increases. In November, a Bordeaux Association organized a lecture on the atomic bomb by a well-known specialist. The lecture would surely have been of great interest, and not for propaganda purposes. A wide distribution of leaflets had announced it to the student public, but not a single student came. Why? Because this happened at exactly the same time as Sputnik's success, and the public was concerned only with this single piece of news. Its sole interest was in Sputnik, and the permanent problem was forgotten. Actually, the public is prodigiously sensitive to current news. Its attention is focused immediately on any spectacular event that fits in with its myths. At the same time, the public will fix its interest and its passion on one point to the exclusion of all the rest. Besides, people have already become accustomed to and have accommodated themselves to the rest, yesterday's news or that of the day before. We are dealing here not just with forgetfulness, but also with plain loss of interest. A good example is Khrushchev's ultimatum at the beginning of 1959 when he set a time limit of three months to solve the Berlin problem. Two weeks passed. No war broke out. Even though the same problem remained, public opinion grew accustomed to it and lost interest. So much so, that on the expiration date of Khrushchev's ultimatum, 27 May 1959, people were surprised when they were reminded of it. Khrushchev himself said nothing on May 27th, not having obtained anything, he simply counted on the fact that everyone had forgotten his ultimatum, which shows what a subtle propagandist he is. Footnote. Exactly the same thing happened in 1961 with the second ultimatum on Berlin. On June 15th, Khrushchev issued an ultimatum to be met by the end of the year, 
and on August 2nd he announced that he would use force to secure compliance. By the end of the year, everyone had forgotten. It is impossible to base a propaganda campaign on an event that no longer worries the public. It is forgotten and the public has grown accustomed to it. On November 30th, 1957, the communist states met and signed an agreement concerning several political problems and the problem of peace. Its text was truly remarkable, one of the best that has been drawn up. But nobody discussed this important matter. The progressives were not troubled by it. The partisans of peace did not say one word, though in itself, objectively, the text was excellent. But everything it contained was old hat to the public, and the public could not get interested all over again in an outdated theme when it was not uneasy over a specific threat of war. It would appear that propaganda for peace can bear fruit only when there is fear of war. The particular skill of communist propaganda in this area is that it creates a threat of war while conducting peace propaganda. The constant threat of war, arising from Stalin's posture, made the propaganda of the partisans for peace effective and led non-communists to attach themselves to the fringe of the party via that propaganda. But in 1957, when the threat of war seemed much less real, because Khrushchev had succeeded Stalin, such propaganda had no hold at all on the public. The news about Hungary seemed far more important to the Western world than the general problem of world peace. These various elements explain why the well-written text on the problem of peace fell flat, though it would have aroused considerable attention at some other time. Once again, we note that propaganda should be continuous, should never relax, and must vary its themes with the tide of events. The terms, the words, the subjects that propaganda utilizes must have in themselves the power to break the barrier of the individual's indifference. They must penetrate like bullets. They must spontaneously evoke a set of images and have a certain grandeur of their own. To circulate outdated words or pick new ones that can penetrate only by force is unavailing, for timeliness furnishes the operational words with their explosive and effective power. Part of the power of propaganda is due to its use of the mass media, but this power will be dissipated if propaganda relies on operational words that have lost their force. In Western Europe, the word Bolshevik in 1925, the word fascist in 1936, the word collaborator in 1944, the word peace in 1948, the word integration in 1958 were all strong operational terms. They lost their shock value when their immediacy passed. To the extent that propaganda is based on current news, it cannot permit time for thought or reflection. A man caught up in the news must remain on the surface of the event. He is carried along in the current and can at no time take a respite to judge and appreciate. He can never stop to reflect. There is never any awareness of himself, of his condition, of his society for the man who lives by current events. Such a man never stops to investigate any one point any more than he will tie together a series of news events. We already have mentioned man's inability to consider several facts or events simultaneously and to make a synthesis of them in order to face or to oppose them. One thought drives away another. Old facts are chased by new ones. Under these conditions there can be no thought. And in fact, modern man does not think about current problems. He feels them. He reacts. But he does not understand them any more than he takes responsibility for them. He is even less capable of spotting any inconsistency between successive facts. Man's capacity to forget is unlimited. This is one of the most important and useful points for the propagandist, who can always be sure that a particular propaganda theme, statement, or event will be forgotten within a few weeks. Moreover, there is a spontaneous defensive reaction in the individual against an excess of information and, to the extent that he clings unconsciously to the unity of his own person, against inconsistencies. The best defense here is to forget the preceding event. 
In so doing, man denies his own continuity. To the same extent that he lives on the surface of events and makes today's events his life by obliterating yesterday's news, he refuses to see the contradictions in his own life and condemns himself to a life of successive moments, discontinuous and fragmented. Footnote. All this is also true of those who claim to be informed because they read some weekly periodical filled with political revelations. This situation makes the current events man a ready target for propaganda. Indeed, such a man is highly sensitive to the influence of present-day currents. Lacking landmarks, he follows all currents. He is unstable because he runs after what happened today. He relates to the event and therefore cannot resist any impulse coming from that event. Because he is immersed in current affairs, this man has a psychological weakness that puts him at the mercy of the propagandist. No confrontation ever occurs between the event and the truth. No relationship ever exists between the event and the person. Real information never concerns such a person. What could be more striking, more distressing, more decisive than the splitting of the atom, apart from the bomb itself? And yet this great development is kept in the background, behind the fleeting and spectacular result of some catastrophe or sports event, because that is the superficial news the average man wants. Propaganda addresses itself to that man. Like him, it can relate only to the most superficial aspect of a spectacular event, which alone can interest man and lead him to make a certain decision or adopt a certain attitude. But here we must make an important qualification. The news event may be a real fact, existing objectively, or it may be only an item of information, the dissemination of a supposed fact. What makes it news is its dissemination, not its objective reality. The problem of Berlin is a constant one and for that reason it does not interest the public. It is not news. But when Khrushchev decrees that the problem is dramatic, that it merits the risk of war, that it must be solved immediately, and when he demands that the West yield, then, though there is objectively nothing new in Berlin, the question becomes news, only to disappear as soon as Khrushchev stops waving the threat. Remember that when this happened in 1961, it was for the fourth time. The same thing occurred with Soviet agitation about supposed Turkish aggression plans in November 1957. An editorial in Le Monde on this subject contained a remark essentially as follows. If the events of recent days can teach us a lesson, it is that we must not attach too much importance to the anxieties created by the proclamations of the Soviets. The supposed bacteriological warfare, among other examples, has shown that they are capable of carrying on a full campaign of agitation, of accusing others of the worst intentions and crimes, and of decreeing one fine day that the danger has passed, only to revive it several days or months later. We shall examine elsewhere the problem of fact in the context of propaganda. But here we must emphasize that the current news to which a man is sensitive, in which he places himself, need have no objective or effective origins. In one way, this greatly facilitates the work of propaganda. For propaganda can suggest, in the context of news, a group of facts which becomes actuality for a man who feels personally concerned. Propaganda can then exploit his concern for its own purposes. Propaganda and the Undecided All of the foregoing can be clarified by a brief examination of a question familiar to political scientists, that of the undecided, those people whose opinions are vague, who form the great mass of citizens, and who constitute the most fertile public for the propagandist. The undecided are not the indifferent, those who say they are apolitical or without opinion and who constitute no more than 10% of the population. The undecided, far from being outside the group, are participants in the life of the group, but do not know what decision to make on problems that seem urgent to them. 
They are susceptible to the control of public opinion or attitudes, and the role of propaganda is to bring them under this control, transforming their potential into real effect. But that is possible only if an undecided man is concerned about the group he lives in. How is this revealed? What is the true situation of the undecided? One strong factor here is the individual's degree of integration in the collective life. Propaganda can play only on individuals more or less intensely involved in social currents. The isolated mountaineer or forester, having only occasional contact with society at the village market, is hardly sensitive to propaganda. For him, it does not even exist. He will begin to notice it only when a strict regulation imposed on his activities changes his way of life, or when economic problems prevent him from selling his products in the usual way. This clash with society may open the doors to propaganda, but it will soon lose its effect again in the silence of the mountain or the forest. Conversely, propaganda acts on the person embroiled in the conflicts of his time, who shares the foci of interest of his society. If I read a good newspaper advertisement for a particular automobile, I will not have the slightest interest in it if I am indifferent to automobiles. This advertisement can affect me only to the extent that I share, with my contemporaries, the mania for automobiles. A prior general interest must exist for propaganda to be effective. Propaganda is effective not when based on an individual prejudice, but when based on a collective center of interest shared by the crowds. That is why religious propaganda, for example, is not very successful. Society as a whole is no longer interested in religious problems. At Byzantium, crowds fought in the streets over theological questions, so that in those days religious propaganda made sense. At present, only isolated individuals are interested in religion. It is part of their private opinions, and no real public opinion exists on this subject. On the other hand, propaganda related to technology is sure to arouse response for everybody is as passionately interested in technology as in politics. Only within the limits of collective foci of interest can propaganda be effective. We are not dealing here with prejudices or stereotypes which imply minds that are already made up. We are dealing with foci of interest where minds are not necessarily made up as yet. For example, politics is presently a focus of interest. It was not so in the 12th century. The prejudices of the right or the left come later. That is already more individual, whereas the focus of interest on politics as such is truly collective. Not individual prejudices, but the collective shared foci of interest are the best fields of action for propaganda. Prejudices and stereotypes can be the result of a person's background, stemming from his education, work, environment, and so on. But the foci of interest are truly produced by the whole of society. Why is modern man obsessed with technology? One can answer that question only by an analysis of present-day society as a whole. This goes for all the centers of interest of contemporary man. It should be noted, incidentally, that these centers of interest are becoming more alike in all parts of the world. Thus a focus of political interest is developing among the Asian peoples, the Muslims, and the Africans. This expansion of interest inevitably entails a simultaneous expansion of propaganda, which may not be identical in all countries, but which will be able to operate in the same basic patterns and be related to the same centers of interest everywhere. We now take up another basic trait of the social psychology of propaganda. The more intense the life of a group to which an individual belongs, the more active and effective propaganda is. A group in which feelings of belonging are weak, in which common objectives are imprecise or the structure is in the process of changing, in which conflicts are rare and which is not tied to a collective focus of interest, cannot make valid propaganda either to its members or to those outside. But, where the vitality of a group finds expression in the forms mentioned. It not only can make effective propaganda, but also can make its members increasingly sensitive to propaganda in general. The more active and alive a group, 
the more its members will listen to propaganda and believe it. Footnote. The more the individual is integrated into a group, the more he is receptive to propaganda and the more he is able to participate in the political life of his group. The group does not even have to be solidly structured. Thus, in a group of friends, when almost all vote the same way, there is little chance of any of them going astray. The friendly group involuntarily exerts pressure. But this holds true only for propaganda by the group itself toward its members. If we go a bit further, we meet the connected but more general problem of the intensity of collective life. Vigorous groups can definitely have a collective life of little intensity. Conversely, weak groups can have an intense collective life. Historically, we can observe that an intense collective life develops even while a society is disintegrating, as in the Roman Empire about the 4th century, in Germany at the time of the Weimar Republic, or in France today. Whether or not this collective life is wholesome matters little. What counts for propaganda is the intensity of that life, whatever its sources. In a trend toward social disintegration, this intensity predisposes individuals to accept propaganda without determining its meaning in advance. Such individuals are not prepared to accept this or that orientation, but they are more easily subjected to psychological pressure. Furthermore, it matters little whether the intensity of such collective life is spontaneous or artificial. It can result from a striving, a restlessness, or a conviction deriving directly from social or political conditions, as in France in 1848 or in the medieval city-states. It can result from manipulation of the group, as in fascist Italy or Nazi Germany. In all such cases, the result is the same. The individual who is part of an intense collective life is prone to submit to the influence of propaganda, and anyone who succeeds in keeping aloof from the intense collective life is generally outside the influence of propaganda because of his ability to escape that intensity. Of course, the intensity is connected with the centers of interest. It is not an unformed or indeterminate current without direction. It is not just a haphazard explosion. Rather, it is a force for which the focus of interest is the compass needle. Social relations in the group are often very active because of its focus of interest. For example, the interest in politics invigorated social relations in all Europe during the 19th century. In any case, intensity will be greatest around such an interest. For example, an important center of interest today is one's profession. An individual who cares little for the social life of his group, his family life, or books, reacts vigorously on the subject of his profession. And his reaction is not individual. It is the result of his participation in the group. Thus we can present the following three principles. One. The propagandist must place his propaganda inside the limits of the foci of interest. 2. The propagandist must understand that his propaganda has the greatest chance for success, where the collective life of the individuals he seeks to influence is most intense. 3. The propagandist must remember that collective life is most intense where it revolves around a focus of interest. On the basis of these principles, the propagandist can reach the undecided and act on the majority of 93%, and only in connection with this mass of undecided can one truly speak of ambiguity, majority effect, tension, frustration, and so on. Footnote On the subject of this 93%, it is often stated, and opinion surveys tend to confirm this, that between 7 and 10 percent of all individuals consciously and voluntarily adhere to a trend, to a grouping, whereas about 90 percent fluctuate according to the circumstances. The first correct estimate of this apparently was made by Napoleon. It was revived by Hitler. Propaganda and Truth We have not yet considered a problem, familiar but too often ignored the relationship between propaganda and truth, or, rather, between propaganda and accuracy of facts. We shall speak henceforth of accuracy or reality and not of truth, 
which is an inappropriate term here. The most generally held concept of propaganda is that it is a series of tall stories, a tissue of lies, and that lies are necessary for effective propaganda. Hitler himself apparently confirmed this point of view when he said that the bigger the lie, the more its chance of being believed. This concept leads to two attitudes among the public. The first is, of course we shall not be victims of propaganda because we are capable of distinguishing truth from falsehood. Anyone holding that conviction is extremely susceptible to propaganda, because when propaganda does tell the truth, he is then convinced that it is no longer propaganda. Moreover, his self-confidence makes him all the more vulnerable to attacks of which he is unaware. The second attitude is, we believe nothing that the enemy says because everything he says is necessarily untrue. But if the enemy can demonstrate that he has told the truth, a sudden turn in his favor will result. Much of the success of communist propaganda in 1945-48 to stemmed from the fact that as long as communism was presented as the enemy, both in the Balkans and in the West, Everything the Soviet Union said about its economic progress or its military strength was declared false. But after 1943, the visible military and economic strength of the Soviet Union led to a complete turnabout. What the Soviet Union said in 1937 was true, therefore it always speaks the truth. The idea that propaganda consists of lies which makes it harmless and even a little ridiculous in the eyes of the public, is still maintained by some specialists. For example, Frederick C. Erion gives it as the basic trait in his definition of propaganda. Footnote It is true that for a long time propaganda was made up of lies. In Falsehood in Wartime, Ponsonby said, When war is declared, truth is the first victim. Falsehood is the most useful weapon in case of war. He revealed innumerable lies, deliberate or not, used during the war of 1914-18. to Today, too, the propagandist may be a liar. He may invent stories about his adversaries, falsify statistics, create news, and so on. The public, however, is firmly convinced that such is always the case in propaganda. That propaganda is never true. But it is certainly not so. For a long time, propagandists have recognized that lying must be avoided. Footnote. Certain authors have strongly stressed this danger of falsehood. Alfred Sauvy shows that the creative lie can be justified only by success, and he recalls the famous words, We shall win because we are the stronger. The public, when it recognizes a lie, will turn completely against its authors. Goebbels' great method for ruining English propaganda in 1940 was to recall England's 1916 propaganda lies, which had since been admitted. This cast doubt on English propaganda as a whole. In propaganda, truth pays off. This formula has been increasingly accepted. Lenin proclaimed it. And alongside Hitler's statement on lying, one must place Goebbels' insistence that facts to be disseminated must be accurate. Footnote. This idea is now generally accepted. In the United States, it is the number one rule in propaganda manuals, except for unbelievable and harmful truths, about which it is better to be silent. Schaeff said in its manual, When there is no compelling reason to suppress a fact, tell it. Aside from considerations of military security, the only reason to suppress a piece of news is if it is unbelievable. When the listener catches you in a lie, your power diminishes. For this reason, never tell a lie which can be discovered. As far back as 1940, the American Psychological Services already had orders to tell the truth. In carrying them out, for example, they distributed the same newspapers to American and German soldiers. In the communist bloc, we find exactly the same attitude. Mao has always been very careful to state the facts exactly, including bad news. On the basis of Lenin's general theory of information, it is incorrect that the dissemination of false news does not create problems. 
French propagandists also have discovered that truthfulness is effective and that it is better to spread a piece of bad news oneself than to wait until it is revealed by others. There remains the problem of Goebbels's reputation. He wore the title of Big Liar, bestowed by Anglo-Saxon propaganda, and yet he never stopped battling for propaganda to be as accurate as possible. He preferred being cynical and brutal to being caught in a lie. He used to say, everybody must know what the situation is. He was always the first to announce disastrous events or difficult situations without hiding anything. The result was a general belief between 1939 and 1942 the German communiques not only were more concise, clearer, and less cluttered, but were more truthful than Allied communiques, American and neutral opinion, and furthermore that the Germans published all the news two or three days before the Allies. All this is so true that pinning the title of Big Liar on Goebbels must be considered quite a propaganda success. How can we explain this contradiction? It seems that in propaganda we must make a radical distinction between a fact on the one hand and intentions or interpretations on the other, in brief, between the material and the moral elements. The truth that pays off is in the realm of facts. The necessary falsehoods which also pay off are in the realm of intentions and interpretations. This is a fundamental rule for propaganda analysis. The Problem of Factuality It is well known that veracity and exactness are important elements in advertising. The customer must be able to have confidence in the advertisement. When he has been deceived several times, the result is obviously unfavorable. That is why advertisers make it a rule to be accurate and organize a bureau of standards to denounce false claims. But here we refer to an essential factor. Experience. The customer has good or bad experiences with a product. In political matters, however, personal experience is very rare, difficult to come by, and inconclusive. Thus, one must distinguish between local facts, which can be checked, and others. Obviously, propaganda must respect local facts, otherwise it would destroy itself. It cannot hold out for long against local evidence unless the population is so securely in the palm of the propagandist's hand that he could say absolutely anything and still be believed. But that is a rare condition. With regard to larger or more remote facts that cannot be the object of direct experience, one can say that accuracy is now generally respected in propaganda. One may concede, for example, that statistics given out by the Soviets or the Americans are accurate. There is little reason to falsify statistics. Similarly, there is no good reason to launch a propaganda campaign based on unbelievable or false facts. The best example of the latter was the communist campaign on bacteriological warfare. Of course, it was useful from certain points of view, and the true believers still believe what was said at the time. But among the undecided, it had a rather negative effect because of its extreme improbability and its contradictions. However, although many, especially in Western Europe, considered it a blunder, the campaign produced considerable credence in North America and India. Consequently, falsehood bearing on fact is neither entirely useless nor to be strictly avoided. Nonetheless, bear in mind that it is increasingly rare. Footnote as we have emphasized, such lies must not be told except about completely unverifiable facts. For example, Goebbels' lies could be on the successes achieved by German U-boats, because only the captain of the U-boat knew if he had sunk a ship or not. It was easy to spread detailed news on such a subject without fear of contradiction. Three qualifications of this statement must be made. First of all, propaganda can effectively rest on a claim that some fact is untrue, which may actually be true, but is difficult to prove. Khrushchev made a specialty of this kind of operation. He denounced lies on the part of his predecessors in order to give a ring of truth to his own pronouncements. Thus, when he called Malenkov an inveterate liar 
before the Central Committee of the Communist Party in December 1958 and declared that Malenkov's statistics were false. There was no reason to believe Khrushchev more than Malenkov, but the foray made sense. First of all, as Khrushchev was denouncing a lie, it seemed that he must therefore be telling the truth. Secondly, by lowering the figures given by Malenkov, Khrushchev could show a much higher rise in production since 1952. If it is true that in 1958 9.2 billion pounds of grain were produced, and if Malenkov's figure of 8 billion in 1952 was accurate, that meant a 15% increase in six years. If, however, the 1952 figure was only 5.6 billion, as Khrushchev claimed, that meant an increase of 75%, a triumph. It seems more reasonable to consider Malenkov's figures accurate rather than Khrushchev's until proved otherwise. Footnote. This evaluation, written in 1959, has been proved true since we learned, in 1961, of the disaster of Soviet agriculture. A second qualification obviously concerns the presentation of facts. When these are used by propaganda, one is asked to swallow the bald fact as accurate. Also, most of the time the fact is presented in such a fashion that the listener or reader cannot really understand it or draw any conclusions from it. For example, a figure may be given without reference to anything, without a correlation or a percentage or a ratio. One states that production has risen by 30% without indicating the base year, or that the standard of living has risen by 15% without indicating how it is calculated, or that such and such a movement has grown by so many people without giving figures for previous years. The lack of coherence and cohesion of such data is entirely deliberate. Footnote. So V states that this type of propaganda consists in respecting detail in order to eventually compose a static whole which gives misleading information on the movement. Thus, truth becomes the principal form of falsehood. Of course, starting with such data, it is not impossible to reconstruct the whole. With much patience, work, and research, one can bring order into such facts and relate them to each other. But that is a job for a specialist, and the results would not appear until long after the propaganda action had obtained its effect. Besides, they would be published as a technical study and be seen only by a handful of readers. Therefore, the publication of a true fact in its raw state is not dangerous. When it would be dangerous to let a fact be known, the modern propagandist prefers to hide it, to say nothing rather than to lie. About one-fifth of all press directives given by Goebbels between 1939 and 1944 were orders to keep silent on one subject or another. Soviet propaganda acts the same way. Well-known facts are simply made to disappear. Occasionally, they are discovered after much delay. The famous Khrushchev report to the 20th Congress is an example. The communist press in France, Italy, and elsewhere simply did not speak of it for weeks. Similarly, the Egyptian people did not learn of the events in Hungary until May 1960. Up to that time, the Egyptian press had not said one word about them. Another example is Khrushchev's silence on the Chinese communes in his report on the Central Committee of the Communist Party in December 1958. Silence is also one way to pervert known facts by modifying their context. There were admirable examples of this in the propaganda against Mondes France. Propaganda said, Mondes France has abandoned Indochina. Mondes France has abandoned Tunisia. Mondes France has liquidated the French banks in India, and so on. Those were the plain facts. But there was complete silence on past policies in Indochina, past events in Morocco that had led to events in Tunisia and agreements on Indian banks signed by the preceding government. Footnote. This technique, called selection by American authors, leads to an effective distortion of reality. The propagandist automatically chooses the array of facts which will be favorable to him and distorts them by using them out of context. Finally, 
There is the use of accurate facts by propaganda. Based on them, the mechanism of suggestion can work best. Americans call this technique innuendo. Facts are treated in such a fashion that they draw their listener into an irresistible sociological current. The public is left to draw obvious conclusions from a cleverly presented truth, and the great majority comes to the same conclusions. Footnote. The only element in the publication of a fact which one must scrupulously take into account is its probability or credibility. Much news was suppressed during the war because it would not have been believed by the public. It would have been branded as pure propaganda. A 1942 incident is an excellent example of this. At the moment of Montgomery's decisive victory in North Africa, Rommel was absent. The Nazis had not expected an attack at that time and had called Rommel back to Germany. But Goebbels gave the order not to reveal this fact because everybody would have considered it a lie to explain the defeat and prove that Rommel had not really been beaten. Truth was not probable enough to be told. To obtain this result, propaganda must be based on some truth that can be said in few words and is able to linger in the collective consciousness. In such cases, the enemy cannot go against the tide, which he might do if the basis of the propaganda were a lie, or the sort of truth requiring a proof to make it stick. On the contrary, the enemy now must provide proof, but it no longer changes the conclusions that the propagandee already has drawn from the suggestions. Intentions and Interpretations This is the real realm of the lie but it is exactly here that it cannot be detected. If one falsifies a fact, one may be confronted with unquestionable proof to the contrary. To deny that torture was used in Algeria became increasingly difficult. But no proof can be furnished where motivations or intentions are concerned or interpretation of a fact is involved. A fact has different significance depending on whether it is analyzed by a bourgeois economist or a Soviet economist a liberal historian, a Christian historian, or a Marxist historian. The difference is even greater when a phenomenon created deliberately by propaganda is involved. How can one suspect a man who talks peace of having the opposite intent without incurring the wrath of public opinion? And if the same man starts a war, he can always say that the others forced it on him, that events proved stronger than his intentions. We forget that between 1936 and 1939, Hitler made many speeches about his desire for peace, for the peaceful settlement of all problems, for conferences. He never expressed an explicit desire for war. Naturally, he was arming because of encirclement. And in fact, he did manage to get a declaration of war from France and England, so he was not the one who started the war. Footnote. The confusion between judgment of fact and judgment of value occurs at the level of these qualifications of fact and interpretation. For example, all bombings by the enemy are acts of savagery aimed only at civilian objectives, whereas all bombings by one's own planes are proof of one's superiority, and they never destroy anything but military objectives. Similarly, when another government shows goodwill, it is a sign of weakness. When it shows authority, it wants war or dictatorship. Propaganda by its very nature is an enterprise for perverting the significance of events and of insinuating false intentions. There are two salient aspects of this fact. First of all, the propagandist must insist on the purity of his own intentions and, at the same time, hurl accusations at his enemy. But the accusation is never made haphazardly or groundlessly. Footnote. Because political problems are difficult and often confusing, and their significance and their import not obvious, the propagandist can easily present them in moral language. And here we leave the realm of fact to enter into that of passion. Facts, then, come to be discussed in the language of indignation, a tone which is almost always the mark of propaganda. The propagandist will not accuse the enemy of just any misdeed. 
he will accuse him of the very intention that he himself has and of trying to commit the very crime that he himself is about to commit. He who wants to provoke a war not only proclaims his own peaceful intentions, but also accuses the other party of provocation. He who uses concentration camps accuses his neighbor of doing so. He who intends to establish a dictatorship always insists that his adversaries are bent on dictatorship. The accusation aimed at the other's intention clearly reveals the intention of the accuser. But the public cannot see this because the revelation is interwoven with facts. The mechanism used here is to slip from the facts, which would demand factual judgment to moral terrain and to ethical judgment. At the time of Suez, the confusion of the two levels in Egyptian and progressivist propaganda was particularly successful. Nasser's intentions were hidden behind the fully revealed intentions of the French and English governments. Such an example, among many others, permits the conclusion that even intelligent people can be made to swallow professed intentions by well-executed propaganda. The breadth of the Suez propaganda operation can be compared only with that which succeeded at the time of Munich, when there was the same inversion of the interpretation of facts. We also find exactly the same process in the propaganda of the FLN in France and that of Fidel Castro. The second element of falsehood is that the propagandist naturally cannot reveal the true intentions of the principal for whom he acts, government, party chief, general, company director. Propaganda never can reveal its true projects or plans or divulge government secrets. That would be to submit the projects to public discussion to the scrutiny of public opinion, and thus to prevent their success. More serious, it would make the projects vulnerable to enemy action by forewarning him so that he could take all the proper precautions to make them fail. Propaganda must serve instead as a veil for such projects, masking true intentions. Footnote. Many authors have stressed this role of covert propaganda. Spire says that the role of the propagandist is to hide political reality by talking about it. Sauvy says that the propagandist administers the anesthetic so the surgeon can operate without public interference. This is why, in many cases, according to Maigret, complete secrecy is a handicap to the propagandist. He must be free to speak, for only then can he sufficiently confuse things reveal elements too disconnected to be put together, and so on. He must keep the public from understanding reality, while giving the public the opposite impression, that it understands everything clearly. Rees says that he must give the public distorted news and intentions, knowing clearly beforehand what conclusions the public will draw from them. Propaganda must be, in effect, a smokescreen. Maneuvers take place behind protective screens of words on which public attention is fixed. Propaganda is necessarily a declaration of one's intentions. It is a declaration of purity that will never be realized, a declaration of peace, of truth, of social justice. Of course, one must not be too precise at the top level or promise short-term reforms, for it would be risky to invite a comparison between what was promised and what was done. Such comparison would be possible if propaganda operated in the realm of future fact. Therefore, it should be confined to intentions, to the moral realm, to values, to generalities. And if some angry man were to point out the contradictions, in the end his argument would carry no weight with the public. Propaganda is necessarily false when it speaks of values, of truth, of good, of justice, of happiness, and when it interprets and colors facts and imputes meaning to them. It is true when it serves up the plain fact, but does so only for the sake of establishing a pretense, and only as an example of the interpretation that it supports with that fact. When Khrushchev made his great claims in 1957, proving that the Soviet Union was catching up with the United States in the production of consumer goods he cited several figures to prove that the growth of agricultural production over ten years showed such a trend. On the basis of these figures, he concluded that in 1958, 
the Soviets would have as much butter as the United States, which, even in 1959, was still not true, and that in 1960 they would have as much meat. In 1959 they were very far from it. And he provoked his audience to laughter by ridiculing his economists, who estimated that such levels would not be reached until 1975. At that moment he drew a veil over reality in the very act of interpreting it. Lies about intentions and interpretations permit the integration of the diverse methods of propaganda. In fact, Hitler's propaganda was able to make the lie a precise and systematic instrument designed to transform certain values, to modify certain current concepts, to provoke psychological twists in the individual. The lie was the essential instrument for that. But this was not just a falsification of some figure or fact. As Hermann Rauschening shows, it was falsehood in depth. Footnote. Except that Goebbels used falsehood very subtly to discredit the enemy. He secretly disseminated false news about Germany to enemy intelligence agents. Then he proved publicly that their news was false, thus that the enemy lied. Stalinist propaganda was the same. On the other hand, American and Leninist propaganda seek the truth, but they resemble the preceding types of propaganda in that they provoke a general system of false claims. Footnote. Alex Inkelis has emphasized that Lenin did not have the same cynical attitude toward the masses as did Hitler, and that he was less concerned with technique than with the truth of the message. When the United States poses as the defender of liberty, of all, everywhere, and always, it uses a system of false representation. When the Soviet Union poses as the defender of true democracy, it is also employing a system of false representation. But the lies are not always deliberately set up. They may be an expression of a belief, of good faith which leads to a lie regarding intentions because the belief is only a rationalization, a veil drawn deliberately over a reality one wishes not to see. Thus it is possible that when the United States makes its propaganda for freedom, it really thinks it is defending freedom, and that the Soviet Union, when presenting itself as the champion of democracy, really imagines itself to be a champion of democracy. But these beliefs lead definitely to false claims, due in part to propaganda itself. Certainly a part of the success of communist propaganda against capitalism comes from the effective denunciation of capitalism's claims. The false truth of communist propaganda consists in exposing the contradiction between the values stressed by the bourgeois society, the virtue of work, the family, liberty, political democracy, and the reality of that society, poverty, unemployment, and so on. These values are false because they are only claims of self-justification, but the communist system expresses false claims of the same kind. Propaganda feeds, develops, and spreads the system of false claims, lies aimed at the complete transformation of minds, judgments, values, and actions, and constituting a frame of reference for systematic falsification. When the eyeglasses are out of focus, everything one sees through them is distorted. This was not always so in the past. The difference today lies in the voluntary and deliberate character of inaccurate representation circulated by propaganda. While we credit the United States and the Soviet Union with some good faith in their beliefs, as soon as a system of propaganda is organized around false claims, all good faith disappears. The entire operation becomes self-conscious, and the falsified values are recognized for what they are. The lie reveals itself to the liar. One cannot make propaganda in pretended good faith. Propaganda reveals our hoaxes even as it encloses and hardens us into this system of hoaxes from which we can no longer escape. Having analyzed these traits, we can now advance a definition of propaganda, not an exhaustive definition, unique and exclusive of all others, but at least a partial one. Propaganda is a set of methods employed by an organized group 
that wants to bring about the active or passive participation in its actions of a mass of individuals, psychologically unified through psychological manipulations and incorporated in an organization. 3. Categories of Propaganda Despite a general belief, propaganda is not a simple phenomenon, and one cannot lump together all of its forms. Types of propaganda can be distinguished by the regimes that employ them. Soviet propaganda and American propaganda do not resemble each other either in method or in psychological technique. Hitler's propaganda was very different from present-day Chinese propaganda, but it substantially resembled Stalinist propaganda. The propaganda of the FLN in Algeria cannot be compared to French propaganda. Even within the same regime, completely different conceptions can coexist. The Soviet Union is the most striking example of this. The propagandas of Lenin, Stalin, and Khrushchev offer three types which differ in their techniques, in their themes, and in their symbolism. So much so that when we set up too narrow a frame for the definition of propaganda, part of the phenomenon eludes us. Those who think of Soviet propaganda only as it was under Stalin are inclined to say that Khrushchev does not make propaganda. But Khrushchev's propaganda was as extensive as Stalin's and perhaps more so. He carried certain propaganda techniques to their very limits. But aside from these political and external categories of propaganda, one must define other differences that rest on certain internal traits of propaganda. Political Propaganda and Sociological Propaganda First, we must distinguish between political propaganda and sociological propaganda. We shall not dwell long on the former because it is the type called immediately to mind by the word propaganda itself. It involves techniques of influence employed by a government, a party, an administration, a pressure group, with a view to changing the behavior of the public. The choice of methods used is deliberate and calculated. The desired goals are clearly distinguished and quite precise, though generally limited. Most often, the themes and the objectives are political, as, for example, with Hitler's or Stalin's propaganda. This is the type of propaganda that can be most clearly distinguished from advertising. The latter has economic ends, the former political ends. Political propaganda can be either strategic or tactical. The former establishes the general line, the array of arguments, the staggering of the campaigns. The latter seeks to obtain immediate results within that framework, such as wartime pamphlets and loudspeakers to obtain the immediate surrender of the enemy. But this does not cover all propaganda, which also encompasses phenomena much more vast and less certain. The group of manifestations by which any society seeks to integrate the maximum number of individuals into itself, to unify its members' behavior according to a pattern, to spread its style of life abroad, and thus to impose itself on other groups. We call this phenomenon sociological propaganda to show, first of all, that the entire group, consciously or not, expresses itself in this fashion, and to indicate, secondly, that its influence aims much more at an entire style of life than at opinions or even one particular course of behavior. Footnote This notion is a little broader than that of Dube on unintentional propaganda. Dube includes in the term the involuntary effects obtained by the propagandist. He is the first to have stressed the possibility of this unintentional character of propaganda. Contrary to all American thought on the subject, except for David Craig and Richard S. Crutchfield, who go even further engaging the range of unintentional propaganda, which they even find in books on mathematics. Of course, Within the compass of sociological propaganda itself, one or more political propagandas can be expressed. The propaganda of Christianity in the Middle Ages is an example of this type of sociological propaganda. Benjamin Constant meant just this when he said of France in 1793, The entire nation was a vast propaganda operation. 
and in present times certainly the most accomplished models of this type are American and Chinese propaganda. Although we do not include here the more or less effective campaigns and methods employed by governments, but rather the overall phenomenon, we find that sociological propaganda combines extremely diverse forms within itself. At this level, advertising as the spreading of a certain style of life can be said to be included in such propaganda, and in the United States this is also true of public relations, human relations, human engineering, the motion pictures, and so on. It is characteristic of a nation living by sociological propaganda that all these influences converge toward the same point, whereas in a society such as France in 1960, they are divergent in their objectives and their intentions. Sociological propaganda is a phenomenon much more difficult to grasp than political propaganda, and is rarely discussed. Basically, it is the penetration of an ideology by means of its sociological context. This phenomenon is the reverse of what we have been studying up to now. Propaganda, as it is traditionally known, implies an attempt to spread an ideology through the mass media of communication in order to lead the public to accept some political or economic structure or to participate in some action. This is the one element common to all the propaganda we have studied. Ideology is disseminated for the purpose of making various political acts acceptable to the people. But in sociological propaganda, the movement is reversed. The existing economic, political, and sociological factors progressively allow an ideology to penetrate individuals or masses. Through the medium of economic and political structures, a certain ideology is established, which leads to the active participation of the masses and the adaptation of individuals. The important thing is to make the individual participate actively and to adapt him as much as possible to a specific sociological context. Such propaganda is essentially diffuse. It is rarely conveyed by catchwords or expressed intentions. Instead, it is based on a general climate, an atmosphere that influences people imperceptibly without having the appearance of propaganda. It gets to man through his customs, through his most unconscious habits. It creates new habits in him. It is a sort of persuasion from within. As a result, man adopts new criteria of judgment and choice, adopts them spontaneously, as if he had chosen them himself. But all these criteria are in conformity with the environment and are essentially of a collective nature. Sociological propaganda produces a progressive adaptation to a certain order of things, a certain concept of human relations, which unconsciously molds individuals and makes them conform to society. Sociological propaganda springs up spontaneously. It is not the result of deliberate propaganda action. No propagandists deliberately use this method, though many practice it unwittingly, and tend in this direction without realizing it. For example, when an American producer makes a film, he has certain definite ideas he wants to express, which are not intended to be propaganda. Rather, the propaganda element is in the American way of life with which he is permeated and which he expresses in his film without realizing it. We see here the force of expansion of a vigorous society which is totalitarian in the sense of the integration of the individual and which leads to involuntary behavior. Sociological propaganda expresses itself in many different ways, in advertising, in the movies, commercial and non-political films, in technology in general, in education, in the Reader's Digest, and in social service, casework, and settlement houses. All these influences are in basic accord with each other and lead spontaneously in the same direction. One hesitates to call all this propaganda. Such influences which mold behavior seem a far cry from Hitler's great propaganda setup. Unintentional, at least in the first stage, non-political, organized along spontaneous patterns and rhythms, the activities we have lumped together from a concept that might be judged arbitrary or artificial, are not considered propaganda by either sociologists or the average public. 
And yet, with deeper and more objective analysis, what does one find? These influences are expressed through the same media as propaganda. They are really directed by those who make propaganda. To me, this fact seems essential. A government, for example, will have its own public relations and will also make propaganda. Most of the activities described in this chapter have identical purposes. Besides, these influences follow the same stereotypes and prejudices as propaganda. They stir the same feelings and act on the individual in the same fashion. These are the similarities which bring these two aspects of propaganda closer together, more than the differences noted earlier separate them. But there is more. Such activities are propaganda to the extent that the combination of advertising, public relations, social welfare, and so on produces a certain general conception of society, a particular way of life. We have not grouped these activities together arbitrarily. They express the same basic notions and interact to make man adopt this particular way of life. From then on, the individual in the clutches of such sociological propaganda believes that those who live this way are on the side of the angels, and those who don't are bad. Those who have this conception of society are right, and those who have another conception are in error. Consequently, just as with ordinary propaganda, it is a matter of propagating behavior and myths, both good and bad. Furthermore, such propaganda becomes increasingly effective when those subjected to it accept its doctrines on what is good or bad. For example, the American way of life. There, a whole society actually expresses itself through this propaganda by advertising its kind of life. By doing that, a society engages in propaganda on the deepest level. Sociologists have recognized that, above all, propaganda must change a person's environment. Kretsch and Crutchfield insist on this fact and show that a simple modification of the psychological context can bring about changes of attitude without ever directly attacking particular attitudes or opinions. Similarly, McDougall says, One must avoid attacking any trend frontally. It is better to concentrate one's efforts on the creation of psychological conditions so that the desired result seems to come from them naturally. The modification of the psychological climate brings about still other consequences that one cannot obtain directly. This is what Ogle calls suggestibility. The degree of suggestibility depends on a man's environment and psychological climate, and that is precisely what modifies the activities mentioned above. It is what makes them propaganda. For their aim is simply to instill in the public an attitude that will prepare the ground for the main propaganda to follow. Sociological propaganda must act gently. It conditions. It introduces a truth, an ethic in various benign forms, which, although sporadic, end by creating a fully established personality structure. It acts slowly, by penetration, and is most effective in a relatively stable and active society, or in the tensions between an expanding society and one that is disintegrating, or in an expanding group within a disintegrating society. Under these conditions, it is sufficient in itself. It is not merely a preliminary sub-propaganda. But sociological propaganda is inadequate in a moment of crisis, nor is it able to move the masses to action in exceptional circumstances. Therefore, it must sometimes be strengthened by the classic kind of propaganda, which leads to action. At such times, sociological propaganda will appear to be the medium that has prepared the ground for direct propaganda. It becomes identified with sub-propaganda. Nothing is easier than to graft a direct propaganda onto a setting prepared by sociological propaganda, Besides, sociological propaganda may itself be transformed into direct propaganda. Then, by a series of intermediate stages, we not only see one turn into the other, but also a smooth transition from what was merely a spontaneous affirmation of a way of life to the deliberate affirmation of a truth. This process has been described in an article by Edward L. Bernays. 
This so-called engineering approach is tied to a combination of professional research methods through which one gets people to adopt and actively support certain ideas or programs as soon as they become aware of them. This applies also to political matters, and since 1936, the National Association of Manufacturers has attempted to fight the development of leftist trends with such methods. In 1938, the NAM spent a half million dollars to support the type of capitalism it represents. This sum was increased to three million in 1945 and to five million in 1946. This propaganda paved the way for the Taft Hartley Law. It was a matter of selling the American economic system. Here we are truly in the domain of propaganda, and we see the multiple methods employed to influence opinion, as well as the strong tie between sociological and direct propaganda. Sociological propaganda, involuntary at first, becomes more and more deliberate, and ends up by exercising influence. One example is the code drawn up by the Motion Picture Association, which requires films to promote the highest types of social life, the proper conception of society, the proper standards of life, and to avoid any ridicule of the law, natural or human, or sympathy for those who violate the law. Another is J. Arthur Rank's explanation of the purpose of his films. When does an export article become more than an export article? When it is a British film. When the magnificent productions of Ealing Studios appear in the world, they represent something better than just a step forward toward a higher level of export. Such films are then propaganda for the British way of life. The first element of awareness in the context of sociological propaganda is extremely simple, and from it everything else derives. What starts out as a simple situation gradually turns into a definite ideology, because the way of life in which man thinks he is so indisputably well off becomes a criterion of value for him. This does not mean that objectively he is well off, but that regardless of the merits of his actual condition, he thinks he is. He is perfectly adapted to his environment, like a fish in water. From that moment on, everything that expresses this particular way of life, that reinforces and improves it, is good. Everything that tends to disturb, criticize, or destroy it is bad. This leads people to believe that the civilization representing their way of life is best. This belief then commits the French to the same course as the Americans, who are by far the most advanced in this direction. Obviously, one tries to imitate and catch up to those who are furthest advanced, the first one becomes the model. And such imitation makes the French adopt the same criteria of judgment, the same sociological structures, the same spontaneous ideologies, and, in the end, the same type of man. Sociological propaganda is then a precise form of propaganda. It is comparatively simple because it uses all social currents, but is slower than other types of propaganda because it aims at long-term penetration and progressive adaptation. But from the instant a man uses that way of life as his criterion of good and evil, he is led to make judgments. For example, anything un-American is evil. From then on, genuine propaganda limits itself to the use of this tendency and to leading man into actions of either compliance with or defense of the established order. This sociological propaganda in the United States is a natural result of the fundamental elements of American life. In the beginning, the United States had to unify a disparate population that came from all the countries of Europe and had diverse traditions and tendencies. A way of rapid assimilation had to be found. That was the great political problem of the United States at the end of the 19th century. The solution was psychological standardization. That is, simply to use a way of life as the basis of unification and as an instrument of propaganda. In addition, this uniformity plays another decisive role, an economic role, in the life of the United States. It determines the extent of the American market. 
Mass production requires mass consumption, but there cannot be mass consumption without widespread identical views as to what the necessities of life are. One must be sure that the market will react rapidly and massively to a given proposal or suggestion. One therefore needs fundamental psychological unity on which advertising can play with certainty when manipulating public opinion. And in order for public opinion to respond, it must be convinced of the excellence of all that is American. Thus conformity of life and conformity of thought are indissolubly linked. But such conformity can lead to unexpected extremes. Given American liberalism and the confidence of Americans in their economic strength and their political system, it is difficult to understand the wave of collective hysteria which occurred after 1948 and culminated in McCarthyism. That hysteria probably sprang from a vague feeling of ideological weakness, a certain inability to define the foundations of American society. That is why Americans seek to define the American way of life, to make it conscious, explicit, theoretical, worthy. Therefore, the soul-searching and inflexibility with excessive affirmations designed to mask the weakness of the ideological position. All this obviously constitutes an ideal framework for organized propaganda. We encounter such organized propaganda on many levels, on the government level, for one. Then there are the different pressure groups, the Political Action Committee, the American Medical Association, the American Bar Association, the National Small Businessmen's Association. All have as their aim the defense of the private interests of the big three, big business, big labor, and big agriculture. Other groups aim at social and political reforms, the American Legion, the League of Women Voters, and the like. These groups employ lobbying to influence the government and the classic forms of propaganda to influence the public. Through films, meetings, and radio, they try to make the public aware of their ideological aims. Another very curious and recent phenomenon, confirmed by several American sociologists, is the appearance of agitators, alongside politicians and political propagandists. The pure agitator who stirs public opinion in a disinterested fashion functions as a nationalist. He does not appeal to a doctrine or principle, nor does he propose specific reforms. He is the true prophet of the American way of life. Usually he is against the New Deal and for laissez-faire liberalism against plutocrats, internationalists, and socialists. Bankers and communists alike are the hateful other party in spite of which well-informed I survives. The agitator is especially active in the most unorganized groups of the United States. He uses the anxiety psychoses of the lower middle class, the neoproletarian, the immigrant, the demobilized soldier, people who are not yet integrated into American society, or who have not yet adopted ready-made habits and ideas. The agitator uses the American way of life to provoke anti-Semitic, anti-communist, anti-Negro, and xenophobic currents of opinion. He makes groups act in the illogical yet coherent Manichaean universe of propaganda, of which we will have more to say. The most remarkable thing about this phenomenon is that these agitators do not work for a political party. It is not clear which interests they serve. They are neither capitalists nor communists, but they deeply influence American public opinion, and their influence may crystallize suddenly in unexpected forms. The more conscious such sociological propaganda is, the more it tends to express itself externally and tends to expand its influence abroad, as, for example, in Europe. It frequently retains its sociological character and thus does not appear to be pure and simple propaganda. There is no doubt, for example, that the Marshall Plan, which was above all a real form of aid to underdeveloped countries, also had propaganda elements, such as the spreading of American products and films coupled with publicity about what the United States was doing to aid underprivileged nations. These two aspects of indirect propaganda are altogether sociological. 
but they may be accompanied by specific propaganda, as when, in 1948, subsidies of $15 million were poured into American publications appearing in Europe. The French edition of the New York Herald Tribune stated that it received important sums in Marshall credits for the purpose of making American propaganda. Along with reviews specializing in propaganda, such as France Amérique, and with film centers and libraries sponsored by the Americans in Europe, we should include the Reader's Digest, whose circulation has reached millions of copies per issue in Europe and is so successful that it no longer needs a subsidy. However, the success of such American propaganda is very uneven. Technical publications have an assured audience, but bulletins and brochures have little effect because the Americans have a superiority complex, which expresses itself in such publications and displeases foreigners. The presentation of the American way of life as the only way to salvation exasperates French opinion and makes such propaganda largely ineffective in France. At the same time, French opinion has been won over by the obvious superiority of American technical methods. All forms of sociological propaganda are obviously very diffuse and aimed much more at the promulgation of ideas and prejudices, of a style of life than of a doctrine, or at inciting action or calling for formal adherence. They represent a penetration in depth until a precise point is struck at which action will occur. It should be noted, for example, that in all the French départements in which there were Americans and propaganda bureaus, the number of communist voters decreased between 1951 and 1953. Propaganda of Agitation and Propaganda of Integration The second great distinction within the general phenomenon of propaganda is the distinction between propaganda of agitation and propaganda of integration. Here we find such a summa divisio that we may ask ourselves if the methods, themes, characteristics, publics, and objectives are so different, are we not really dealing with two separate entities rather than two aspects of the same phenomenon? This distinction corresponds in part to the well-known distinction of Lenin between agitation and propaganda. But here the meaning of these terms is reversed. It is also somewhat similar to the distinction between propaganda of subversion with regard to an enemy, and propaganda of collaboration, with the same enemy. Propaganda of agitation being the most visible and widespread generally attracts all the attention. It is most often subversive propaganda and has the stamp of opposition. It is led by a party seeking to destroy the government or the established order. It seeks rebellion or war. It has always had a place in the course of history. All revolutionary movements, all popular wars, have been nourished by such propaganda of agitation. Spartacus relied on this kind of propaganda, as did the communes, the crusades, the French movement of 1793, and so on. But it reached its height with Lenin, which leads us to note that, though it is most often an opposition's propaganda, the propaganda of agitation can also be made by governments. For example, when a government wants to galvanize energies to mobilize the entire nation for war, it will use a propaganda of agitation. At that moment, the subversion is aimed at the enemy, whose strength must be destroyed by psychological as well as physical means, and whose force must be overcome by the vigor of one's own nation. Governments also employ the propaganda of agitation when, after having been installed in power, they want to pursue a revolutionary course of action. Thus Lenin, having installed the Soviets, organized the agitprops and developed the long campaign of agitation in Russia to conquer resistance and crush the kulaks. In such a case, subversion aims at the resistance of a segment or a class, and an internal enemy is chosen for attack. Similarly, most of Hitler's propaganda was propaganda of agitation. Hitler could work his sweeping social and economic transformations only by constant agitation, by overexcitement, by straining energies to the utmost. Nazism grew by successive waves of feverish enthusiasm and thus attained its revolutionary objectives. 
Finally, the great campaigns in communist China were precisely propaganda of agitation. Only such propaganda could produce those great leaps forward. The system of the communes was accepted only because of propaganda of agitation, which unleashed simultaneously physical action by the population and a change in their behavior by subverting habits, customs, and beliefs that were obstacles to the great leap forward. This was internal propaganda. And Mao was perfectly right in saying that the enemy is found within each person. Footnote Mao's Theory of the Mold To be discussed in Appendix 2 Propaganda of agitation addresses itself, then, to internal elements in each of us, but it is always translated into reality by physical involvement in a tense and overexcited activity. By making the individual participate in this activity, the propagandist releases the internal breaks, the psychological barriers of habit, belief, and judgment. The Pietilietka campaign in the Soviet Union must also be classified as propaganda of agitation. Like the Chinese campaign, its aim was to stretch energies to the maximum in order to obtain the highest possible work output. Thus, for a while, propaganda of agitation can serve productivity, and the principal examples of propaganda of agitation conducted by governments are of that type. But agitation propaganda most often is revolutionary propaganda in the ordinary sense of the term. Thus, communist propaganda in the West, which provokes strikes or riots, is of this type. The propaganda of Fidel Castro, that of Ho Chi Minh before he seized power, and that of the FLN are the most typical recent examples. In all cases, propaganda of agitation tries to stretch energies to the utmost, obtain substantial sacrifices, and induce the individual to bear heavy ordeals. It takes him out of his everyday life, his normal framework, and plunges him into enthusiasm and adventure. It opens to him hitherto unsuspected possibilities and suggests extraordinary goals that nevertheless seem to him completely within reach. Propaganda of agitation thus unleashes an explosive movement. It operates inside a crisis or actually provokes the crisis itself. On the other hand, such propaganda can obtain only effects of relatively short duration. If the proposed objective is not achieved fast enough, enthusiasm will give way to discouragement and despair. Therefore, specialists in agitation propaganda break up the desired goals into a series of stages to be reached one by one. There is a period of pressure to obtain some result, then a period of relaxation and rest. This is how Hitler, Lenin, and Mao operated. A people or a party cannot be kept too long at the highest level of sacrifice, conviction, and devotion. The individual cannot be made to live in a state of perpetual enthusiasm and insecurity. After a certain amount of combat, he needs a respite and a familiar universe to which he is accustomed. This subversive propaganda of agitation is obviously the flashiest. It attracts attention because of its explosive and revolutionary character. It is also the easiest to make. In order to succeed, it need only be addressed to the most simple and violent sentiments through the most elementary means. Hate is generally its most profitable resource. It is extremely easy to launch a revolutionary movement based on hatred of a particular enemy. Hatred is probably the most spontaneous and common sentiment, it consists of attributing one's misfortunes and sins to another, who must be killed in order to assure the disappearance of those misfortunes and sins. Whether the object of hatred is the bourgeois, the communist, the Jew, the colonialist, or the saboteur, makes no difference. Propaganda of agitation succeeds each time it designates someone as the source of all misery, provided that he is not too powerful. Of course, one cannot draw basic conclusions from a movement launched in this way. It is extraordinary to see intellectuals, for example, take anti-white sentiments of Algerians or Negroes seriously and to believe that these express fundamental feelings. To label the white man, who is the invader and the exploiter, it is true, as the source of all ills, 
and to provoke revolts against him is an extremely easy job. But it proves neither that the white man is the source of all evil, nor that the Negro automatically hates him. However, hatred once provoked continues to reproduce itself. Along with this universal sentiment found in all propaganda of agitation, even when provoked by the government and even in the movement of the Chinese communes, are secondary motives more or less adapted to the circumstances. A sure expedient is the call to liberty among an oppressed, conquered, invaded, or colonized people. Calls summoning the Cuban or Algerian people to liberty, for example, are assured of sympathy and support. The same is true for the promise of bread to the hungry, the promise of land to the plundered, and the call to the truth among the religious. As a whole, these are appeals to simple elementary sentiments requiring no refinement, and thanks to which the propagandist can gain acceptance for the biggest lies, the worst delusions, sentiments that act immediately, provoke violent reactions, and awaken such passions that they justify all sacrifices. Such sentiments correspond to the primary needs of all men, the need to eat, to be one's own master. To hate. Given the ease of releasing such sentiments, the material and psychological means employed can be simple the pamphlet, the speech, the poster, the rumor. In order to make propaganda of agitation, it is not necessary to have the mass media of communication at one's disposal, for such propaganda feeds on itself, and each person seized by it becomes in turn a propagandist. Just because it does not need a large technical apparatus, it is extremely useful as subversive propaganda. Nor is it necessary to be concerned with probability or veracity. Any statement whatever, no matter how stupid, any tall tale will be believed once it enters into the passionate current of hatred. A characteristic example occurred in July 1960, when Patrice Lumumba claimed that the Belgians had provoked the revolt of the Congolese soldiers in the camp at Tisville. Finally, the less educated and informed the people to whom propaganda of agitation is addressed, the easier it is to make such propaganda. That is why it is particularly suited for use among the so-called lower classes, the proletariat, and among African peoples. There it can rely on some key words of magical import which are believed without question, even though the hearers cannot attribute any real content to them and do not fully understand them. Among colonized peoples, one of these words is independence, an extremely profitable word from the point of view of effective subversion. It is useless to try to explain to people that national independence is not at all the same as individual liberty. That the black peoples generally have not developed to the point at which they can live in political independence in the Western manner, that the economy of their countries permits them merely to change masters. But no reason can prevail against the magic of the word. And it is the least intelligent people who are most likely to be thrown into a revolutionary movement by such summary appeals. In contrast to this propaganda of agitation is the propaganda of integration, the propaganda of developed nations and characteristic of our civilization. In fact, it did not exist before the 20th century. It is a propaganda of conformity. It is related to the fact, analyzed earlier, that in Western society it is no longer sufficient to obtain a transitory political act, such as a vote. One needs total adherence to a society's truths and behavioral patterns. As the more perfectly uniform the society, the stronger its power and effectiveness, each member should be only an organic and functional fragment of it, perfectly adapted and integrated. He must share the stereotypes, beliefs, and reactions of the group. He must be an active participant in its economic, ethical, aesthetic, and political doings. All his activities, all his sentiments are dependent on this collectivity. And, as he is often reminded, he can fulfill himself only through this collectivity as a member of the group. Footnote this is one of the points common to all American works on microsociology. Propaganda of integration, thus, aims at making the individual participate in his society in every way. It is a long-term propaganda. 
a self-reproducing propaganda that seeks to obtain stable behavior, to adapt the individual to his everyday life, to reshape his thoughts and behavior in terms of the permanent social setting. We can see that this propaganda is more extensive and complex than propaganda of agitation. It must be permanent, for the individual can no longer be left to himself. In many cases, such propaganda is confined to rationalizing an existing situation, to transforming unconscious actions of members of a society into consciously desired activity that is visible, laudable, and justified. Perlin and Rosenberg call this the elaboration of latent consequences. In such cases, it must be proved that the listeners, the citizens in general, are the beneficiaries of the resultant socio-political developments. Integration propaganda aims at stabilizing the social body, at unifying and reinforcing it. It is thus the preferred instrument of government. Though properly speaking, it is not exclusively political propaganda. Since 1930, the propaganda of the Soviet Union, as well as that since the war of all the people's republics, has been a propaganda of integration. Footnote. At the Conference on Ideological Problems held in Moscow at the end of December 1961, the need to shape the communist man was reaffirmed, and the propagandists were blamed for the 20-year delay in achieving this goal. But this type of propaganda can also be made by a group of organizations other than those of government, going in the same direction, more or less spontaneously, more or less planned by the state. The most important example of the use of such propaganda is the United States. Obviously, integration propaganda is much more subtle and complex than agitation propaganda. It seeks not a temporary excitement, but a total molding of the person in depth. Here, all psychological and opinion analyses must be utilized, as well as the mass media of communication. It is primarily this integration propaganda that we shall discuss in our study, for it is the most important of our time, despite the success and the spectacular character of subversive propaganda. Let us note right away a final aspect of integration propaganda— the more comfortable, cultivated, and informed the milieu to which it is addressed, the better it works. Intellectuals are more sensitive than peasants to integration propaganda. In fact, they share the stereotypes of a society even when they are political opponents of the society. Take a recent example. French intellectuals opposed to war in Algeria seemed hostile to integration propaganda. Nevertheless, they shared all the stereotypes and myths of French society, technology, nation, progress. All their actions were based on those myths. They were thoroughly ripe for an integration propaganda, for they were already adapted to its demands. Their temporary opposition was not of the slightest importance, just changing the color of the flag was enough to find them again among the most conformist groups. One essential problem remains. When a revolutionary movement is launched, it operates, as we have said, with agitation propaganda. But once the revolutionary party has taken power, it must begin immediately to operate with integration propaganda, save for the exceptions mentioned. That is the way to balance its power and stabilize the situation. But the transition from one type of propaganda to the other is extremely delicate and difficult. After one has, over the years, excited the masses, flung them into adventures, fed their hopes and their hatreds, opened the gates of action to them, and assured them that all their actions were justified, it is difficult to make them re-enter the ranks, to integrate them into the normal framework of politics and economics. What has been unleashed cannot be brought under control so easily, particularly habits of violence or of taking the law into one's own hands. These disappear very slowly. This is all the more true because the results achieved by revolution are usually deceptive. Just to seize power is not enough. The people want to give full vent to the hatred developed by agitation propaganda and to have the promised bread or land immediately. And the troops that helped in the seizure of power rapidly become the opposition. 
and continue to act as they did under the influence of subversion propaganda. The newly established government must then use propaganda to eliminate these difficulties and to prevent the continuation of the battle. But this must be propaganda designed to incorporate individuals into the new order, to transform their opponents into collaborators of the state, to make them accept delays in the fulfillment of promises. In other words, it must be integration propaganda. Generally, only one element, hatred, can be immediately satisfied. Everything else must be changed. Obviously, this conversion of propaganda is very difficult. The techniques and methods of agitation propaganda cannot be used. The same feelings cannot be aroused. Other propagandists must be employed, as totally different qualities are required for integration propaganda. The greatest difficulty is that agitation propaganda produces very rapid and spectacular effects, whereas integration propaganda acts slowly, gradually, and imperceptibly. After the masses have been subjected to agitation propaganda, to neutralize their aroused impulses with integration propaganda without being swept away by the masses is a delicate problem. In some cases, it is actually impossible to regain control of the masses. The Belgian Congo is a good example. The black people, very excited since 1959 by Lumumba's propaganda, first released their excitement by battling among themselves. Then, once the black government was installed, they ran wild and it was impossible to get them under control. That was the direct effect of Lumumba's unrestrained propaganda against the Belgians. It seems that only a dictatorship can help this situation. Footnote, written in September 1960. Another good example is given by Sauvy. During the war, broadcasts from London and Algiers aroused the French people on the subject of food shortages and accused the Germans of artificially creating scarcity through requisitioning, which was not true. After liberation, the government was unable to overcome the effects of this propaganda. Abundance was expected to return immediately. It was impossible to control inflation and maintain rationing. Integration failed because of prior agitation. In some cases, agitation propaganda leads to a partial failure. Sometimes there is a very long period of trouble and unhappiness, during which it is impossible to restore order, and only after a dozen years of integration propaganda can the situation be controlled again. Obviously, the best example is the Soviet Union. As early as 1920, integration propaganda, as conceived by Lenin, was employed, but it dampened the revolutionary mentality only very slowly. Only after 1929 did the effects of agitation propaganda finally disappear. The Kronstadt Rebellion was a striking example. In other cases, the government must follow the crowds, which cannot be held back once they are set off. The government is forced, step by step, to satisfy appetites aroused by agitation propaganda. This was partly the case with Hitler. After taking power, he continued to control the people by agitation propaganda. He thus had to hold out something new all the time on the road to war. Rearmament, the Rhineland, Spain, Austria, Czechoslovakia. The propaganda aimed at the SA and SS was agitation propaganda as was the propaganda pushing the German people into war in 1937-39. At the same time, the population as a whole was subjected to a propaganda of assimilation. Thus Hitler used two kinds of propaganda simultaneously. Similarly, in the Soviet Union, agitation propaganda against imperialists and saboteurs, or for the fulfillment of the plan, is employed simultaneously with propaganda of integration into the system using different arguments and media, through political education, youth movements, and so on. This is exactly the situation today of Castro in Cuba. He is incapable of integrating and can only pursue his agitation propaganda. This will lead him inevitably to dictatorship and probably to war. Other regimes, however, have managed perfectly well to pass from one propaganda to the other, and to make integration propaganda take the lead rapidly. This was the case of North Vietnam and China, 
and was owing to the remarkable conception of propaganda which they have had since the time of the revolution. In fact, since 1927, Mao's propaganda has been subversive. It appeals to the most basic feelings in order to arouse revolt. It leads to combat, it conditions people, and it relies on slogans. But at the same time, as soon as the individual is pressed into the army, he is subjected to an integration propaganda that Mao calls political education. Long-winded explanations tell him why it is necessary to act in a particular way. A biased but seemingly objective news system is set up as part of that propaganda. Behavior is regimented and disciplined. The integration of the revolutionary rebel into a prodigiously disciplined, organized, and regimented army, which goes hand in hand with his intellectual and moral indoctrination, prepares him to be taken into custody by integration propaganda after victory, and to be inserted into the new society without resistance or anarchical excursions. This patient and meticulous shaping of the whole man, this putting into the mold, as Mao calls it, is certainly his principal success. Of course, he began with a situation in which man was already well integrated into the group, and he substituted one complete framework for another. Also, he needed only to shape the minds of people who had had very little education, in the Western sense of the term, so that they learned to understand everything through images, stereotypes, slogans, and interpretations that he knew how to inculcate. Under such conditions, integration is easy and practically irreversible. Lastly, the distinction between the two types of propaganda partly explains the defeat of French propaganda in Algeria since 1955. On one side, the propaganda of the FLN was an act of agitation designed to arouse feelings of subversion and combat. Against this, the French army pitted a propaganda of integration, of assimilation into a French framework and into the French administration. French political concepts, education, professional training, and ideology. But a world of difference lay between the two as to speed, ease, and effectiveness which explains why, in this competition between propagandas, the FLN won out at almost every stage. This does not mean that FLN propaganda reflected the real feeling of the Algerians. But if some say, you are unhappy, so rise and slay your master and tomorrow you will be free, and others say, we will help you, work with you, and in the end all your problems will be solved, there is little question as to who will command allegiance. In spite of everything, however, integration propaganda, as we have said above, is by far the most important new fact of our day. Vertical and Horizontal Propaganda Classic propaganda, as one usually thinks of it, is a vertical propaganda, in the sense that it is made by a leader, a technician, a political or religious head who acts from the superior position of his authority and seeks to influence the crowd below. Such propaganda comes from above. It is conceived in the secret recesses of political enclaves. It uses all technical methods of centralized mass communication. It envelops a mass of individuals, but those who practice it are on the outside. Let us recall here the distinction cited above made by Laswell between direct propaganda and effect propaganda, though both are forms of vertical propaganda. One trait of vertical propaganda is that the propagandee remains alone even though he is part of a crowd. His shouts of enthusiasm or hatred, though part of the shouts of the crowd, do not put him in communication with others. His shouts are only a response to the leader. Finally, this kind of propaganda requires a passive attitude from those subjected to it. They are seized, they are manipulated, they are committed. They experience what they are asked to experience. They are really transformed into objects. Consider, for instance, the quasi-hypnotic condition of those propagandized at a meeting. There, the individual is depersonalized. His decisions are no longer his own, but those suggested by the leader imposed by a conditioned reflex. When we say that this is a passive attitude, we do not mean that the propagandee does not act. On the contrary, he acts with vigor and passion. 
but as we shall see, his action is not his own, though he believes it is. Throughout, it is conceived and willed outside of him. The propagandist is acting through him, reducing him to the condition of a passive instrument. He is mechanized, dominated, hence passive. This is all the more so because he often is plunged into a mass of propagandies in which he loses his individuality and becomes one element among others, inseparable from the crowd and inconceivable without it. In any case, vertical propaganda is by far the most widespread, whether Hitler's or Stalin's, that of the French government since 1950, or that of the United States. It is in one sense the easiest to make, but its direct effects are extremely perishable, and it must be renewed constantly. It is primarily useful for agitation propaganda. Horizontal propaganda is a much more recent development. We know it in two forms, Chinese propaganda and group dynamics in human relations. The first is political propaganda. The second is sociological propaganda. Both are integration propaganda. Their characteristics are identical, surprising as that may seem when we consider their totally different origins in context, research methods, and perspective. This propaganda can be called horizontal because it is made inside the group, not from the top, where, in principle, all individuals are equal and there is no leader. The individual makes contact with others at his own level rather than with a leader. Such propaganda, therefore, always seeks conscious adherence. Its content is presented in didactic fashion and addressed to the intelligence. The leader, the propagandist, is there only as a sort of animator or discussion leader. Sometimes his presence and his identity are not even known. For example, the ghostwriter in certain American groups or the police spy in Chinese groups. The individual's adherence to his group is conscious because he is aware of it and recognizes it, but it is ultimately involuntary because he is trapped in a dialectic and in a group that leads him unfailingly to this adherence. His adherence is also intellectual because he can express his conviction clearly and logically, but it is not genuine because the information, the data, the reasoning that have led him to adhere to the group were themselves deliberately falsified in order to lead him there. But the most remarkable characteristic of horizontal propaganda is the small group. The individual participates actively in the life of this group in a genuine and lively dialogue. In China, the group is watched carefully to see that each member speaks, expresses himself, gives his opinions. Only in speaking will the individual gradually discover his own convictions, which also will be those of the group, become irrevocably involved and help others to form their opinions, which are identical. Each individual helps to form the opinion of the group, but the group helps each individual to discover the correct line. For miraculously, it is always the correct line, the anticipated solution, the proper convictions which are eventually discovered. All the participants are placed on an equal footing. Meetings are intimate, discussion is informal, and no leader presides. Progress is slow. There must be many meetings, each recalling events of the preceding one, so that a common experience can be shared. To produce voluntary rather than mechanical adherence and to create a solution that is found by the individual rather than imposed from above is indeed a very advanced method, much more effective and binding than the mechanical action of vertical propaganda. When the individual is mechanized, he can be manipulated easily. But to put the individual in a position where he apparently has a freedom of choice and still obtain from him what one expects is much more subtle and risky. Vertical propaganda needs the huge apparatus of the mass media of communication. Horizontal propaganda needs a huge organization of people. Each individual must be inserted into a group, if possible into several groups with convergent actions. The groups must be homogeneous, specialized, and small. Fifteen to twenty is the optimum figure to permit active participation by each person. The group must comprise individuals of the same sex, class, age, and environment. 
Most friction between individuals can then be ironed out and all factors eliminated which might distract attention, splinter motivations, and prevent the establishment of the proper line. Therefore, a great many groups are needed. There are millions in China, as well as a great many group leaders. That is the principal problem. For if, according to Mao's formula, each must be a propagandist for all, it is equally true that there must be liaison men between the authorities and each group. Such men must be unswerving, integrated into the group themselves, and must exert a stabilizing and lasting influence. They must be members of an integrated political body, in this case the Communist Party. This form of propaganda needs two conditions. First of all, a lack of contact between groups. A member of a small group must not belong to other groups in which he would be subjected to other influences. That would give him a chance to find himself again, and with it, the strength to resist. This is why the Chinese communists insisted on breaking up traditional groups, such as the family. A private and heterogeneous group, with different ages, sexes, and occupations, the family is a tremendous obstacle to such propaganda. In China, where the family was still very powerful, it had to be broken up. The problem is very different in the United States and in the Western societies. There the social structures are sufficiently flexible and disentangled to be no obstacle. It is not necessary to break up the family in order to make the group dynamic and fully effective. The family already is broken up and no longer has the power to envelop the individual. It is no longer the place where the individual is formed and has his roots. The field is clear for the influence of small groups. The other condition for horizontal propaganda is identity between propaganda and education. A small group is a center of total moral, intellectual, psychological, and civic education, information, documentation, catechization, but it is primarily a political group, and everything it does is related to politics. Education has no meaning there except in relation to politics. This is equally true for American groups, despite appearances to the contrary, but the term politics must be taken here in its broadest sense. The political education given by Mao is on the level of a catechism, which is most effective in small groups. Individuals are taught what it is to be a member of a communist society, and though the verbal factor— formulas to learn which are the basic tenets of Marxist communism, is important. The propagandist seeks above all to habituate the group members to a particular new behavior, to instill belief in a human type that the propagandist wishes to create, to put its members in touch with reality through group experience. In this sense, the education is very complete, with complete coordination between what is learned intellectually and what is lived in practice. Obviously, no political instruction is possible in American groups. All Americans already know the great principles and institutions of democracy. Yet these groups are political. Their education is specifically democratic. That is to say, individuals are taught how to take action and how to behave as members of a democracy. It is indeed a civic education, a thorough education addressed to the entire man. These groups are a means of education, but such education is only one of the elements of propaganda aimed at obtaining adherence to a society, its principles, its ideology, and its myths, and to the behavior required by the authorities. The small groups are the chosen place for this act of education, and the regime employing horizontal propaganda can permit no other style or form of instruction and education than these. We have already seen that the importance of these small groups requires the breaking up of other groups, such as the family. Now we must understand that the education given in the political small groups requires either the disappearance of academic education or its integration into the system. In The Organization Man, William H. White clearly shows the way in which the American school is becoming more and more a simple mechanism to adapt youngsters to American society. As for the Chinese school, it is only a system of propaganda charged with catechizing children while teaching them to read. Horizontal propaganda thus is very hard to make, particularly because it needs so many instructors. 
but it is exceptionally efficient through its meticulous encirclement of everybody, through the effective participation of all present, and through their public declarations of adherence. It is peculiarly a system that seems to coincide perfectly with egalitarian societies claiming to be based on the will of the people and calling themselves democratic. Each group is composed of persons who are alike, and one actually can formulate the will of such a group. But all this is ultimately much more stringent and totalitarian than explosive propaganda. Thanks to this system, Mao has succeeded in passing from subversive propaganda to integration propaganda. Rational and Irrational Propaganda That propaganda has an irrational character is still a well-established and well-recognized truth. The distinction between propaganda and information is often made. Information is addressed to reason and experience. It furnishes facts. Propaganda is addressed to feelings and passions. It is irrational. There is, of course, some truth in this, but the reality is not so simple. For there is such a thing as rational propaganda, just as there is rational advertising. Advertisements for automobiles or electrical companies are generally based on technical descriptions or proved performance, rational elements used for advertising purposes. Similarly, there is a propaganda based exclusively on facts, statistics, economic ideas. Soviet propaganda, especially since 1950, has been based on the undeniable scientific progress and economic development of the Soviet Union. But it is still propaganda, for it uses these facts to demonstrate rationally the superiority of its system and to demand everybody's support. It has often been noted that in wartime, the successful propaganda is that based directly on obvious facts. When an enemy army has just suffered a defeat, an appeal to enemy soldiers to surrender will seem rational. When the superiority of one of the combatants becomes apparent, his appeal for surrender is an appeal to reason. Similarly, the propaganda of French grandeur since 1958 is a rational and factual propaganda. French films in particular are almost all centered around French technological successes. The film Algérie Française is an economic film, overloaded with economic geography and statistics. But it is still propaganda. Such rational propaganda is practiced by various regimes. The education provided by Mao in China is based on pseudo-rational proofs, but they are effective for those who pay attention to them and accept them. American propaganda, out of concern for honesty and democratic conviction, also attempts to be rational and factual. The news bulletins of the American services are a typical example of rational propaganda based on knowledge and information, and nothing resembles these American publications more than the Review of the German Democratic Republic, which has taken over exactly the same propaganda style. We can say that the more progress we make, the more propaganda becomes rational, and the more it is based on serious arguments, on dissemination of knowledge, on factual information, figures, and statistics. Footnote Ernst Chris and Nathan Leites have correctly noted the differences in this connection between the propaganda of 1914 and that of 1940. The latter is more sober and informative less emotional and moralistic. As we say in fashionable parlance, it is addressed less to the superego and more to the ego. Purely impassioned and emotional propaganda is disappearing. Even such propaganda contained elements of fact. Hitler's most inflammatory speeches always contained some facts which served as base or pretext. It is unusual nowadays to find a frenzied propaganda composed solely of claims without relation to reality. It is still found in Egyptian propaganda, and it appeared in July 1960 in Lumumba's propaganda in the Belgian Congo. Such propaganda is now discredited, but it still convinces and always excites. Modern man needs a relation to facts, a self-justification to convince himself that by acting in a certain way he is obeying reason and proved experience. 
We must therefore study the close relationship between information and propaganda. Propaganda's content increasingly resembles information. It has even clearly been proved that a violent, excessive, shock-provoking propaganda text leads ultimately to less conviction and participation than does a more informative and reasonable text on the same subject. A large dose of fear precipitates immediate action. A reasonably small dose produces lasting support. The listener's critical powers decrease if the propaganda message is more rational and less violent. Propaganda's content, therefore, tends to be rational and factual. But is this enough to show that propaganda is rational? Besides content, there is the receiver of the content, the individual who undergoes the barrage of propaganda or information. When an individual has read a technical and factual advertisement of a television set or a new automobile engine, and if he is not an electrician or a mechanic, what does he remember? Can he describe a transistor or a new type of wheel suspension? Of course not. All those technical descriptions and exact details will form a general picture in his head, rather vague but highly colored, and when he speaks of the engine he will say, It's terrific. It is exactly the same with all rational, logical, factual propaganda. After having read an article on wheat in the United States, or on steel in the Soviet Union, does the reader remember the figures and statistics? Has he understood the economic mechanisms? Has he absorbed the line of reasoning? If he is not an economist by profession, he will retain an overall impression, a general conviction that these Americans, or Russians, are amazing. They have methods. Progress is important after all, and so on. Similarly, emerging from the showing of a film such as Algérie Française, he forgets all the figures and logical proofs and retains only a feeling of rightful pride in the accomplishments of France in Algeria. Thereafter, what remains with the individual affected by this propaganda is a perfectly irrational picture, a purely emotional feeling, a myth. The facts, the data, the reasoning, all are forgotten, and only the impression remains. And this is indeed what the propagandist ultimately seeks, for the individual will never begin to act on the basis of facts or engage in purely rational behavior. What makes him act is the emotional pressure, the vision of a future, the myth. The problem is to create an irrational response on the basis of rational and factual elements. That response must be fed with facts. Those frenzies must be provoked by rigorously logical proofs. Thus propaganda in itself becomes honest, strict, exact, but its effect remains irrational because of the spontaneous transformation of all its contents by the individual. We emphasize that this is true not just for propaganda but also for information. Except for the specialist, information, even when it is very well presented, gives people only a broad image of the world. And much of the information disseminated nowadays Research findings, facts, statistics, explanations, analyses eliminate personal judgment and the capacity to form one's own opinion even more surely than the most extravagant propaganda. This claim may seem shocking, but it is a fact that excessive data do not enlighten the reader or the listener. They drown him. He cannot remember them all, or coordinate them, or understand them. If he does not want to risk losing his mind, he will merely draw a general picture from them. And the more facts supplied, the more simplistic the image. If a man is given one item of information, he will retain it. If he is given a hundred data in one field on one question, he will have only a general idea of that question. But if he is given a hundred items of information on all the political and economic aspects of a nation, he will arrive at a summary judgment, the Russians are terrific, and so on. A surfeit of data, far from permitting people to make judgments and form opinions, prevents them from doing so and actually paralyzes them. They are caught in a web of facts and must remain at the level of the facts they have been given. 
they cannot even form a choice or a judgment in other areas or on other subjects. Thus, the mechanisms of modern information induce a sort of hypnosis in the individual who cannot get out of the field that has been laid out for him by the information. His opinion will ultimately be formed solely on the basis of the facts transmitted to him and not on the basis of his choice and his personal experience. The more the techniques of distributing information develop, the more the individual is shaped by such information. It is not true that he can choose freely with regard to what is presented to him as the truth. And because rational propaganda thus creates an irrational situation, it remains, above all, propaganda. That is, an inner control over the individual by a social force, which means that it deprives him of himself. Chapter 2 the Conditions for the Existence of Propaganda Why and how does propaganda exist? We have already noted that propaganda was not the same in the past as it is today, that its nature has changed. We have also said that one cannot simply make any propaganda just anywhere, at any time, or in any fashion. Without a certain milieu, propaganda cannot exist. Only under certain conditions can the phenomenon of propaganda appear and grow. The most obvious of these are accidental or purely historical conditions. Beyond that, it is clear, for example, that the emergence of propaganda is connected with a number of scientific discoveries. Modern man could not exist without the mass media. The inventions that produced press, radio, television, and motion pictures are those that produced the means of modern transportation and which permit crowds of diverse individuals from all over to assemble easily and frequently. Present-day propaganda meetings no longer bear any relation to past assemblies, to the meetings of the Athenians in the Agora or of the Romans in the Forum. Then there is the scientific research in all the other fields, sociology and psychology, for example. Without the discoveries made in the past half-century by scientists who never wanted this, there would be no propaganda. The findings of social psychology, depth psychology, behaviorism, group sociology, sociology of public opinion, are the very foundations of the propagandist's work. In a different sense, political circumstances have also been effective and immediate causes of the development of massive propaganda. The First World War, the Russian Revolution of 1917, Hitler's Revolution of 1933, the Second World War the further development of revolutionary wars since 1944 in China, Indochina, and Algeria, as well as the Cold War, each was a step in the development of modern propaganda. With each of these events, propaganda developed further, increased in depth, discovered new methods. At the same time, it conquered new nations and new territories. To reach the enemy, one must use his weapons. This undeniable argument is the key to the systematic development of propaganda. And in this way, propaganda has become a permanent feature in nations that actually despise it, such as the United States and France. Let us also note the influence of doctrines and men. It is clear that a particular doctrine can make propaganda the very center of political life, the essence of political action, rather than merely an accessory or an incidental and rather suspect instrument. Leninism, as developed by Mao, is really a doctrine of propaganda plus action, indissolubly linked to Marxism, of which it is an expression. As Leninism spreads, propaganda develops with it, by necessity and not by choice. In addition, certain men have greatly helped the development of propaganda. Hitler and Goebbels, for example, had a genius for it. But the role of such men is never decisive. They do not invent propaganda. It does not exist just because they want it to. They are only the producers and directors, the catalysts who profit from the confluence of favorable circumstances. All this is too well known and too obvious to dwell on. But the sum of certain conditions is still not enough to explain the development of propaganda. The overall sociological conditions in a society must provide a favorable environment for propaganda to succeed. Footnote. The same factors of influence will have different weight and effectiveness in different contexts. 
The media employed by the propagandists can work only in a particular social structure. This reciprocal influence of propaganda and social structure is precisely one of the problems that need to be studied. Ernst Chris and Nathan Leitis have properly noted that public responses to the impact of propaganda have changed considerably in the past few decades, and that this change is the result of trends in the psychosociological conditions of 20th century life. 1. The Sociological Conditions Individualist Society and Mass Society For propaganda to succeed, a society must first have two complementary qualities. It must be both an individualist and a mass society. These two qualities are often considered contradictory. It is believed that an individualist society in which the individual is thought to have a higher value than the group tends to destroy groups that limit the individual's range of action, whereas a mass society negates the individual and reduces him to a cipher. But this contradiction is purely theoretical and a delusion. In actual fact, an individualist society must be a mass society, because the first move toward liberation of the individual is to break up the small groups that are an organic fact of the entire society. In this process, the individual frees himself completely from family, village, parish, or brotherhood bonds, only to find himself directly vis-a-vis the entire society. When individuals are not held together by local structures, the only form in which they can live together is in an unstructured mass society. Similarly, a mass society can only be based on individuals, that is, on men in their isolation, whose identities are determined by their relationships with one another. Precisely because the individual claims to be equal to all other individuals, he becomes an abstraction and is, in effect, reduced to a cipher. As soon as local organic groupings are reformed, society tends to cease being individualistic and thereby to lose its mass character as well. What then occurs is the formation of organic groups of elite in what remains a mass society but which rests on the framework of strongly structured and centralized political parties, unions, and so on. These organizations reach only an active minority, and the members of this minority cease to be individualistic by being integrated into such organic associations. From this perspective, individualist society and mass society are two corollary aspects of the same reality. This corresponds to what we have said about the mass media. To perform a propagandistic function, they must capture the individual and the mass at the same time. Propaganda can be effective only in an individualist society, by which we do not mean the theoretical individualism of the 19th century, but the genuine individualism of our society. Of course, the two are not diametrically opposed. Where the greatest value is attributed to the individual, the end result is a society composed in essence only of individuals, and therefore one that is not integrated. But although theory and reality are not in total opposition, a great difference nevertheless exists between them. In individualist theory, the individual has eminent value. Man himself is the master of his life. In individualist reality, each human being is subject to innumerable forces and influences and is not at all master of his own life. As long as solidly constituted groups exist, those who are integrated into them are subject to them. But at the same time, they are protected by them against such external influences as propaganda. An individual can be influenced by forces such as propaganda only when he is cut off from membership in local groups. Because such groups are organic and have a well-structured material, spiritual, and emotional life, they are not easily penetrated by propaganda. For example, it is much more difficult today for an outside propaganda to influence a soldier integrated into a military group or a militant member of a monolithic party than to influence the same man when he is a mere citizen. Nor is the organic group sensitive to psychological contagion, which is so important to the success of mass propaganda. One can say generally that 19th century individualist society came about through the disintegration of such small groups as the family or the church. 
Once these groups lost their importance, the individual was left substantially isolated. He was plunged into a new environment, generally urban and thereby uprooted. He no longer had a traditional place in which to live. He was no longer geographically attached to a fixed place or historically to his ancestry. An individual thus uprooted can only be part of a mass. He is on his own, and individualist thinking asks of him something he has never been required to do before, that he, the individual, become the measure of all things. Thus he begins to judge everything for himself. In fact, he must make his own judgments. He is thrown entirely on his own resources. He can find criteria only in himself. He is clearly responsible for his own decisions, both personal and social. He becomes the beginning and the end of everything. Before him there was nothing. After him there will be nothing. His own life becomes the only criterion of justice and injustice, of good and evil. In theory, this is admirable. But in practice, what actually happens? The individual is placed in a minority position and burdened at the same time with a total crushing responsibility. Such conditions make an individualist society fertile ground for modern propaganda. The permanent uncertainty, the social mobility, the absence of sociological protection and of traditional frames of reference, all these inevitably provide propaganda with a malleable environment that can be fed information from the outside and conditioned at will. The individual left to himself is defenseless, the more so because he may be caught up in a social current, thus becoming easy prey for propaganda. As a member of a small group, he was fairly well protected from collective influences, customs, and suggestions. He was relatively unaffected by changes in the society at large. He obeyed only if his entire group obeyed. This does not mean that he was freer, but only that he was determined by his local environment and by his restricted group, and very little by broad ideological influences or collective psychic stimuli. The common error was to believe that if the individual were liberated from the smaller organic groups, he would be set free. But, in fact, he was exposed to the influence of mass currents, to the influence of the state, and direct integration into mass society. Finally, he became a victim of propaganda. Physically and psychologically uprooted, the individual became much less stable. The stability of the peasantry, for example, is one of the reasons why this group is relatively unaffected by propaganda. Goebbels himself recognized that the peasants could be reached only if their structured milieu was shattered, and the difficulties that Lenin experienced in integrating the Russian peasantry into the pattern of the revolution are well known. Thus, here is one of the first conditions for the growth and development of modern propaganda. It emerged in Western Europe in the 19th century and the first half of the 20th precisely because that was when society was becoming increasingly individualistic and its organic structures were breaking down. But for propaganda to develop, society must also be a mass society. It cannot be a society that is simply breaking up or dissolving. It cannot be a society about to disappear, which might well be a society in which small groups are breaking up. The society that favors the development of propaganda must be a society maintaining itself, but at the same time taking on a new structure, that of the mass society. Footnote. Of the innumerable books on the masses, The Revolt of the Masses by José Ortega y Gasset is still valid despite the criticism of many sociologists. Elmo Roper's classification of individual groups in the United States is well known. About 90% of the population is politically inert. They become active only accidentally when they are set into motion, but they are normally inactive, inattentive, manipulable, and without critical faculty, qualities that form the masses. Roper, Who Tells the Storytellers? Saturday Review, July 31, 1954. Throughout, we are discussing this mass man, the average man. The relationship between masses and crowds has been much discussed, and distinctions have been drawn between masses and massification. The first is the gathering of a temporary crowd. 
the second the involvement of individuals in a permanent social cycle. Certainly, a crowd gathered at a given point is not properly speaking a mass. A mass society is a society with considerable population density in which local structures and organizations are weak. Currents of opinion are strongly felt. Men are grouped into large and influential collectives. The individual is part of these collectives, and a certain psychological unity exists. Mass society, moreover, is characterized by a certain uniformity of material life. Despite differences of environment, training, or situation, the men of a mass society have the same preoccupations, the same interest in technical matters, the same mythical beliefs, the same prejudices. Footnote. A mass society is also a strongly organized society. John Albig makes a profound observation when he says that propaganda is an inevitable concomitant of the growth and organization of society. The individuals making up the mass in the grip of propaganda may seem quite diversified, but they have enough in common for propaganda to act on them directly. In contemporary society, there actually is a close relation between mass and crowd. Because a mass society exists, crowds can gather frequently. That is, the individual constantly moves from one crowd to another, from a street crowd to a factory crowd or a theater crowd, a subway crowd, a crowd gathered at a meeting. Conversely, the very fact of belonging to crowds turns the individual more and more into a mass man and thus modifies his very being. There is no question that man's psychic being is modified by his belonging to a mass society. This modification takes place even if no propaganda appeal is made to the soul of the crowd or the spirit of the collective. This individual produced by a mass society is more readily available, more credulous, more suggestible, more excitable. Under such conditions, propaganda can develop best. Because a mass society existed in Western Europe at the end of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th, propaganda became possible and necessary. From mass society emerged the psychological elements most favorable to propaganda, symbols and stereotypes. Of course, these also exist in small groups and limited societies, but there they are not of the same kind, number, or degree of abstraction. In a mass society, they are more detached from reality, more manipulable, more numerous, more likely to provoke intense but fleeting emotions, and at the same time less significant, less inherent in personal life. The symbols in a primitive society do not permit the free and flexible play of propaganda because they are rigid, stable, and small in number. Their nature is also different. Of religious origin at first, they become political, in the broad sense, in mass society, finally, we find the maximum deviation between public opinions and latent private opinions, which are either repressed or progressively eliminated. Thus the masses in contemporary society have made propaganda possible. In fact, propaganda can act only where man's psychology is influenced by the crowd or mass to which he belongs. Besides, as we have already pointed out, the means of disseminating propaganda depend on the existence of the masses. In the United States, these means are called the mass media of communications, with good reason. Without the mass to receive propaganda and carry it along, propaganda is impossible. We must also consider the importance of public opinion in this connection. Public opinion as we presently think of it also needs a mass society. In fact, in the presence of a stimulus or an act, there must be exchanges of opinion, actions, and interactions, which are the first steps in the formation of public opinion. There must also be an awareness of existing opinions, of private opinions, or implicit public opinions. Finally, there must be a reappraisal of values and attitudes. Only then is there really a crystallized public opinion. It is obvious that in order for this entire process to take place, a very close relationship among a great number of people is necessary. The kind of public opinion we mean, the kind used by propaganda and necessary for it, cannot exist in a community of 50 or 100 persons, isolated from the outside world, whether it be a monastery or a village of the 15th century, 
or in a society of very low population density in which a man has only very distant contacts with other men. Meeting once a month at the marketplace, for instance, does not permit the wide dissemination of personal views needed to form public opinion. Thus, for propaganda to be effective psychologically and sociologically, a combination of demographic phenomena is required. The first is population density, with the high frequency of diversified human contacts, exchanges of opinions and experiences, and with primary importance placed on the feeling of togetherness. The second is urban concentration, which, resulting from the fusion between mass and crowd, gives the mass its psychological and sociological character. Only then can propaganda utilize crowd effects. Only then can it profit from the psychological modifications that collective life produces in the individual and without which practically none of the propaganda would take. Much more, the instruments of propaganda find their principal source of support in the urban concentration. Buying a newspaper or a radio set or listening to a broadcast is a social act that presumes a mass structure of society, a total subordination to certain imperatives felt only when one is plunged into a mass in which each person places value on the accomplishment of this social act. Even more, to go to the movies or a political meeting presumes a physical proximity and therefore the existence of concentrated masses. In fact, a political organizer will not bother to hold his meeting if he knows he can get together only 10 or 15 people, and individuals will not come readily from a great distance, because regular attendance is essential for attaining propaganda effects through meetings or films, the mass is indispensable. The majority effect, so essential as a means of propaganda, can be felt only in a mass society. For example, the argument that all Frenchmen want peace in Algeria or, on the other hand, all Frenchmen want to hold on to Algeria, is valid only if all Frenchmen represents an immediate and massive reality. Thus, the mass society was a primary condition for the emergence of propaganda. Once formed, it evoked the power and functions of propaganda. Although we shall not go into the matter of individual psychology, we must remember in Stutzel's excellent words that the conditions of life in mass societies tend to multiply individual frustrations. They produce abstract, fragmentary relations between people, totally devoid of intimacy. One can show how the feeling of insecurity or anxiety develops, trace the contradictions of our environment, the conflicts between socially accepted competition and the preaching of fraternal love, between the constant stimulation of our needs through advertising and our limited finances, between our legal rights and the shackles of reality. Propaganda responds psychologically to this situation. The fact that propaganda addresses itself to the individual but acts on the mass explains, for example, the unity between the types of propaganda that are apparently diverse, such as propaganda based on the prestige of the leader, of the hero, or even of the expert, and propaganda based on the prestige of the majority. Of course, in the exercise of propaganda, both types have specific functions. But it is important to emphasize here that these two types are not very different from each other. The leader or expert who enjoys authority and prestige among the mass is the man who best speaks for that mass. The ordinary man must see himself reflected in his leader. The leader must be a sublimation of the ordinary man. He must not seem to be of a different quality. The ordinary man must not feel that the leader transcends him. This quality of the average man in the hero, actor, dictator, sports champion, has been clearly demonstrated in the history of the past thirty years. It is what E. Morin emphasizes in his study of the deification of film stars. When a man follows the leader, he actually follows the mass, the majority group that the leader so perfectly represents. The leader loses all power when he is separated from his group. No propaganda can emanate from a solitary leader. Moses is dead on the propaganda level. All we have left is a Johnson or de Gaulle, stripped of individual characteristics and clad in the aura of the majority. 
Some may raise objections to this analysis, which sees a fundamental requirement for the development of propaganda in the creation of an individualist society and a mass society. Because only in that combination can the material means and dictatorial will of the state take shape. The first objection is based on the emergence in our society of new local organic groups. For example, political parties and labor unions, which seem to be contrary to the existence of the individualist structure and the mass structure. The answer to this is, first, that such groups are still far from having the solidity, the resistance, the structuring of old organic groups. They have not had time to consolidate themselves. One has only to look at their fragility, their fluctuations, their changes. They are not really groups of resistance against mass influence, though, like a party that exchanges a democratic for a monolithic form, they try to be by taking on authoritarian structures. Second, such new groups cannot be real obstacles to total propaganda. They can resist one particular propaganda, but not the general phenomenon of propaganda. For the development of the groups takes place simultaneously with development of propaganda. These groups develop inside a society propagandized to the extreme. They are themselves loci of propaganda. They are instruments of propaganda and are integrated into its techniques. We are no longer in a sociological situation comparable to that of traditional societies in which there was barely any mass propaganda and almost nothing other than local psychological influences. And when propaganda did enter into such societies, it had to fight existing local groups and try to influence and modify them, and these organic groups resisted. At present we are witnessing the emergence of organic groups in which individuals tend to be integrated. These groups have certain traits of the old organic groups, but their collective life, their intellectual, emotional, and spiritual life, is determined by propaganda, and they can no longer maintain themselves without it. They become organic groups in the mass society only if they subject themselves to and serve as agents of propaganda. Our society has been completely transformed. When we left the purely individualist stage, which permitted propaganda to develop, we arrived at a society in which primary group structures could still exist, but in which total propaganda was established, and the group no longer could be separated from such propaganda. It is curious to see how the few remaining organic groups, such as the family and the church, try at all costs to live by propaganda. Families are protected by family associations. Churches try to take over the methods of psychological influence. They are now the very negation of the old organic groups. And what is more, the new primary groups, such as political parties or unions, are important relay stations in the flow of total propaganda. They are mobilized and used as instruments and thus offer no fulcrum for individual resistance. On the contrary, through them, the entrapped individual is made ready for propaganda. Another objection comes to mind immediately. Propaganda has developed in societies that were neither individualist nor mass. The Russian society of 1917, present-day China, Indochina, the Arab world. But the point here is precisely that these societies could not and cannot be captured, manipulated, and mobilized by propaganda, except when their traditional structures disintegrate and a new society is developed which is both individualistic and massive. Where this fails to happen, propaganda remains ineffective. Therefore, if the new society does not constitute itself spontaneously, it is sometimes formed by force by authoritarian states, which only then can utilize propaganda. In the Soviet Union, the Caucasus and Azerbaijan were the nursery of Agitprop in 1917 because the cosmopolitanism of the region, the great currents of population displacement, Russian and Muslim, the uprootings, the vigor of a nationalist myth, tended to shape mass society. In Soviet Russia, propaganda has progressed exactly in line with the destruction of the old organic groups and the creation of mass society. Footnote. We know, too, that the establishment of the Viet Minh organization in Indochina permitted the structuring of a complete administrative society 
imposing itself on traditional groups. The Lien Viet, with its independent and centralized hierarchy, artificially provoked a new splitting of the traditional groups of inhabitants, upsetting families, villages, and neighborhoods, and exploding the old forms in order to integrate individuals into new groups. A person is classified according to his age, sex, and occupation. The family group is thus destroyed. Citizens do not belong to the same groups as their parents. Each group thus created is an approximately homogeneous block of members with the same needs, the same tastes, the same functions. Propaganda can then easily develop and capture individuals forced into these artificial groups. There can be sessions of directed discussion. The themes of self-criticism, youth can engage in sincere and easy self-criticism when not under parental control. French propaganda in Indochina failed, partly because it respected traditional society and its structured small groups. We also find this true in communist China, which attained in three years through violence what the Soviet Union took 20 years to attain and what developed naturally in the West in 150 years. The establishment of sociological conditions specific to an environment in which propaganda can be completely effective. It seems that the Chinese government understood perfectly the need to structure a new society. When the French wondered whether the methods of propaganda which had succeeded in Indochina should be applied in Algeria, they faced problems of the same sociological order. Footnote The attempt of the FLN, Force de Libération Nationale, to imitate the North Vietnamese, coupled with the establishment of a million Arabs in relocation camps by the French authorities, brought about, each in its turn, each by its particular methods, the same sociological transformation. These operations are conducted simultaneously, and in both cases, the desire to create a fertile ground for propaganda is not overlooked. Far from it. We find in the ultra-rapid, forced, and systematic transformation of these societies a dramatic confirmation of our analysis showing that a certain massification of society is required for propaganda to be able to develop. Opinion We must add to all this the problem of public opinion. We have already said that, on the one hand, propaganda is no longer primarily a matter of opinion, and that, on the other, the existence of a public opinion is connected with the appearance of a mass society. Footnote The conditions under which a group changes its opinion have often been analyzed. We know the problems of ambiguity, opinions based on prejudices, appearances that suddenly collapse, majority effects, and so on. Many limited studies on such local conditions have been made, but their findings have little value by themselves when considered outside the setting of mass society. We would like to stress here that opinion formed in primary groups or small groups has other characteristics than that which exists in large societies. In small groups, with direct contacts between individuals, interpersonal relations are the dominant relations, and the formation of public opinion depends on those direct contacts. Opinion in these is determined by what has properly been called the preponderant opinion, which imposes itself automatically on the group as a whole. Interpersonal relations lead to a dominant opinion because, first of all, leadership in such groups is recognized spontaneously. Also, group opinion is called on to regulate concrete situations or common experiences that bring into play the common interests of all the individuals in the group. Moreover, the social level of individuals in such groups is generally the same. Thus, such primary groups are spontaneously democratic. In fact, opinion is formed directly, for the individuals are directly in contact with the events that demand their participation. Once formed, this opinion is expressed directly and known to everybody. The leaders of the group know what the group opinion is and take it into consideration. They have contributed amply to its formation. But these groups are by no means liberal. Minorities within them appear as foreign bodies. For in a relationship such as this, opposition weakens intergroup communication. Sanctions are generally diffuse but energetic. There is no equality. 
The members accept leadership and, of course, small groups also recognize instituted authorities, the father of the family, for example. Dominant personalities play a considerable role, and often group opinion will be formed by individuals who are known to all the members of the group and whose authority is accepted. Secondary or large societies obviously have a totally different character. In these societies, generally the only ones considered by public opinion studies, individuals do not know and have no direct contact with each other. Moreover, they do not share the direct experience of problems on which they must make decisions. Interpersonal relations do not exist, only overall relations, those of the individual with the group as a whole. To some extent, the opinion that prevails in such groups will be a majority opinion, which is not to say that public opinion is that of the majority. In such groups, the formation of public opinion is very complex, and a host of theories exist on the subject. In any event, public opinion has three characteristics. It can shape itself only in a society in which institutionalized channels of information give the people the facts on which they will take a position. Thus, some steps intervene between fact and opinion. The information reaching the people is only indirect, but without it there would be no opinion at all. Moreover, to the extent that we are dealing with information disseminated by intermediaries, Opinion does not form itself by simple personal contact, and nowadays opinion depends to a large extent on such intermediate channels of information. A second characteristic of public opinion is that it cannot express itself directly, but only through channels. A constituted public opinion is as yet nothing and does not express itself spontaneously. It will express itself in elections, when electoral opinion and public opinion coincide, through political parties, associations in the newspapers, referenda, and so on. But all that is not enough. The third characteristic of public opinion is that this opinion is formed by a very large number of people who cannot possibly experience the same fact in the same fashion, who judge it by different standards speak a different language, and share neither the same culture nor the same social position. Normally, everything separates them. They really should not be able to form a public opinion, and yet they do. This is possible only when all these people are not really apprised of the facts, but only of abstract symbols that give the facts a shape in which they can serve as a base for public opinion. Public opinion forms itself around attitudes and theoretical problems not clearly related to the actual situation. And the symbols most effective in the formation of public opinion are those most remote from reality. Therefore, public opinion always rests on problems that do not correspond to reality. We have pointed out several times before that original small groups are obstacles to propaganda. The opinion structure of these primary groups is opposed to action outside the group. Of course, we do not call the group leaders' actions propaganda, but this does not mean that the group members are free from propaganda. On the contrary, we have already noted that they are not. Because direct experience, immediate grasp of facts and problems, and personal acquaintance between individuals exist in the small group, propaganda cannot function in such a group. Only in second-hand opinion can propaganda play its role. In fact, it cannot fail to play it there. In order for public opinion to form itself in large groups, channels of information and manipulation of symbols must be available. Where public opinion exists, propaganda crystallizes that opinion from the pre-conscious individual state to the conscious public state. Propaganda can function only in secondary groups in which secondary opinion can form itself but we must remember that we cannot simply juxtapose those two types of groups, because a whole society is also composed of multiple groups. A conflict between primary and secondary opinions will arise. One will dominate the other. Propaganda can exist only in societies in which second-hand opinion definitely dominates primary opinion, and the latter is reduced and driven into a minority position. Then, when the individual finds himself between the two conflicting types of opinion, he will normally grasp the general public opinion. This corresponds to what we have said about the mass society.
the mass media of communication. Finally, one more condition is basic for propaganda. We have just stated again that an opinion cannot form itself in entire societies unless mass media of communication exist. This much is evident. Without the mass media, there can be no modern propaganda. But we must point to a dual factor necessary if the mass media are really to become instruments of propaganda. For they are not such instruments automatically or under just any conditions. They must be subject to centralized control on the one hand and well diversified with regard to their products on the other. Where film production, the press, and radio transmission are not centrally controlled, no propaganda is possible. As long as a large number of independent news agencies, newsreel producers, and diverse local papers function, no conscious and direct propaganda is possible. This is not because the reader or viewer has real freedom of choice, which he has not, as we shall see later but because none of the media has enough power to hold the individual constantly and through all channels. Local influences are sufficiently strong to neutralize the great national press, to give just one example. To make the organization of propaganda possible, the media must be concentrated, the number of news agencies reduced, the press brought under single control, and radio and film monopolies established. The effect will be still greater if the various media are concentrated in the same hands. When a newspaper trust also extends its control over films and radio, propaganda can be directed at the masses and the individual can be caught in the wide net of media. Only through concentration in a few hands of a large number of media can one attain a true orchestration, a continuity, and an application of scientific methods of influencing individuals. A state monopoly or a private monopoly is equally effective. Such a situation is in the making in the United States, France, and Germany. The fact is well known. The number of newspapers decreases while the number of readers increases. Production costs constantly increase and necessitate greater concentration. All statistics converge on that. This concentration itself keeps accelerating, thus making the situation increasingly favorable to propaganda. Of course, one must not conclude from this that the concentration of mass media inevitably produces propaganda. Such concentration is merely a prerequisite for it. But that the media be concentrated is not enough. It is also necessary that the individual will listen to them. This seems to be a truism. Why produce a propaganda paper if nobody will buy it? Buying a paper, going to the movies, are unimportant acts in an individual's life. He does them easily. But reception must be equally assured by radio or TV. Here we encounter the problem of distributing sets. Here the propagandi must take a very positive step. He must buy a set. Only where enough sets are installed can propaganda be effective. Obviously, where not enough TV sets are in use, it makes no sense to conduct propaganda via TV. This happened in 1950 to the TV propaganda of the Voice of America beamed to some communist countries. But the act of acquiring a set brings up a point that we will discuss at considerable length, the complicity of the propagandi. If he is a propagandi, it is because he wants to be, for he is ready to buy a paper go to the movies, pay for a radio or TV set. Of course he does not buy these in order to be propagandized. His motivations are more complex. But in doing these things, he must know that he opens the door to propaganda, that he subjects himself to it. Where he is conscious of this, the attraction of owning a radio is so much greater than the fear of propaganda that he voluntarily agrees to receive propaganda. This is even more true where transmission is by collective receiving sets, as in communist countries. The hearers gather even though they know what they hear is necessarily propaganda, but they cannot escape the attraction of the radio or the hypnotism of TV. The fact is even more striking with regard to the newspapers, for the reader buys a paper he likes, a paper in which he finds his own ideas and opinions well reflected. This is the only paper he wants so that one can say he really wants to be propagandized. 
He wants to submit to this influence and actually exercises his choice in the direction of the propaganda he wishes to receive. If by chance he finds in his newspaper an article he dislikes, or an opinion that deviates a little from his own, he cancels his subscription. He cannot stand anything that does not run on his rails. This is the very mentality of the propagandi, as we shall see. Let no one say, this reader does not submit to propaganda. First he has such and such ideas and opinions, and then he buys the paper that corresponds to them. Such an argument is simplistic, removed from reality, and based on liberal idealism. In reality, propaganda is at work here, for what is involved is a progression from vague, diffuse opinion on the part of the reader to rigorous, exciting, active expression of that opinion. A feeling or an impression is transformed into a motive for action. Confused thoughts are crystallized. Myths and the reader's conditioned reflexes are reinforced if he reads that paper. All this is characteristic of propaganda. The reader is really subject to propaganda, even though it be propaganda of his choice. Why always fall into the error of seeing in propaganda nothing but a device to change opinion? Propaganda is also a means of reinforcing opinions, of transforming them into action. The reader himself offers his throat to the knife of the propaganda he chooses. We have said that no propaganda can exist unless a mass can be reached and set into motion. Yet the peculiar and remarkable fact is that the mass media really create their own public. The propagandist need no longer beat the drum and lead the parade in order to establish a following. This happens all by itself, through the effects of the communication media. They have their own power of attraction and act on individuals in such a fashion as to transform them into a collective, a public, a mass. The buying of a TV set, though an individual act, inserts the individual into the psychological and behavioral structure of the mass. He obeys the collective motivations when he buys it, and through his act opens the door to propaganda. Where this dual process of concentration of the sources of propaganda and wide diffusion of its recipients does not take place, no modern propaganda can function in a society. 2. Objective Conditions of Total Propaganda The Need of an Average Standard of Living just as there are societies not susceptible to propaganda, there are individuals not susceptible to it. We have just seen, for example, that it takes an individual to read the newspaper and to buy a radio or TV set, an individual with a certain standard of living. Modern integration propaganda cannot affect individuals who live on the fringes of our civilization or who have too low a living standard. In capitalist countries, the very poor who have no radio or TV and rarely go to the movies cannot be reached by propaganda. Communist countries meet this problem with community receivers and free movies. Thus, even the poorest can be reached by propaganda. But other obstacles intervene. The really poor cannot be subjected to integration propaganda because the immediate concerns of daily life absorb all their capacities and efforts. To be sure, the poor can be pushed into rebellion, into an explosion of violence. They can be subjected to agitation propaganda and excited to the point of theft and murder. But they cannot be trained by propaganda, kept in hand, channeled, and oriented. More advanced propaganda can influence only a man who is not completely haunted by poverty, a man who can view things from a certain distance and be reasonably unconcerned about his daily bread, and who therefore can take an interest in more general matters and mobilize his actions for purposes other than merely earning a living. It is well known that in Western countries, propaganda is particularly effective in the upper segment of the working class and in the middle classes. It faces much greater problems with the proletariat or the peasantry. We shall come back to that. One must also keep in mind that propaganda must concentrate on the densest mass, it must be organized for the enormous mass of individuals. This great majority is not found among the very rich or the very poor. 
Propaganda, therefore, is made for those who have attained an average standard of living. In Western countries, propaganda addresses itself to the large average mass, which alone represents a real force. But one might say, in the very poor countries, such as India or the Arab nations, propaganda is addressed to another mass, to the very poor, the fellaheen. Well, the point is that these poor react only very little and very slowly to any propaganda that is not pure agitation propaganda. The students and merchants react, the poor do not. This explains the weakness of propaganda in India and Egypt. For propaganda to be effective, the propagandee must have a certain store of ideas and a number of conditioned reflexes. These are acquired only with a little affluence, some education, and peace of mind springing from relative security. Conversely, all propagandists come from the upper middle class, whether Soviet, Nazi, Japanese, or American propagandists. The wealthy and very cultured class provides no propagandists because it is remote from the people and does not understand them well enough to influence them. The lower class does not furnish any because its members rarely have the means of educating themselves, even in the USSR. More important, they cannot stand back and look at their class with the perspective needed to devise symbols for it. Thus, studies show that most propagandists are recruited from the middle class. The range of propaganda influence is larger and encompasses the lower middle class and the upper working class as well. But by raising people's living standard, one does not immunize them against propaganda. On the contrary. Of course, if everybody were to find himself at the upper middle class level, present day propaganda might have less chance of success. But in view of the fact that the ascent to that level is gradual, the rising living standard, in the West as well as in the East and in Africa, makes the coming generations much more susceptible to propaganda. The latter establishes its influence while working conditions, food and housing improve, and while at the same time a certain standardization of men, their transformation into what is regarded as normal, typical people sets in. Footnote. This is what Lenin said when he called for a total cultural transformation, with changes in medicine, in the relations between men and women, in the use of alcohol, and so on. This transformation of the entire way of life was linked to agitprop. But whereas the emergence of such a normal type used to be automatic and spontaneous, it now becomes more and more a systematic creation, conscious, planned, and intended. The technical aspects of men's work, a clear concept of social relations and national goals, the establishment of a mode of common life, all this leads to the creation of a type of normal man and conveniently leads all men toward that norm via a multitude of paths. That is why adjustment has become one of the key words of all psychological influence. Whether it is a question of adaptation to working conditions, to consumption or to milieu, a clear and conscious intent to integrate people into the normal pattern prevails everywhere. This is the summit of propaganda action. For example, there is not much difference between Mao's theory of the mold and McCarthyism. In both cases, the aim is normalcy, in conformance with a certain way of life. For Mao, normalcy is a sort of ideal man, the prototype of the communist, who must be shaped, and this can be done only by pressing the individual into a mold in which he will assume the desired shape. As this cannot be done overnight, the individual must be pressed again and again into the mold, and Mao says that the individual himself is fully aware that he must submit to the operation. Mao adds that this normalcy does not take shape except at a certain level of consciousness, that is, at a certain standard of living. Footnote. Discussed later in Appendix 2. We are face to face here with the most total concept of propaganda. On the other side, and with other formulas, there is McCarthyism. McCarthyism is no accident. It expresses, and at the same time exploits, a deep current in American opinion against all that is un American. It deals less with opinions than with a way of life. 
To find that belonging to a milieu, a group, or a family in which there are communists is regarded as reprehensible in the United States is surprising, because what matters here is not ideas, but a different way of life. This leads to the association of alcoholism and homosexuality with communism in the literature on un-American activities, and to the rules promulgated in 1952, which established the poor security risk and led to the screening of 7,000 functionaries. No reason for this identification existed other than that the communist is abnormal because he fails to accept the normal, that is, the American, way of life. These abnormal persons must, of course, be treated as such, relieved of all responsibility, and re-educated. Thus, American prisoners in the Korean War who appeared to have been contaminated by communism were hospitalized after their release and given psychiatric and medical treatment in a hospital at Valley Forge. In current American opinion, all efforts to root out what fails to correspond to the American way of life and endangers it are necessarily regarded as good works. To sum up, the creation of normalcy in our society can take one of two shapes. It can be the result of scientific, psychosociological analysis based on statistics, that is, the American type of normalcy. It can also be ideological and doctrinaire, that is, the communist type. But the results are identical. Such normalcy necessarily gives rise to propaganda that can reduce the individual to the pattern most useful to society. An Average Culture In addition to a certain living standard, another condition must be met. If man is to be successfully propagandized, he needs at least a minimum of culture. Propaganda cannot succeed where people have no trace of Western culture. We are not speaking here of intelligence. Some primitive tribes are surely intelligent, but have an intelligence foreign to our concepts and customs. A base is needed. For example, education. A man who cannot read will escape most propaganda, as will a man who is not interested in reading. People used to think that learning to read evidenced human progress. They still celebrate the decline of illiteracy as a great victory. They condemn countries with a large proportion of illiterates. They think that reading is a road to freedom. All this is debatable. For the important thing is not to be able to read, but to understand what one reads, to reflect on and judge what one reads. Outside of that, reading has no meaning, and even destroys certain automatic qualities of memory and observation. But to talk about critical faculties and discernment is to talk about something far above primary education and to consider a very small minority. The vast majority of people, perhaps 90% know how to read, but do not exercise their intelligence beyond this. They attribute authority and eminent value to the printed word, or, conversely, reject it altogether. As these people do not possess enough knowledge to reflect and discern, they believe, or disbelieve, in toto what they read. And as such people, moreover, will select the easiest, not the hardest, reading matter, they are precisely on the level at which the printed word can seize and convince them without opposition. They are perfectly adapted to propaganda. Let us not say, if one gave them good things to read, if these people received a better education, such an argument has no validity because things just are not that way. Let us not say either, this is only the first stage. Soon their education will be better. One must begin somewhere. First of all, it takes a very long time to pass from the first to the second stage. In France, the first stage was reached half a century ago and we are still very far from attaining the second. There is more, unfortunately. This first stage has placed man at the disposal of propaganda. Before he can pass to the second stage, he will find himself in a universe of propaganda. He will be already formed, adapted, integrated. This is why the development of culture in the USSR can take place without danger. One can reach a higher level of culture without ceasing to be a propagandee 
as long as one was a propagandee before acquiring critical faculties, and as long as that culture itself is integrated into a universe of propaganda. Actually, the most obvious result of primary education in the 19th and 20th centuries was to make the individual susceptible to super-propaganda. Footnote. Because he considered the newspaper the principal instrument of propaganda, Lenin insisted on the necessity of teaching reading. It was even more the catchword of the new economic policy. The school became the place to prepare students to receive propaganda. There is no chance of raising the intellectual level of Western populations sufficiently and rapidly enough to compensate for the progress of propaganda. Propaganda techniques have advanced so much faster than the reasoning capacity of the average man that to close this gap and shape this man intellectually outside the framework of propaganda is almost impossible. In fact, what happens, and what we see all around us, is the claim that propaganda itself is our culture and what the masses ought to learn. Only in and through propaganda have the masses access to political economy politics, art, or literature. Primary education makes it possible to enter the realm of propaganda in which people then receive their intellectual and cultural environment. The uncultured man cannot be reached by propaganda. Experience and research done by the Germans between 1933 and 1938 showed that in remote areas where people hardly knew how to read, propaganda had no effect. The same holds true for the enormous effort in the communist world to teach people how to read. In Korea, the local script was terribly difficult and complicated, so in North Korea, the communists created an entirely new alphabet and a simple script in order to teach all people how to read. In China, Mao simplified the script in his battle with illiteracy, and in some places in China, new alphabets are being created. This would have no particular significance except that the texts used to teach the adult students how to read, and which are the only texts to which they have access, are exclusively propaganda texts. They are political tracts, poems to the glory of the communist regime, extracts of classical Marxism. Among the Tibetans, the Mongols, the Uyghurs, the Manchus, the only texts in the new script are Mao's works. Thus we see here a wonderful shaping tool. The illiterates are taught to read only the new script. Nothing is published in that script except propaganda texts. Therefore, the illiterates cannot possibly read, or know, anything else. Also, one of the most effective propaganda methods in Asia was to establish teachers to teach reading and indoctrinate people at the same time. The prestige of the intellectual, marked with God's finger, allowed political assertions to appear as truth, while the prestige of the printed word one learned to decipher confirmed the validity of what the teachers said. These facts leave no doubt that the development of primary education is a fundamental condition for the organization of propaganda, even though such a conclusion may run counter to many prejudices, best expressed by Paul Rivet's pointed but completely unrealistic words a person who cannot read a newspaper is not free. The need of a certain cultural level to make people susceptible to propaganda is best understood if one looks at one of propaganda's most important devices, the manipulation of symbols. Footnote. We also must consider the fact that in a society in which propaganda, whether direct or indirect, conscious or unconscious, absorbs all the means of communication or education, as in practically all societies in 1960, propaganda forms culture and, in a certain sense, is culture. When film and novel, newspaper and television are instruments either of political propaganda in the restricted sense or in that of human relations, social propaganda, culture is perfectly integrated into propaganda. As a consequence, the more cultivated a man is, the more he is propagandized. Here one can also see the idealist illusion of those who hope that the mass media of communication will create a mass culture. This culture, 
is merely a way of destroying a personality. The more an individual participates in the society in which he lives, the more he will cling to stereotyped symbols expressing collective notions about the past and the future of his group. The more stereotypes in a culture, the easier it is to form public opinion, and the more an individual participates in that culture, the more susceptible he becomes to the manipulation of these symbols. The number of propaganda campaigns in the West which have first taken hold in cultured settings is remarkable. This is not only true for doctrinaire propaganda, which is based on exact facts and acts on the level of the most highly developed people who have a sense of values and know a good deal about political realities, such as, for example, the propaganda on the injustice of capitalism, on economic crises, or on colonialism. It is only normal that the most educated people, intellectuals, are the first to be reached by such propaganda. But this is also true for the crudest kind of propaganda. For example, the campaign on peace and the campaign on bacteriological warfare were first successful in educated milieus. In France, the intellectuals went along most readily with the bacteriological warfare propaganda. All this runs counter to pat notions that only the public swallows propaganda. Naturally, the educated man does not believe in propaganda. He shrugs and is convinced that propaganda has no effect on him. This is, in fact, one of his great weaknesses, and propagandists are well aware that in order to reach someone, one must first convince him that propaganda is ineffectual and not very clever. Because he is convinced of his own superiority, the intellectual is much more vulnerable than anybody else to this maneuver. Even though basically a high intelligence, a broad culture, a constant exercise of the critical faculties and full and objective information are still the best weapons against propaganda. This danger has been recognized in the USSR, where so much importance is attached to political indoctrination and education, and has frequently been expressed there. Too much discussion, too much depth of doctrine, risk creating divergent currents and permitting the intellectual to escape social control. Finally, propaganda can have an effect on the masses who lack any culture. Examples, the Leninist propaganda directed at the Russian peasantry and the Maoist propaganda directed at the Chinese peasantry. But these propaganda methods are basically the creation of conditioned reflexes on the one hand and the slow creation of the necessary cultural base on the other. To illustrate the creation of the conditioned reflex, after several months of propaganda in Hunan in 1928, children at play would call their opponents imperialists. As noted earlier, poor and uncultured populations are appropriate objects of propaganda of agitation and subversion. The more miserable and ignorant a person is, the more easily will he be plunged into a rebel movement. But to go beyond this, to do a more profound propaganda job on him, one must educate him. This corresponds to the need for political education. Conversely, an individual of the middle class, of good general culture, will be less susceptible to agitation propaganda, but ideal prey of integration propaganda. This has also been observed by Lipset, who holds that ignorance in politics and economics makes the conflicts in these spheres less clear and therefore less intense to the observer, and for this reason the ignorant are less susceptible to propaganda on such questions. Information Of course, basic education permits the dissemination not only of propaganda, but of information in general. But here we meet with a new condition for propaganda. Contrary to the simplistic differentiation between propaganda and information, we have demonstrated a close relationship between the two. In reality, to distinguish exactly between propaganda and information is impossible. Besides, information is an essential element of propaganda. For propaganda to succeed, it must have reference to political or economic reality. Doctrinal or historical argument is only incidentally effective in propaganda. It has power only in connection with the interpretation of events. 
It has an effect only when opinion is already aroused, troubled, or oriented in a certain direction by a political or economic event. It grafts itself onto an already existing psychological reality. Such psychological reactions are generally of brief duration and must be systematically sustained and renewed. To the extent that they will be prolonged and renewed, they will create an informed opinion. This informed opinion is indispensable for propaganda. For we have no informed opinion with regard to political or economic affairs, propaganda cannot exist. For this reason, in most of the older countries, propaganda was localized and restricted to those groups which had direct contact with political life. It was not designed for the masses indifferent to such questions, indifferent because they were uninformed. The masses cannot be interested in political and economic questions or in the great ideological debates based on them until mass media of communication disseminate information to the public. We know that the most difficult to reach are the peasants, for a variety of reasons already pointed out. But another essential reason is that they are uninformed. Studies of rural milieus have shown that propaganda begins to bite among peasants at the exact moment when information is promulgated there, when facts become known and attention to certain questions is aroused. Obviously, if I do not know that war is being waged in Korea, or that North Korea and China are communist, or that the United States occupies South Korea and that it represents the UN in Korea, any communist propaganda on alleged American biological warfare means nothing to me. Propaganda means precisely nothing without preliminary information. Therefore, propaganda to politically ignorant groups can be made only if preceded by extensive, profound, and serious information work. Footnote. This is why, in the Soviet Union, one does not distinguish between the tasks of information and propaganda. The agitator is, above all, a dispenser of information. Radio and the press are, above all, media of propaganda. Mr. Polganov, director of the TASS agency, said in 1956, Information should be didactic and educative. Not to mention the fact that pure information is an excellent medium of propaganda. Bald information without commentary can lead to acceptance of a whole propaganda line. The broader and more objective the information, the more effective subsequent propaganda will be. Once again, propaganda does not base itself on errors but on exact facts. It even seems that the more informed public or private opinion is, notice I say more, not better, the more susceptible it is to propaganda. The greater a person's knowledge of political and economic facts, the more sensitive and vulnerable is his judgment. Intellectuals are most easily reached by propaganda, particularly if it employs ambiguity. The reader of a number of newspapers expressing diverse attitudes just because he is better informed, is more subjected than anyone else to a propaganda that he cannot perceive, even though he claims to retain free choice in the mastery of all this information. Actually, he is being conditioned to absorb all the propaganda that coordinates and explains the facts he believes himself to be mastering. Thus, information not only provides the basis for propaganda, but gives propaganda the means to operate. For information actually generates the problems that propaganda exploits and for which it pretends to offer solutions. In fact, no propaganda can work until the moment when a set of facts has become a problem in the eyes of those who constitute public opinion. At the moment such problems begin to confront public opinion, propaganda on the part of a government, a party, or a man can begin to develop fully by magnifying that problem on the one hand and promising solutions for it on the other. But propaganda cannot easily create a political or economic problem out of nothing. There must be some reason in reality. The problem need not actually exist, but there must be a reason why it might exist. For example, if the dispensation of daily information leads a man into the labyrinth of economic realities, he will find it difficult to understand these complicated and various facts and he will therefore conclude that some problems of an economic nature exist. 
But this takes on an entirely different and much more pronounced aspect when this opinion is in any way connected with personal experience. If he were ignorant of what went on in the nation and in the world, and if his only sources of information were equally uninformed neighbors, in that case propaganda would be impossible, even if that man were actually to suffer personal difficulties as a result of certain political or economic situations. Propaganda had no effect on the populations of the 19th century, even when a village was plundered by an army, because in the face of personal experiences, people respond spontaneously or by group reflexes, but in any event only to a local and limited situation. They would find it very difficult to generalize the situation, to look upon it as a generally valid phenomenon, and to build a specific response to such a generalization that would demand a considerable amount of voluntary intellectual labor. Thus propaganda becomes possible only when people develop a consciousness of general problems and specific responses to them. The formation of such responses is precisely what the promulgation of information creates in individuals who have only limited personal contact with social reality. Through information, the individual is placed in a context and learns to understand the reality of his own situation with respect to society as a whole. This will then entice him to social and political action. Take, for example, the problem of the standard of living. The worker who knows nothing about prices and salaries, except from personal experience, or those of his neighbors, may, in the event of sharp discontent, experience feelings of rebellion, and may eventually rebel against his immediate superiors. And it is well known that such rebellion leads nowhere. That was the great discovery of the 19th century. But information will teach this worker that he shares his fate with millions of others, and that among them there can be a community of interest and action. Information allows him also to put his situation into the general economic context and to understand the general situation of management. Finally, information will teach him to evaluate his personal situation. This is what led to the class consciousness of the 19th century workers, a process which, as the socialists rightly maintain, was much more one of information than one of propaganda. At that very moment, when information is absorbed, the spirit of rebellion transforms itself into the spirit of revolution. As a result of information, individuals come to feel that their own personal problems are really invested with the dignity of a general social problem. From the moment when that sort of information is acquired, propaganda finds the doors open. The elementary form of propaganda in which a few leaders address a few rebels is then replaced by the complex modern propaganda based on mass movements, on knowledge of the great politico-economic realities, and on involvement in certain broad currents fed everywhere by identical information. Footnote. Moreover, the newer the problem is raised, the more vulnerable men will be. The role of information is to introduce individuals to knowledge of new facts and problems. Specialists in opinion research are well aware that the individual is easier to influence by propaganda when he is in new situations, when he is not familiar with possible solutions, when he cannot relate to previous patterns, when, in brief, opinion is non-structured. The task of information is to put the individual in this situation of non-structured opinion and thus make him more susceptible to influence. Thus information prepares the ground for propaganda. To the extent that a large number of individuals receive the same information, their reactions will be similar. As a result, identical centers of interest will be produced and then become the great questions of our time made public by press and radio and group opinions will be formed which will establish contact with each other, one of the essential processes in the formation of public opinion. Moreover, this leads to the formation of common reflexes and common prejudices. Naturally, there are deviationists, individuals who do not share the same responses to the same information because they already hold other prejudices, because they are strong personalities, or simply because of habitual contrariness but their number is much smaller than is generally believed. 
they are unimportant, and the polarization of attention on certain questions and on certain aspects of these questions, singled out by information, rapidly creates what has been called mass psychology, one of the indispensable conditions for the existence of propaganda. The Ideologies Finally, the last condition for the development of propaganda is the prevalence of strong myths and ideologies in a society. At this point, a few words are needed on the term ideology. To begin with, we subscribe to Raymond Aron's statement that an ideology is any set of ideas accepted by individuals or peoples without attention to their origin or value. But one must perhaps add with Q. Wright, one, an element of valuation, cherished ideas, two, an element of actuality, ideas related to the present, and three, an element of belief, believed rather than proved ideas. Ideology differs from myth in three important respects. First, the myth is embedded much more deeply in the soul, sinks its roots farther down, is more permanent and provides man with a fundamental image of his condition and the world at large. Second, the myth is much less doctrinaire, an ideology, which is not a doctrine because it is believed and not proved, is first of all a set of ideas, which, even when they are irrational, are still ideas. The myth is more intellectually diffuse. It is part emotionalism, part effective response, part a sacred feeling, and more important. Third, the myth has stronger powers of activation, whereas ideology is more passive. One can believe in an ideology and yet remain on the sidelines. The myth does not leave man passive. It drives him to action. What myth and ideology have in common, however, is that they are collective phenomena, and their persuasive force springs from the power of collective participation. Thus one can distinguish. The fundamental myths of our society are the myths of work, progress, happiness. The fundamental ideologies are nationalism, democracy, socialism. Communism shares in both elements. It is an ideology in that it is a basic doctrine, and a myth in that it has an explanation for all questions and an image of a future world in which all contradictions will be resolved. Myths have existed in all societies, but there have not always been ideologies. The 19th century was a great breeding ground of ideology, and propaganda needed an ideological setting to develop. Ideology in the service of propaganda is very flexible and fluid. Propaganda in support of the French Revolution or of United States life in the 20s or of Soviet life in the 40s can all be traced back to the ideology of democracy. These three entirely different types and concepts of propaganda all refer to the same ideology. One must not think for this reason that ideology determines a given propaganda merely because it provides the themes and contents. Ideology serves propaganda as a peg, a pretext. Propaganda seizes what springs up spontaneously and gives it a new form, a structure, an effective channel and can eventually transform ideology into myth. We shall return later to the connection between ideology and propaganda. Chapter 3. The Necessity for Propaganda A common view of propaganda is that it is the work of a few evil men, seducers of the people, cheats and authoritarian rulers who want to dominate a population, that it is the handmaiden of more or less illegitimate powers. This view always thinks of propaganda as being made voluntarily. It assumes that a man decides to make propaganda, that a government establishes a propaganda ministry, and that things just develop from there on. According to this view, the public is just an object a passive crowd that one can manipulate, influence, and use. And this notion is held not only by those who think one can manipulate the crowds, but also by those who think propaganda is not very effective and can be resisted easily. 
In other words, this view distinguishes between an active factor, the propagandist, and a passive factor, the crowd, the mass, man. Footnote. According to this conception, propaganda is a sinister invention of the military caste, whereas actually it is the expression of modern society as a whole. Seen from that angle, it is easy to understand the moralist's hostility to propaganda. Man is the innocent victim pushed into evil ways by the propagandist. The propagandi is entirely without blame because he has been fooled and has fallen into a trap. The militant Nazi and communist are just poor victims who must not be fought, but must be psychologically liberated from that trap, readapted to freedom, and shown the truth. In any event, the propagandi is seen in the role of the poor devil who cannot help himself, who has no means of defense against the bird of prey who swoops down on him from the skies. A similar point of view can be found in studies on advertising, which regard the buyer as victim and prey. In all this, the propagandee is never charged with the slightest responsibility for a phenomenon regarded as originating entirely outside of himself. This view seems to me completely wrong. A simple fact should lead us at least to question it. Nowadays, propaganda pervades all aspects of public life. We know that the psychological factor, which includes encirclement, integration into a group, and participation in action, in addition to personal conviction, is decisive. To draw up plans for an organization, a system of work, political methods, and institutions is not enough. The individual must participate in all this from the bottom of his heart, with pleasure and deep satisfaction. If the common market is wanted, a unit must be set up to psychologically prepare the people for the common market. This is absolutely necessary, because the institutions mean nothing by themselves. NATO also needs propaganda for its members. Gasperi's proposal of 1956 to create a dem form that would correspond to the common form is extremely significant. Present political warfare is very inadequate. From the economic point of view, one may well say that the recession was much more a psychological than a technical or economic development. Footnote. As early as 1928, Edward Bernays stated, Propaganda is the modern instrument by which intelligent men can fight for productive ends and help to bring order out of chaos. In order to assure that reforms will have vigor and effectiveness, one must first convince the people that no recession has occurred and that they have nothing to fear. And this is not just Dr. Kuei's method of self-imploration, but active participation in an effective recovery. A specific example, agricultural reconstruction in France is, first of all, a psychological problem. Services of popularization are created which furnish not only technical consultants but primarily psychological agitators on the pattern of the famous county agents in the United States or the counselors in Scandinavia. Efforts at popularizing and at instilling convictions take place simultaneously. The USSR is still much more advanced in the direction of a full-fledged agricultural propaganda, with technically perfect propaganda campaigns at harvest time, hundreds of thousands of propaganda agents roaming through the villages, expostulating motherland and production, radio broadcasts and films, and daily publication of harvest results, as in a pennant race. Joining in this campaign are the local papers. The Komsomols, the Teamsters, the festivities, dances, folk songs, rewards, decorations, and citations. The Soviets employ the same methods in factory work and the formula that best explains the whole effort is full understanding on the part of the workers is the decisive factor in raising productivity. It is necessary to obtain the worker's allegiance to the cause of productivity. He must accept and search for innovations, like his work, support his organization, understand the function of labor. All this is attained by psychological manipulation by a propaganda conducted with precision over a considerable length of time. In armies, such techniques are of equal importance. The best example is the new German army. 
The German soldier must be convinced of the validity of what he defends, and patriotism is no longer territorial but ideological. This psychological approach is designed to give the soldiers a personal discipline, with a capacity for decision and choice. Military techniques are no longer sufficient. All this is pure propaganda, including the notion of the personal decision. For as soon as the individual has been indoctrinated with the truth, he will act as he is expected to act, from the spontaneity of his conscience. This was the principal aim of propaganda in Hitler's army, and the individual German soldier's capacity for personal initiative in 1940 was truly remarkable. One final example in a different field. In connection with the 1959 census in the USSR, a gigantic propaganda campaign was unleashed, because both the speed with which such a census can be taken and the accuracy of the results depend on the goodwill and truthfulness of the citizens. So in order to obtain speed and accuracy, opinion was mobilized. The entire press and all mass organizations sprang into action in order to envelop the citizens in propaganda, and propagandists roamed the country far and wide to explain to the people what was being planned, to alleviate their prejudices and suspicions with regard to the questions that they would be asked. These are all examples of entirely different applications of propaganda. But in order for propaganda to be so far-ranging, it must correspond to a need. The state has that need. Propaganda obviously is a necessary instrument for the state and the authorities. But while this fact may dispel the concept of the propagandist as simply an evildoer, it still leaves the idea of propaganda as an active power versus passive masses. And we insist that this idea, too, must be dispelled. For propaganda to succeed, it must correspond to a need for propaganda on the individual's part. One can lead a horse to water, but cannot make him drink. One cannot reach through propaganda those who do not need what it offers. The propagandee is by no means just an innocent victim. He provokes the psychological action of propaganda and not merely lends himself to it, but even derives satisfaction from it. With this previous implicit consent, without this need for propaganda experienced by practically every citizen of the technological age, propaganda could not spread. This is not just a wicked propagandist at work who sets up means to ensnare the innocent citizen. Rather, there is a citizen who craves propaganda from the bottom of his being, and a propagandist who responds to this craving. Propagandists would not exist without potential propagandees to begin with. To understand that propaganda is not just a deliberate and more or less arbitrary creation by some people in power is therefore essential. It is a strictly sociological phenomenon, in the sense that it has its roots and reasons in the need of the group that will sustain it. We are thus face to face with a dual need, the need on the part of regimes to make propaganda, and the need of the propagandee. These two conditions correspond to and complement each other in the development of propaganda. 1. The State's Necessity The Dilemma of the Modern State Propaganda is needed in the exercise of power for the simple reason that the masses have come to participate in political affairs. Let's not call this democracy. This is only one aspect of it. To begin with, there is the concrete reality of masses. In a sparsely populated country, politics can be made by small groups, separated from each other and from the masses, which will not form a public opinion and are remote from the centers of power. The nearness of the masses to the seats of power is very important. Pericles and Tiberius were well aware of it, as were Louis XIV and Napoleon. They installed themselves in the countryside, far from the crowds, in order to govern in peace outside the reach of the pressure of the masses, which, even without clearly wanting to, affect the conditions of power by their mere proximity. This simple fact explains why politics can no longer be the game of princes and diplomats, and why palace revolutions have been replaced by popular revolutions. Nowadays, the ruler can no longer detach himself from the masses and conduct a more or less secret policy. 
He no longer has an ivory tower, and everywhere he is confronted with this multiple presence. He cannot escape the mass simply because of the present population density. The mass is everywhere. Moreover, as a result of the modern means of transportation, the government is not only in constant contact with the population of the capital, but also with the entire country. In their relations with the governing powers, there is hardly any difference now between the population of the capital and that of the countryside. This physical proximity is itself a political factor. Moreover, the mass knows its rulers through the press, radio, and TV. The chief of state is in contact with the people. He can no longer prevent people from knowing a certain number of political facts. This development is not the result of some applied doctrine. It is not because democratic doctrine demands the masses' participation in public power that this relationship between mass and government has developed. It is a simple fact and the inevitable result of demographic changes. Hence, if the ruler wants to play the game by himself and follow secret policies, he must present a decoy to the masses. He cannot escape the mass, but he can draw between himself and that mass an invisible curtain, a screen on which the mass will see projected the mirage of some politics, while the real politics are being made behind it. Except for this subterfuge, the government is in fact under the control of the people, not juridical control, but the kind of control that stems from the simple fact that the people are interested in politics and try to keep up with and understand governmental action, as well as make their opinions known. For after all, the masses are interested in politics. Footnote Democracy rests on the conviction that the citizen can choose the right man and the right policy. Because this is not exactly the case, the crowd is propagandized in order to make it participate. Under such conditions, how could the mass not be convinced that it is deeply concerned? This too is new. Even those who do not read the papers carefully are appalled at the thought of censorship, particularly when they feel that the government wants to hide something or leave them in the dark. Nowadays, the masses are accustomed to making political judgments. As the result of the democratic process, they are accustomed to be consulted on political alternatives and to receive political information. This may only be a habit, but it is deeply ingrained by now. To try to reverse it would immediately provoke feelings of frustration and cries of injustice. That the masses are integrated in politics, whether deeply or superficially, is a fact. Besides, one very simple reason explains this. Today, as never before in history, political decisions affect everybody. In the old days, a war affected a small number of soldiers and a negligible piece of territory. Today, everybody is a soldier and the entire population and the whole territory of a nation are involved. Therefore, everybody wants to have his say on the subject of war and peace. Similarly, taxes have increased at least tenfold since the 17th century, and those who pay them naturally want some control over their use. The sacrifices demanded by political life keep increasing and affect everybody. Therefore, everybody wants to participate in this game, which affects him directly. Because the state's decision will affect me, I intend to influence them. As a result, governments can no longer govern without the masses, without their influence, presence, knowledge, and pressure. But how, then, can they govern? The rule of public opinion is regarded as a simple and natural fact. The government is regarded as the product of this opinion, from which it draws its strength. It expresses public opinion. To quote Napoleon's famous words, power is based on opinion. What is a government not supported by opinion? Nothing. Theoretically, democracy is political expression of mass opinion. Most people consider it simple to translate this opinion into action and consider it legitimate that the government should bend to the popular will. Unfortunately, in reality, all this is much less clear and not so simple. More and more we know, for example, that public opinion does not express itself at the polls and is a long way from expressing itself clearly in political trends. We know, too, 
that public opinion is very unstable, fluctuating, never settled. Furthermore, this opinion is irrational and develops in unforeseeable fashion. It is by no means composed of a majority of rational decisions in the face of political problems, as some simplistic vision would have it. The majority vote is by no means the real public opinion. Its basically irrational character greatly reduces its power to rule in a democracy. Democracy is based on the concept that man is rational and capable of seeing clearly what is in his own interest, but the study of public opinion suggests this is a highly doubtful proposition, and the bearer of public opinion is generally a mass man, psychologically speaking, which makes him quite unsuited to properly exercise his right of citizenship. This leads us to the following consideration. On the one hand, the government can no longer operate outside the pressure of the masses and public opinion. On the other hand, public opinion does not express itself in the democratic form of government. To be sure, the government must know and constantly probe public opinion. Footnote. The Soviet Union, despite its authoritarian character and the absence of opinion surveys, makes just as much effort to keep informed of public opinion through agitators who inform the government on the people's state of mind and through letters to the press. The government does not consult opinion in order to obey it, however, but to know at what level it exists and to determine what propaganda action is needed to win it over. The party must neither anticipate public opinion nor lag behind it. To determine the state's rhythm of action, it must know the masses' state of mind. The modern state must constantly undertake press and opinion surveys and sound out public opinion in a variety of other ways. But the fundamental question is, does the state then obey and express and follow that opinion? Our unequivocal answer is that even in a democratic state, it does not. Such obeisance by the state to public opinion is impossible. First, because of the very nature of public opinion, and second, because of the nature of modern political activities. Public opinion is so variable and fluctuating that government could never base a course of action on it. No sooner would the government begin to pursue certain aims favored in an opinion poll than opinion would turn against it. To the degree that opinion changes are rapid, policy changes would have to be equally rapid. To the extent that opinion is irrational, political action would have to be equally irrational. And as public opinion ultimately is always the opinion of incompetence, political decisions would therefore be surrendered to them. Aside from the near impossibility of simply following public opinion, the government has certain functions, particularly those of a technical nature, entirely outside such opinion. With regard to an enterprise that involves billions and lasts for years, it is not a question of following opinion, either at its inception, when opinion has not yet crystallized, or later, when the enterprise has gone too far to turn back. In such matters as French oil policy in the Sahara or electrification in the Soviet Union, political opinion can play no role whatsoever. The same holds true even where enterprises are being nationalized regardless of an apparent socialist opinion. In many instances, political decisions must be made to suit new problems emerging precisely from the new political configurations in our age, and such problems do not fit the stereotypes and patterns of established public opinion. Nor can public opinion crystallize overnight, and the government cannot postpone actions and decisions until vague images and myths eventually coalesce into opinion. In the present world of politics, action must at all times be the forerunner of opinion. Even where public opinion is already formed, it can be disastrous to follow it. Recent studies have shown the catastrophic role of public opinion in matters of foreign policy. The masses are incapable of resolving the conflict between morality and state policy or of conceiving a long-term foreign policy. They push the government toward a disastrous foreign policy as in Franklin Roosevelt's policy toward the Soviet Union, or Johnson's push-button policy. The greatest danger in connection with foreign policy is that of public opinion manifesting itself in the shape of crisis, in an explosion, 
Obviously, public opinion knows little about foreign affairs and cares less. Torn by contradictory desires, divided on principal questions, it permits the government to conduct whatever foreign policy it deems best. But all at once, for a variety of reasons, opinion converges on one point. Temperatures rise. Men become excited and assert themselves. For example, on the question of German rearmament. And should this opinion be followed? To the same extent that opinion expresses itself sporadically, that it wells up in fits and starts, it runs counter to the necessary continuity of foreign policy and tends to overturn previous agreements and existing alliances. Because such opinion is intermittent and fragmentary, the government could not follow it even if it wanted to. Ergo, even in a democracy, a government that is honest, serious, benevolent, and respects the voter cannot follow public opinion, but it cannot escape it either. The masses are there. They are interested in politics. The government cannot act without them. So what can it do? Only one solution is possible. As the government cannot follow opinion, opinion must follow the government. One must convince this present, ponderous, impassioned mass that the government's decisions are legitimate and good and that its foreign policy is correct. The democratic state, precisely because it believes in the expression of public opinion and does not gag it, must channel and shape that opinion if it wants to be realistic and not follow an ideological dream. The Gordian knot cannot be cut any other way. Of course, the political parties already have the role of adjusting public opinion to that of the government. Numerous studies have shown that political parties often do not agree with that opinion, that the voters, and even party members, frequently do not know their party's doctrines, and that people belong to parties for reasons other than ideological ones. But the parties channel free-floating opinion into existing formulas, polarizing it on opposites that do not necessarily correspond to the original tenets of such opinion. Because parties are so rigid, because they deal with only a part of any question, and because they are purely politically motivated, they distort public opinion and prevent it from forming naturally. But even beyond party influence, which is already propaganda influence, government action exists in and by itself. The most benevolent state will inform the people of what it does. Footnote. Is it normal, for example, for the plan in France to be the expression of a closed technocracy and for the public never to be really correctly informed about it? For the government to explain how it acts, why it acts, and what the problems are makes sense, but when dispensing such information, the government cannot remain coldly objective it must plead its case. Inevitably, if only to counteract opposing propaganda. Footnote. This will be examined elsewhere in greater detail. Because information alone is ineffective, its dissemination leads necessarily to propaganda, particularly when the government is obliged to defend its own actions or the life of the nation against private enterprise. The giant corporations and pressure groups, pushing their special interests, are resorting increasingly to psychological manipulation. Must the government permit this without reacting? And just because pure and simple information cannot prevail against modern propaganda techniques, the government too must act through propaganda. In France, this situation arose in 1954, when the army used films and pamphlets to challenge the government's EDC. European Defense Community Propaganda. But from the moment the soldier can vote, he is subjected to propaganda from outside groups and is himself a member of a pressure group. And what a group! The army itself is potentially a formidable pressure group, and the famous political malaise in France is partly owing to the efforts of successive governments to influence that group by psychological means and to break it up. How can one deny to the government the right to do what all the other groups do? How can one demand of a modern state that it tolerate an independent group? Plevin's demand of 1954, to the effect that there must be no propaganda in one direction or the other, 
is morally satisfying but purely theoretical and unrealistic. Moreover, he went on to claim that what had been called propaganda was government-dispensed information, pure and simple. In fact, the two realities, information and propaganda, are so little distinct from one another that what the enemy says is nothing but propaganda, whereas what our side says is nothing but information. Footnote. It is known that in French opinion, everything that comes from the state, even what is most honest, will be automatically and without exception called propaganda. So propagandized rather than free and critical is the contemporary French man. This is what happened to the speeches by Mondes France and the communiques concerning the war in Algeria. But there is more. In a democracy, the citizens must be tied to the decisions of the government. This is the great role propaganda must perform. It must give the people the feeling, which they crave and which satisfies them, to have wanted what the government is doing, to be responsible for its actions, to be involved in defending them and making them succeed, to be with it. Footnote Léo Amand Le Pouvoir et l'Opinion Le Monde, April 1959 The writer Léo Amand is of the opinion that this is the main task of political parties, unions, and associations. But it is not the whole answer. More direct and evocative action is needed to tie opinion, not just to anything, but to acts of political power. The American writer Bradford Westerfield has said, In the United States, the government almost always conducts its foreign policies on its own initiative, but where the public is interested in a particular question, it can only proceed with the apparent support of a substantial majority of the people. Westerfield stresses that, at times, concessions must be made to the people, but if the president really directs opinion, and if the public accepts the foreign policy of the government as a whole, no great concessions will have to be made to elicit the necessary support. Footnote. Bradford Westerfield, Opinion and Parties in American Foreign Policy. AFSP, 1954. Here we find confirmation that any modern state, even a democratic one, is burdened with the task of acting through propaganda. It cannot act otherwise. Footnote. The state can no longer govern without its citizens being directly involved in its enterprises. Goebbels stated that in 1934, the majority of Germans were for Hitler. But were they active? Were they happy with this political participation? Finally, could one hope for continued compliance? To assure such compliance, propaganda is necessary. According to Maigret, psychological action in a democracy is nothing else than this invisible and discreet servant of the great functions of the state. It is a way of being, doing, and providing, through the allegiance of minds, the success of legitimate government action. This necessary participation is not necessarily spontaneous. Individuals who claim to control politics are at the same time very passive. On the one hand, they do not believe what they are told. On the other, they tend to put their private lives before everything else and to take refuge in them. The state must compel the individual to participate. At the most elementary level, it must force him to vote. The principal role of propaganda, then, would be to fight against opposition and indifference. But the same analysis must be made from another point of departure. We have traced the dilemma of the modern state. Since the 18th century, the democratic movement has pronounced and eventually impregnated the masses with the idea of the legitimacy of power. And after a series of theories on that legitimacy, we have now reached the famous theory of the sovereignty of the people. Power is regarded as legitimate when it derives from the sovereignty of the people, rests on the popular will, expresses and follows this popular will. The validity of this concept can be debated ad infinitum from the theoretical point of view. One can examine it throughout history and ask if it is what Rousseau had in mind. 
In any event, this rather abstract philosophic theory has become a well-developed and irrefutable idea in the mind of the average man. For the average Westerner, the will of the people is sacred, and the government that fails to represent that will is an abominable dictatorship. Each time the people speak their minds, the government must go along. No other source of legitimacy exists. This is the fundamental image, the collective prejudice which has become a self-evident belief and is no longer merely a doctrine or a rational theory. This belief has spread very rapidly in the past thirty years. We now find the same unshakable and absolute belief in all communist countries, and begin to see it even in Islamic countries, where it should be rather remote. The contagious force of such a formula seems to be inexhaustible. Conversely, a government does not feel legitimate and cannot claim to be so unless it rests on this sovereignty of the people, unless it can prove that it expresses the will of the people. Otherwise, it would be thrown out immediately. Because of this mystical belief in the people's sovereignty, all dictators try to demonstrate that they are the expression of that sovereignty. For a long time, the theory of the people's sovereignty was believed to be tied to the concept of democracy, but it should be remembered that when that doctrine was applied for the first time, it led to the emergence of the most stringent dictatorship, that of the Jacobins. Therefore, we can hardly complain when modern dictators talk about the sovereignty of the people. Such is the force of this belief that no government can exist without satisfying it or giving the appearance of sharing it. From this belief springs the necessity for dictators to have themselves elected by plebiscite. Hitler, Stalin, Tito, Mussolini were all able to claim that they obtained their power from the people. This is true even of a Gomulka or a Rakushi. Every plebiscite shows the famous result, which fluctuates between 99.1 and 99.9 percent .9 of the votes. It is obvious to everybody, including those elected, that this is just for the sake of appearance, a consultation of the people without any significance. But it is equally obvious that one cannot do without it, and the ceremony must be repeated periodically to demonstrate that the legitimacy is still there, that the people are still in full accord with their representatives. The people lend themselves to all this. After all, it cannot be denied that the voters really vote, and that they vote in the desired way. The results are not faked. There is compliance. Could it be that the people's sovereignty is actually something other than compliance? Might it be hoped that without any prior attempts at influencing the people, a true constitutional form could emerge from the people? Such a supposition is absurd. The only reality is to propose to the people something with which they agree. Up to now we have not seen a single example of people not eventually complying with what was proposed to them. In a plebiscite or referendum, the eyes always exceed the nays. We see here once again the instrument used to influence the masses, the propaganda by which the government provides itself with legitimacy through public compliance. This leads to two further considerations. First, compliance must be obtained, not just with the form of government, but with all its important actions. As Drouin has aptly said, nothing is more irritating to a people than to have the feeling of being directed by mandarins who let their decisions fall from the height of their power. Thus, the need to inform the people better. That the decisions should be wise does not suffice. The reasons for them must be given. For an enterprise to function well, it is best to take it apart in public without concealing its weaknesses, without hiding its cost, and to make clear the meaning of the sacrifices demanded of the people. Footnote Sur le régime de la Cinquième République, Le Monde, April 1959 but such information really aims at compliance and participation. It is, in other words, propaganda in the deepest sense. But we have become used to seeing our governments act this way. In 1957, when the Soviet people were called upon to study and discuss Khrushchev's theses on economic reorganization, we witnessed a truly remarkable operation. 
The underlying theme of it all was, of course, that everything is being decided by the people. How can the people then not be in agreement afterwards? How can they fail to comply completely with what they have decided in the first place? The theses were submitted to the people first. Naturally, they were then explained in all the party organizations, in the komsomols, in the unions, in the local Soviets, in the factories, and so on, by agitprop specialists. Then the discussions took place. Next, Pravda opened its columns to the public, and numerous citizens sent in comments, expressed their views, suggested amendments. After that, what happened? The entire government program, without the slightest modification, was passed by the Supreme Soviet. Even amendments presented and supported by individual deputies were rejected, and all the more those presented by individual citizens for they were only individual, minority opinions, and from the democratic, majority, point of view, insignificant. But the people were given the immense satisfaction of having been consulted, of having been given a chance to debate, of having, so it seemed to them, their opinions solicited and weighed. Footnote. Goebbels declared that it was necessary to expose the acts of government so that the people can recognize by themselves the necessity for the measures taken. This is the democratic appearance that no authoritarian government can do without. Beyond that, such practices lead the government to embrace a method which derives logically from the principle of popular democracy, but which could develop only as a result of modern propaganda. The government is now in the habit of acting through the masses as intermediary in two ways. First, it goes to the people more and more frequently for the support of its policies. When a decision seems to meet with resistance or is not fully accepted, propaganda is addressed to the masses to set them in motion. The simple motion of the mass is enough to invest the decisions with validity. It is only an extension of the plebiscite. When the people's democracy installed itself in Czechoslovakia after a police coup d'etat, gigantic meetings of the working population were held, well-staged, organized, and kindled to demonstrate that the people were in full agreement. When Fidel Castro wanted to show that his power was based on democratic sentiment, he organized the Day of Justice, during which the whole population was called upon to sit in judgment of the past regime and to express its sentiments through massive demonstrations. These demonstrations were meant to legalize the death sentences handed down by the state courts and thus give a democratic sanction to the judgments. In doing this, Castro won the people's profound allegiance by satisfying the need for revenge against the former regime and the thirst for blood. He tied the people to his government by the strongest of bonds, the ritual crime. That day of justice, January 21st, 1959, was undoubtedly a great propagandistic discovery. If it caused Castro some embarrassment abroad, it certainly was a great success at home. It should be noted that such provocation of popular action always serves to support governmental action. It is in no way spontaneous and in no way expresses an intrinsic desire of the people. It merely expresses through a million throats of the crowd, the cry of governmental propaganda. Second, and this is a subtler process, governmental propaganda suggests that public opinion demand this or that decision. It provokes the will of a people who spontaneously would say nothing. But once evoked, formed, and crystallized on a point, that will becomes the people's will. And whereas the government really acts on its own, it gives the impression of obeying public opinion, after first having built that public opinion. The point is to make the masses demand of the government what the government has already decided to do. If it follows this procedure, the government can no longer be called authoritarian because the will of the people demands what is being done. In this fashion, when German public opinion unanimously demanded the liberation of Czechoslovakia, the German government had no choice but to invade that country in obedience to the people. It yielded to opinion as soon as opinion, through propaganda, had become strong enough to appear to influence the government. 
Castro's Day of Justice was cut from the same cloth. It was prepared by an excellent propaganda campaign, and the people who had been aroused with great care then demanded that their government carry out the acts of justice. Thus the government did not merely obtain agreement for its acts. The people actually demanded from the government incisive punitive measures, and the popular government merely fulfilled that demand, which of course had been manufactured by government propaganda. This constant propaganda action, which makes the people demand what was decided beforehand, and makes it appear as though the spontaneous innermost desires of the people were being carried out by a democratic and benevolent government, best characterizes the present-day mass-government relationship. This system has been put to use in the USSR particularly, and in this respect Nikita Khrushchev liberalized nothing. On the contrary. However, the emergence of this particular phenomenon was predictable from the day when the principle of popular sovereignty began to take hold. From that point on, the development of propaganda cannot be regarded as a deviation or an accident. The State and Its Function From the government point of view, two additional factors must be kept in mind. The competitive situation in which democracy finds itself in the world, and the disintegration of national and civic virtues. Why a totalitarian regime would want to use propaganda is easily understood. Democratic regimes, if we give them the benefit of the doubt, feel some compunction and revulsion against the use of propaganda. But such democratic regimes are driven into its use because of the external challenges they have to meet. Ever since Hitler, democracy has been subjected to relentless psychological warfare. The question, then, is which regime will prevail? For both times claim to be of universal validity and benefit. This obliges them to act upon each other. As the communist regime claims to be the harbinger of the people's happiness, it has no choice but to destroy all other regimes in order to supplant them. But for the Western democracies the problem is the same. In their eyes, the communist regime is a horrible dictatorship. Thus, one must intervene against one's neighbor, mainly through propaganda, and also, so far as the communists are concerned, through communist parties in non-communist countries. This in turn forces the democracies to make internal propaganda. If they are to prevail against those communist parties and against the USSR, economic progress must be accelerated. In fact, the competition between the two regimes unfolds partly in the economic realm. We all know Khrushchev's economic challenge. This acceleration of the economic development demands an organization, a mobilization of the latent forces in the heart of the democracies, which requires psychological work, special training, and a permanent propaganda campaign on the necessity for increased production. It is one result of the competition between regimes. But this competition takes place on another level as well. No man in the world can remain unaffected by the competition of the two regimes. Unfortunately, this is the result of global solidarity that some welcome. No people can remain outside the conflict between the big two. Democracy feels that it must conquer and hold all the small nations, which otherwise would fall into the communist orbit. In the pursuit of this objective, Two means are used in conjunction, the economic weapon and propaganda. In the days of classic imperialism, the economic weapon, supported on occasion by brief military action, was sufficient. Nowadays, the successive failures of the United States prove that the economic weapon is ineffective without propaganda. For example, in 1960, the United States gave three times as much assistance to underdeveloped nations as did the Soviet Union. Thanks to propaganda, it is the Soviet Union who is regarded as the great helper and benefactor in whom one can put one's trust. The hearts and minds of the people must be won if economic assistance, which by itself has no effect on opinion, is to succeed. Similarly, propaganda by itself accomplishes nothing. It must be accompanied by spectacular economic acts. 
Without doubt, the democracies have lost out so far in the contest for the African and Asian peoples only because of the inferiority of their propaganda and their reluctance to use it. Thus, the democracies are now irresistibly pushed toward the use of propaganda to stave off decisive defeat. Psychological warfare has become the daily bread of peace policy. The psychological conquest of entire populations has become necessary, and nobody can escape it. One no longer must decide whether or not to use the propaganda weapon. One has no choice. Good reasons exist for analyzing this new form of aggression. Military aggression has been replaced by indirect aggression, economic or ideological. Propaganda saps the strength of the regimes that are its victims, depriving them of the support of their own public opinion. Austria and Czechoslovakia had been reduced to impotence by Nazi propaganda before they were invaded. Other countries with not a single expansionist aim are constantly subjected to this same aggression. They cannot defend themselves except by using the same means of psychological warfare, for no international organization or court of justice can protect them against this form of aggression. Psychological action is too protean, too hard to nail down, and cannot be legally adjudicated. Above all, in legally defending against psychological aggression, one must not deny the freedom of opinion and speech guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. The problem thus springs directly from the given situation. Every state must accept the burden of defending itself against propaganda aggression. As soon as one country has taken this road, all other countries must eventually follow suit or be destroyed. A democracy is generally poorly organized for effective psychological warfare. French specialists have said, with some justification, only the army can engage in psychological warfare because of its structure. But in the face of the democratic regime's need to conduct propaganda, it has also been said that, in a world of the Cold War, domestic political thought must become strategic. Footnote T. Albor, Le Monde, 1958 Therefore, the problem is to resolve the dichotomy between the political and the military, and to define and integrate the army's political function. As a result of the necessity to conduct propaganda, democracy finds itself compelled to change its structure. But the Cold War does not merely demand action against the external enemy who tries to interfere, it also demands that things be kept firmly in hand at home. The state must psychologically arm, protect, and defend its citizens, all the more when the ideological structure of a democracy is weak. Here we face a new problem. In today's world, much more than in the past, a nation can survive only if its values are secure, its citizens loyal and unanimous, and if they practice the civic virtues. But at this time, a crisis of basic values and a relaxation of civic virtues is occurring in a number of Western democracies. Governments are forced to reconstruct their nations psychologically and ideologically, and this need, in turn, justifies psychological action. In fact, in this connection, hardly anybody objects to such psychological action. Everybody seems to consider it necessary and justified as long as one limits oneself to the moral education of the soldier and the dissemination of the truth. But many object to putting pressure on people's minds. Though they mean well, those who object simply fail to see that the two elements they seek to separate, the telling of the truth and the exercise of pressure on the minds, are in fact identical. How can one rebuild civic virtues rapidly in order to reap quick benefits? without using pressure to change people's points of view. From the moment when the need of reconstructing a nation ideologically makes itself felt, methods become inevitable which are propaganda pure and simple. Of course the objectives pursued are pure. For example, the French army says, Far from engaging in psychological action in order to enslave minds, most colonials aim only at securing human liberty. They understand that one cannot permit a man of free choice to let himself be captured by a doctrine that would reduce him to an object. 
They know that a possible future war would include an attack against the mind, more precisely, against one of the mind's functions, the will. Psychological action in the army aims only at furnishing the men with adequate means for the defense of freedom, where it still exists. To this end, it is enough to strengthen the will of the resistance if that will to resistance comes under attack. The endangered men must be taught our aims, our mission, and our means of attaining them. Footnote Colonel Villiers de Lille Dame, Le Monde, October 1958. Here, psychological action is presented in its most favorable light. We cannot even object to the reasoning. It corresponds to the feelings of most liberals. Here, psychological action presents itself as a sort of national education. According to another French writer, psychological action is designed to shape and develop and sustain the morale and to immunize the soldiers against enemy psychological attacks. This is intended for wartime, when the first task is to shape an army which must preserve its proper internal spiritual cohesion. It is described thus. A civic and moral education of all people placed under military command, within a context of objective information, opposed to propaganda, designed only to spiritually arm the citizen of a free democracy. The methods employed are those of education and human relations. Their principal aim is to engage the cooperation of the individual to whom they are addressed, to explain to him and make him understand the different aspects of problems that confront him. In other words, the aim is the civic education of the troops. The soldiers must learn the civic realities and the values of civilization. This is not just a French problem, incidentally. In Germany, we find precisely the same orientation. But it is obvious that the education of the army cannot restrict itself to the troops. Such work becomes infinitely easier if young recruits are already indoctrinated. On the other hand, if the army were alone in maintaining the civic virtues, it would feel isolated. For such work to be effective, it must be done by the entire nation. In this fashion, the army will be tempted to become the nation's educator. A psychological action by the state on the entire nation then becomes a necessity. The Provisional Proclamation on Psychological Action of 1957 stated that neutralism on the part of the government invited subversion and placed it in a perilous position, that the absence of civic education leads young people to a lack of patriotism, to social egotism, and to nihilism. This shows the perfectly good intentions, the legitimate concerns, and the serious objectives behind psychological action. But is there not a considerable amount of illusion in the rigorous distinction between psychological action and propaganda, between the enemy's methods and one's own? In fact, one is faced with a mass of individuals who must be formed, involved, given certain nationalistic reflexes. A scale of values must be introduced by which the individual can judge everything. If one had a great deal of time, a vast supply of good educators, stable institutions, and lots of money, and if France were not engaged in war or in international competition, it might be possible to eventually rebuild civic virtues through information and good example. But this is not the case. Action must be fast, with few educators at hand. Therefore, only one way can be taken, the utilization of the most effective instruments and the proved methods of propaganda. In a battle between propagandas, only propaganda can respond effectively and quickly. As a result, the effects of one's own propaganda on the personality are exactly the same as those of enemy propaganda. We say on the personality, not on some specific opinions. These effects will be analyzed at length later. In any event, one cannot possibly say, we act in order to preserve man's freedom. For propaganda, regardless of origin, destroys man's personality and freedom. If one were merely to say, the enemy must be defeated and to this end all means are good, we would not object. That would mean recognizing and accepting the fact that democracy, whether it wants to be or not, is engaged in propaganda.
but the illusion that one engages in psychological action as a defense while respecting the values of democracy and human personality is more pernicious than any cynicism which looks frankly at the true situation. A thorough study of information, education, human relations, and propaganda reveals that in practice no essential differences exist among them. Any politically oriented education which creates certain special values is propaganda. And our references to special values leads to yet another consideration. The inclusion of such special values as patriotism in the struggle for civic reconstruction excludes such others as internationalism, anarchism, and pacifism. One assumes that one's national values are given and justified in themselves. And from that, one concludes that one faces only the problem of education because these national values are the only values. But this is not so. In reality, the affirmation of certain values which one wants to inculcate and the rejection of others which one wants to eradicate from the minds of the listeners is precisely a propaganda operation. Thus, by different roads, we keep arriving at the same conclusion. A modern state even if it be liberal, democratic, and humanist, finds itself objectively and sociologically in a situation in which it must use propaganda as a means of governing. It cannot do otherwise. 2. The Individual's Necessity If we admit that the government has no choice but to make propaganda, there still remains the image of the aggressive and totalitarian political machine which pounces on the innocent victim, the individual. The individual then appears helpless and crushed by gigantic forces, but I think that propaganda fills a need of modern man, a need that creates in him an unconscious desire for propaganda. He is in the position of needing outside help to be able to face his condition, and that aid is propaganda. Naturally, he does not say, I want propaganda. On the contrary, in line with preconceived notions, he abhors propaganda and considers himself a free and mature person. But in reality, he calls for and desires propaganda that will permit him to ward off certain attacks and reduce certain tensions. This leads to the following puzzle. Propaganda by itself has no power over an individual it needs certain already existing pillars of support. It creates nothing. And yet the effectiveness of propaganda is undeniable, even though it seems impossible to define exactly those already existing pillars of support on which it builds. The solution is that these pillars are the individual's need for propaganda. The secret of propaganda success or failure is this. Has it or has it not satisfied the unconscious need of the individual whom it addressed? No propaganda can have an effect unless it is needed, though the need may not be expressed as such but remain unconscious. Footnote. In the Soviet Union, it is expressly stated that propaganda results from a dialectical process between the needs of individuals, which the local agitator communicates to the authorities, and the objectives of the party. And if we take into consideration that propaganda exists in all civilized countries and accompanies all progress towards civilization in underdeveloped countries, this need appears to be practically universal. It is an intrinsic part of the setting in which man finds himself in the technological society. Footnote. The existence of this universal need is also clearly revealed by circulation of rumors. Why are there rumors? Why do they circulate? They serve the need for explanations in a given situation and ease emotional tension because man seeks in them answers to what disturbs him. Propaganda responds to the same needs in a much more effective fashion, but spontaneous rumors demonstrate the existence of these needs. We shall first examine the objective situation of man which generates this need for propaganda, and then his psychological situation. The Objective Situation 
We have stressed that the state can no longer govern without the masses, which nowadays are closely involved in politics. But these masses are composed of individuals. From their point of view, the problem is slightly different. They are interested in politics and consider themselves concerned with politics, even if they are not forced to participate actively, because they live in a democracy. They embrace politics as soon as somebody wants to take the democratic regime away from them. But this presents them with problems that are way over their heads. They are faced with choices and decisions which demand maturity, knowledge, and a range of information which they do not and cannot have. Elections are limited to the selection of individuals, which reduces the problem of participation to its simplest form, but the individual wishes to participate in other ways than just elections. He wants to be conversant with economic questions. In fact, his government asks him to be. He wants to form an opinion on foreign policy, but in reality he can't. He is caught between his desire and his inability, which he refuses to accept. For no citizen will believe that he is unable to have opinions. Public opinion surveys always reveal that people have opinions even on the most complicated questions, except for a small minority, usually the most informed and those who have reflected most. The majority prefers expressing stupidities to not expressing any opinion. This gives them the feeling of participation. For this they need simple thoughts, elementary explanations, a key that will permit them to take a position and even ready-made opinions. As most people have the desire and at the same time the incapacity to participate, they are ready to accept the propaganda that will permit them to participate and which hides their incapacity beneath explanations, judgments, and news, enabling them to satisfy their desire without eliminating their incompetence. The more complex, general, and accelerated political and economic phenomena become, the more do individuals feel concerned, the more do they want to be involved. In a certain sense, this is democracy's gain. But it also leads to more propaganda. And the individual does not want information, but only value judgments and preconceived positions. Here, one must also take into account the individual's laziness, which plays a decisive role in the entire propaganda phenomenon, and the impossibility of transmitting all information fast enough to keep up with developments in the modern world. Besides, the developments are not merely beyond man's intellectual scope, they are also beyond him in volume and intensity. He simply cannot grasp the world's economic and political problems. Faced with such matters, he feels his weakness, his inconsistency, his lack of effectiveness. He realizes that he depends on decisions over which he has no control, and that realization drives him to despair. Man cannot stay in this situation too long. He needs an ideological veil to cover the harsh reality, some consolation, a raison d'etre, a sense of values. And only propaganda offers him a remedy for a basically intolerable situation. Besides, modern man is called upon for enormous sacrifices, which probably exceed anything known in the past. First of all, work has assumed an all-pervading role in modern life. Never have men worked so much as in our society. Contrary to what is often said, man works much more nowadays than, for example, in the 18th century. Only the working hours have decreased. But the omnipresence of the duties of his work, the obligations and constraints, the actual working conditions, the intensity of work that never ends, make it weigh much more heavily on men today than on men in the past. Every modern man works more than the slave of long ago. Standards have been adjusted downward, but whereas the slave worked only because he was forced to, modern man who believes in his freedom and dignity, needs reasons and justifications to make himself work. Even the children in a modern nation do an amount of work at school which no child was ever asked to do before the beginning of the 19th century. There, too, justifications are needed. One cannot make people live forever in the state of assiduous, intense, never-ending labor without giving them good reasons and creating, by example, a virtue of work like that of the bourgeoisie of the 19th century, or a myth of liberation through work, 
like that of the Nazis or communists. Such dedication to work does not happen by itself or spontaneously. Its creation is properly the task of propaganda, which must give the individual psychological and ideological reasons why he needs to be where he is. One cannot get good, steady work out of a man merely by pointing to the need for such work, or even to its monetary rewards. One must give him psychological satisfactions of a high order. Man wants a profound and significant reason for what he does. And as all this is a collective situation, it will be furnished him by collective means. To furnish the collective ideological motivations driving man to action is propaganda's exact task. Every time the sum total of labor is to be increased, the increase is accomplished through propaganda. The Soviet Union, with its five-year plan, set the example, and the Chinese leaps forward are also typical. Footnote. This leads to a comparison of the agitator with the shock worker, Udarnik. The agitator who remains a political force must, at the same time, be an exemplary worker. He must introduce new workers into the industrial order, push workers to accomplish the norms. Agitation for production was the most important propaganda of the 1930s in the USSR. The press itself was engaged in this agitation for production, for very often in its heroic period, the government had no other means for resolving economic problems than that of propaganda to improve productivity and discipline. But we must not think this was limited to the 1930s. The same movement resumed in 1950 with the reintroduction of Stakhanovism. In France, all increase in production rests on an enormous propaganda campaign, and the citizen really cannot be happy in his work unless he is sustained by such psychological nourishment, by the combination of promises, such as a few years of hard work and a thousand years of happiness, and the value of the motives handed him. The exigencies of work and economic life in the modern world create in man the need for propaganda. In the United States, this takes the form of human relations. American writers have often said that the drive toward efficiency cannot be expected to develop by itself. The man who is subjected to the demands for efficiency will ask, Efficiency for what? It is then up to propaganda to give him the answer. But modern man is not only forced to make sacrifices in his work, he is also saddled by his government with other sacrifices, such as ever-increasing taxes. Every citizen of a modern state pays more taxes than the most heavily taxed people in pre-Napoleonic days. Then the subject was forced to pay, whereas the free citizen of today must pay for reasons of conviction. His conviction will not come about spontaneously particularly when the taxes are really heavy. The conviction must therefore be manufactured. Ideals must be stimulated in order to give true significance to such a contribution to the nation. Here, too, propaganda is needed. This is the exact opposite of political freedom. Let us take the most serious of all sacrifices. The modern citizen is asked to participate in wars such as have never been seen before. All men must prepare for war, and for a dreadful type of war at that, dreadful because of its duration, the immensity of its operations, its tremendous losses, and the atrocity of the means employed. Moreover, participation in war is no longer limited to the duration of the war itself. There is the period of preparation for war, which becomes more and more intense and costly. Then there is the period in which to repair the ravages of war. People really live in a permanent atmosphere of war, and a superhuman war in every respect. The strain of holding out for days under bombardment is a much greater strain than a day of traditional battle. Nowadays, everybody is affected by war. Everybody lives under its threat. Naturally, it was always necessary to give men ideological and sentimental motivations to get them to lay down their lives, but... In our modern form of war, the traditional motives, protection of one's family, defense of one's own country, personal hatred for a known enemy, no longer exist. They must be replaced by others, and the more demanded of man, the more powerful must be those motivations. 
The man of whom such super-sacrifices are demanded finds himself in the middle of an incessant world conflict, pushed to the very limit of his nervous and mental endurance, and in a sort of constant preparation for ultimate sacrifice. He cannot live this way unless sustained by powerful motivations, which he will not find either inside himself or spontaneously. They must be furnished him by society which will respond to the need that arises from the individual's actual situation. Obviously, some simple information on the international situation or on the need to defend one's country is insufficient here. Man must be plunged into a mystical atmosphere. He must be given strong enough impulses as well as good enough reasons for his sacrifices, and at the same time a drug that will sustain his nerves and his morale. Patriotism must become ideological. Only propaganda can put man into a state of nervous endurance that will permit him to face the tension of war. Footnote. When propaganda is missing, people do not really become involved in war. For instance, the ridiculous French government propaganda in 1939, the propaganda toward Indochina, which went too far, and the propaganda on the Algerian War, hasty and clumsy as opposed to the remarkably good leftist and FLN propaganda. Aside from all these sacrifices, man is not automatically adjusted to the living conditions imposed on him by modern society. Psychologists and sociologists are aware of the great problem of adjusting the normal man to a technological environment, to the increasing pace the working hours, the noise, the crowded cities, the tempo of work, the housing shortage, and so on. Then there is the difficulty of accepting the never-changing daily routine, the lack of personal accomplishment, the absence of an apparent meaning in life, the family insecurity provoked by these living conditions, the anonymity of the individual in the big cities and at work. The individual is not equipped to face these disturbing, paralyzing, traumatic influences. Here again, he needs a psychological aid. To endure such a life, he needs to be given motivations that will restore his equilibrium. One cannot leave modern man alone in a situation such as this. What can one do? One can surround him with a network of psychological relations, human relations, it will artificially soothe his discomforts, reduce his tensions, and place him in some human context. Or one can have him live in a myth strong enough to offset the concrete disadvantages or give them a shade of meaning, a value that makes them acceptable. To make man's condition acceptable to him, one must transcend it. This is the function of Soviet and Chinese propaganda. In both cases, there is psychological manipulation of the individual, an operation that must be classified as propaganda in the broad sense of the word. Such propaganda has a political character. If one takes the term political in its broadest sense as referring to the collective life in a polis. Finally, to understand the need for propaganda that springs from modern man's actual condition, one must remember that one is dealing with an informed person. Having analyzed in the preceding chapter how information actually supports propaganda, we must now turn to the manner in which the dispensing of information lays the psychological foundations for a man's becoming a propagandee. If we look at the average man, and not at those few intellectuals whose special business it is to be informed, what do we actually mean when we say this man is informed? It means that, aside from spending eight hours at work and two more commuting, this man reads a newspaper or, more precisely, looks at the headlines and glances at a few stories. He may also listen to news broadcasts or watch it on TV. And once a week he will look at the photos in a picture magazine. This is the case of the reasonably well-informed man, that is, of 98% of all people. What happens next to a man who wishes to be informed and receives a great deal of news each day? First, straight news reporting never gives him anything but factual details. The event of the day is always only a part, for news can never deal with the whole. 
Theoretically, the reporter could relate these details to other details, put them into context, and even provide certain interpretations, but that would no longer be pure information. Footnote. I could give a hundred examples of complete distortion of facts by competent and honest journalists whose interpretive articles appear in serious newspapers. Besides, this could be done only for the most important events, whereas most news items deal with less important matters. But if you shower the public with the thousands of items that occur in the course of a day or week, the average person, even if he tries hard, will simply retain thousands of items which mean nothing to him. He would need a remarkable memory to tie some event to another that happened three weeks or three months ago. Moreover, the array of categories is bewildering, economics, politics, geography, and so on, and topics and categories change every day. To be sure, certain major stories, such as Indochina and Hungary, become the subject of continuous reporting for several weeks or months, but that is not typical. Ordinarily, a follow-up story on a previous news item appears two weeks to a month later. To obtain a rounded picture, one would have to do research, but the average person has neither the desire nor the time for it. As a result, he finds himself in a kind of kaleidoscope in which thousands of unconnected images follow each other rapidly. His attention is continually diverted to new matters, new centers of interest, and is dissipated on a thousand things, which disappear from one day to the next. The world becomes remarkably changeable and uncertain. He feels as though he is at the hub of a merry-go-round and can find no fixed point or continuity. This is the first effect information has on him. Even with major events, an immense effort is required to get a proper broad view from the thousand little strokes, the variations of color, intensity, and dimension which his paper gives him. The world thus looks like a pointillist canvas. A thousand details make a thousand points. Moreover, blank spots on the canvas also prevent a coherent view. Our reader then would have to be able to stand back and get a panoramic view from a distance. But the law of news is that it is a daily affair. Man can never stand back to get a broad view because he immediately receives a new batch of news, which supersedes the old and demands a new point of focus, for which our reader has no time. To the average man who tries to keep informed, a world emerges that is astonishingly incoherent, absurd, and irrational which changes rapidly and constantly for reasons he cannot understand. And as the most frequent news story is about an accident or a calamity, our reader takes a catastrophic view of the world around him. What he learns from the papers is inevitably the event that disturbs the order of things. He is not told about the ordinary and uninteresting course of events, but only of unusual disasters which disturb that course. He does not read about the thousands of trains that every day arrive normally at their destination, but he learns all the details of a train accident. In the world of politics and economics, the same holds true. The news is only about trouble, danger, and problems. This gives man the notion that he lives in a terrible and frightening era, that he lives amid catastrophes in a world where everything threatens his safety. Man cannot stand this. He cannot live in an absurd and incoherent world. For this he would have to be heroic, and even Camus, who considered this the only honest posture, was not really able to stick to it. Nor can he accept the idea that the problems which sprout all around him cannot be solved, or that he himself has no value as an individual and is subject to the turn of events. The man who keeps himself informed needs a framework in which all this information can be put in order. He needs explanations and comprehensive answers to general problems. He needs coherence, and he needs an affirmation of his own worth. All this is the immediate effect of information, and the more complicated the problems are, the more simple the explanations must be, the more fragmented the canvas, the simpler the pattern, the more difficult the question, the more all-embracing the solution, the more menacing the reduction of his own worth the greater the need for boosting his ego. All this propaganda, and only propaganda, can give him. 
Of course, an outstanding man of vast culture, great intelligence, and exceptional energy can find answers for himself, reconcile himself to the absurd, and plan his own action. But we are not thinking here of the outstanding man, who, naturally, we all imagine ourselves to be, but of the ordinary man. Footnote. I know, of course, that it is fashionable today to deny the existence of superior, inferior, and average men. That argument is generally factitious, and even its proponents usually follow up by analyzing the psychosociology of man, describing certain behavior as normal, and using the statistical method. An analysis of propaganda, therefore, shows that it succeeds primarily because it corresponds exactly to a need of the masses. Let us remember just two aspects of this, the need for explanations and the need for values, which both spring largely, though not entirely, from the promulgation of news. Effective propaganda needs to give man an all-embracing view of the world, a view rather than a doctrine. Such a view will first of all encompass a general panorama of history, economics, and politics. This panorama itself is the foundation of the power of propaganda because it provides justification for the actions of those who make propaganda. The point is to show that one travels in the direction of history and progress. That panorama allows the individual to give the proper classification to all the news items he receives, to exercise a critical judgment, to sharply accentuate certain facts and suppress others, depending on how well they fit into the framework. This is a necessary protection against being flooded with facts without being able to establish a perspective. Propaganda must also furnish an explanation for all happenings, a key to understand the whys and the reasons for economic and political developments. News loses its frightening character when it offers information for which the listener already has a ready explanation in his mind, or for which he can easily find one. The great force of propaganda lies in giving modern man all-embracing, simple explanations and massive doctrinal causes, without which he could not live with the news. Man is doubly reassured by propaganda, first, because it tells him the reasons behind the developments which unfold, and second, because it promises a solution for all the problems that arise, which would otherwise seem insoluble. Just as information is necessary for awareness, propaganda is necessary to prevent this awareness from being desperate. The Subjective Situation Some psychological characteristics of modern man, partly results of his reality situation, also explain his irrepressible need for propaganda. Most studies on propaganda merely examine how the propagandist can use this or that trait or tendency of a man to influence him. But it seems to us that a prior question needs to be examined. Why does a man involuntarily provoke the propaganda operation? Without going into the theory of the mass man or the organization man, which is unproven and debatable, let us recall some frequently analyzed traits of the man who lives in the Western world and is plunged into its overcrowded population. Let us accept as a premise that he is more susceptible to suggestion, more credulous, more easily excited. Above all, he is a victim of emptiness. He is a man devoid of meaning. He is very busy, but he is emotionally empty, open to all entreaties and in search of only one thing, something to fill his inner void. To fill this void, he goes to the movies, only a very temporary remedy. He seeks some deeper and more fulfilling attraction. He is available and ready to listen to propaganda. He is the lonely man, the lonely crowd, and the larger the crowd in which he lives, the more isolated he is. Despite the pleasure he might derive from his solitude, he suffers deeply from it. He feels the most violent need to be reintegrated into a community, to have a setting, to experience ideological and effective communication. That loneliness inside the crowd is perhaps the most terrible ordeal of modern man. That loneliness in which he can share nothing, talk to nobody, and expect nothing from anybody, leads to severe personality disturbances. For it, propaganda, 
Encompassing human relations is an incomparable remedy. It corresponds to the need to share, to be a member of a community, to lose oneself in a group, to embrace a collective ideology that will end loneliness. Propaganda is the true remedy for loneliness. It also corresponds to deep and constant needs, more developed today perhaps than ever before, the need to believe and obey, to create and hear fables, to communicate in the language of myths. It also responds to man's intellectual sloth and desire for security, intrinsic characteristics of the real man as distinguished from the theoretical man of the existentialists. All this turns man against information which cannot satisfy any of these needs, and leads him to crave propaganda which can satisfy them. The situation has another aspect. In our society, man is being pushed more and more into passivity. He is thrust into vast organizations which function collectively and in which each man has his own small part to play. But he cannot act on his own. He can act only as the result of someone else's decision. Man is more and more trained to participate in group movements and to act only on signal and in the way he has been taught. There is training for big and small matters, training for his job, for the driver and the pedestrian, for the consumer, for the moviegoer, for the apartment house dweller, and so on. The consumer gets his signal from the advertiser that the purchase of some product is desirable. The driver learns from the green light that he may proceed. The individual becomes less and less capable of acting by himself. He needs the collective signals which integrate his actions into the complete mechanism. Modern life induces us to wait until we are told to act. Here again, propaganda comes to the rescue. To the extent that government can no longer function without the mass, as we have demonstrated above, propaganda is the signal to act the bridge from the individual's mere interest in politics to his political action. It serves to overcome collective passivity. It enters into the general current of society which develops multiple conditioned reflexes, which in turn become signals for man to play his part in the group. At the same time, the individual feels himself diminished. For one thing, he gets the feeling that he is under constant supervision and can never exercise his independent initiative. For another, he thinks he is always being pushed down to a lower level. He is a minor in that he can never act with his full authority. To be sure, we're talking of the average man. Obviously, a corporation president, a high-level administrator or professional man does not feel diminished, but that fact does not change the general situation. The feeling of being unimportant stems from general working conditions, such as mechanization and regimentation, from housing conditions with small rooms, noise, and lack of privacy, from family conditions with loss of authority over children, from submission to an ever-growing number of authorities. No one will ever be able to assess fully the disastrous effect on the human soul of all the bureaus and agencies. In short, from participation in mass society. We know that the individual plunged into the mass experiences a feeling of being reduced and weakened. He loses his human rights and the means to satisfy his ambitions. The multitudes around him oppress him and give him an unhealthy awareness of his own unimportance. He is drowned in the mass and becomes convinced that he is only a cipher and that he really cannot be considered otherwise in such a large number of individuals. Urban life gives a feeling of weakness and dependence to the individual. He is dependent on everything. Public transportation, the tax collector, the policeman, his employer, the city's public utilities. Separately, these elements would not affect him, but combined, they produce this feeling of diminution in modern man. But man cannot stand being unimportant. He cannot accept the status of a cipher. He needs to assert himself, to see himself as a hero. He needs to feel he is somebody and to be considered as such. He needs to express his authority, the drive for power and domination that is in every man. Under our present conditions, that instinct is completely frustrated. Though some roots of escape exist, 
The movies give the viewer a chance to experience self-esteem by identification with the hero, for example. That is not enough. Only propaganda provides the individual with a fully satisfactory response to his profound need. The more his needs increase in the collective society, the more propaganda must give man the feeling that he is a free individual. Propaganda alone can create this feeling, which in turn will integrate the individual into collective movements. Thus it is a powerful boost to his self-esteem. Though a mass instrument, it addresses itself to each individual. It appeals to me. It appeals to my common sense, my desires, and provokes my wrath and my indignation. It evokes my feelings of justice and my desire for freedom. It gives me violent feelings which lift me out of the daily grind. As soon as I have been politicized by propaganda, I can from my heights look down on daily trifles. My boss who does not share my convictions is merely a poor fool, a prey to the illusions of an evil world. I take my revenge upon him by being enlightened. I have understood the situation and know what ought to be done. I hold the key to events and am involved in dangerous and exciting activities. This feeling will be all the stronger when propaganda appeals to my decision and seems to be greatly concerned with my action. Everything is in the clutches of evil. There is a way out. But only if everybody participates, you must participate. If you don't, all will be lost through your fault. This is the feeling that propaganda must generate. My opinion, which society once scorned, now becomes important and decisive. No longer has it importance only for me, but also for the whole range of political affairs and the entire social body. A voter may well feel that his vote has no importance or value, but propaganda demonstrates that the action in which it involves us is of fundamental importance and that everything depends on me. It boosts my ego by giving me a strong sense of my responsibility. It leads me to assume a posture of authority among my fellows, makes me take myself seriously by appealing to me in impassioned tones with total conviction, and gives me the feeling that it's a question of all or nothing. Thanks to such propaganda, the diminished individual obtains the very satisfaction he needs. Propaganda in colonial countries plays on this same need of diminished peoples for self-assertion. Africans are even more susceptible to almost any propaganda because they lived under the guardianship of their colonizers and were reduced to a position of inferiority. But one must not conclude that a feeling of inferiority is to be found only in the oppressed. It is the normal condition of almost every person in a mass society. Also, to the extent that modern man is diminished, he finds himself faced with the almost constant need for repression. Most of his natural tendencies are suppressed by social constraints. We live in an increasingly organized and ordered society which permits less and less free and spontaneous expression of man's profound drives, which, it must be admitted, would be largely antisocial if completely unleashed. Modern man is tied to a timetable and rarely can act on the spur of the moment. He must pay constant attention to what goes on around him. He cannot make the noise he may want to make. He must obey a growing number of rules of all sorts. He cannot give free rein to his sexual instinct or his inclination to violence. For desperate present-day immorality, of which people complain, Contemporary man is much less free in these matters than was the man of the 16th and 17th century. And in the world of politics, modern man constantly faces obstacles which suppress his tendencies and impulses. But it is impossible to keep the individual in such a situation for long. The individual who feels himself in conflict with the group, whose personal values are different from those of his milieu, who feels tension toward his society and even toward the group in which he participates, that individual is in a tragic situation in modern society. Until recently, such an individual enjoyed a certain freedom, a certain independence, which allowed him to release his tension in external and quite acceptable actions. 
He had a circle of personal activities through which he could express his own values and live out his conflicts. That was the best way of maintaining his equilibrium. But in the technological society, the individual no longer has either the independence or the choice of activities sufficient to release his tensions properly. He is forced to keep them inside himself. Under such conditions, the tension becomes extreme and can cause illness. At that very moment, propaganda will intervene as the fake instrument for reducing these tensions by external action. Footnote. It is well known to what extent modern man needs escape. Escape is a general phenomenon of our civilization because man has to battle against far too many contradictions and tensions imposed on him by the conditions of life. He seeks to flee these difficulties and is encouraged to do so by the contemporary ideology of happiness. Propaganda offers him an extraordinary possibility of escape into action. To seal all outlets and suppress man in all areas is dangerous. Man needs to express his passions and desires. Collective social repression can have the same effect as individual repression, which is the concern of psychoanalysts. Either sublimation or release is necessary. On the collective level, the latter is easier than the former, though some of the most oppressed groups were the most easily led to acts of heroism and sacrifice for the benefit of their oppressors. In the need for release we find some spontaneous expression. Surely jazz is a means for many young people of releasing repressed impulses, and so are violent displays. James Dean, black leather jackets, the rebellion in Sweden in 1957, and so on. But whereas these possibilities of release are very limited, propaganda offers release on a grand scale. For example, propaganda will permit what so far was prohibited, such as hatred, which is a dangerous and destructive feeling and fought by society. But man always has a certain need to hate, just as he hides in his heart the urge to kill. Propaganda offers him an object of hatred for all propaganda is aimed at an enemy. Footnote. Propaganda thus displaces and liberates feelings of aggression by offering specific objects of hatred to the citizen. This generally suffices to channelize passion. And the hatred it offers him is not shameful, evil hatred that he must hide, but a legitimate hatred which he can justly feel. Moreover, propaganda points out enemies that must be slain, transforming crime into a praiseworthy act. Almost every man feels a desire to kill his neighbor, but this is forbidden, and in most cases the individual will refrain from it for fear of the consequences. But propaganda opens the door and allows him to kill the Jews, the bourgeois, the communists, and so on, and such murder even becomes an achievement. Similarly, in the 19th century, when a man felt like cheating on his wife or divorcing her, he found this was frowned on. So at the end of that century, a propaganda appeared that legitimized adultery and divorce. In such cases, the individual attaches himself passionately to the source of such propaganda, which for him provides liberation. Where transgression becomes virtue, the lifter of the ban becomes a hero, a demigod and we consecrate ourselves to serve him because he has liberated our repressed passions. A good deal of popular allegiance to the Republic and of the failure of Catholicism in France at the end of the 19th century can be traced to this battle over adultery and divorce. Propaganda can also provide release through devious channels. Authoritarian regimes know that people held very firmly in hand need some decompression some safety valves. The government offers these itself. This role is played by satirical journals attacking the authorities, yet tolerated by the dictator, for example, Crocodile, or by a wild holiday set aside for ridiculing the regime, yet paid for by the dictator, for example, the Friday of Sorrows in Guatemala. Footnote. Self-criticism in the Soviet Union is well known. It is used to denounce shortcomings and errors of persons and institutions. 
It is also the means for control of the bureaucracy. But it particularly serves the purpose of relaxing tensions, channeling aggressive tendencies, and responding to the poor slob, l'empiste, who addresses himself to the government. Thus expressed, criticism ceases to endanger the government and the social order. The bureaucrat becomes the scapegoat and the party remains above reproach. The same operation is found in the use of letters from readers. It is one of the best propaganda operations. The more criticism of the bureaucrat is permitted, the more the citizen is tied to the government. This practice was greatly expanded by Khrushchev. It is not a matter of liberalization, but of integrating the individual in society and consolidating the power of the state. It is the same method as that of counseling in American human relations practices. Clearly, such instruments are controlled by the regime. They serve the function of giving the people the impression that they are free and of singling out those about to be purged by the government as guilty of all that the people dislike. Thus, these instruments of criticism serve to consolidate power and make people cling even more to the regime by providing artificial release of tendencies that the state must keep in check. In such situations, propaganda has an almost therapeutic and compensatory function. This role is even more prominent in the presence of another phenomenon, anxiety. Anxiety is perhaps the most widespread psychological trait in our society. Many studies indicate that fear is one of the strongest and most prevalent feelings in our society. Of course, man has good reasons to be afraid of communist subversion, revolution, fascism, H-bombs, conflict between East and West, unemployment, sickness. On the one hand, the number of dangers is increasing and, because of the news media, man is more aware of them. On the other, religious beliefs, which allow man to face fear, have disappeared almost entirely. Man is disarmed in the face of the perils threatening him, and is increasingly alarmed by these perils because he keeps reading about them. For example, the many medical articles on illness in the major newspapers are disastrous because they attract man's attention to the presence of illness. Information provokes fear. This largely explains why the dominant fears in our society are social fears, tied to such collective and general phenomena as political situations, much more dominant than such individual fears as those of death or of ghosts. But fear tied to a real threat, and of a degree proportionate to that threat, is not anxiety. Karen Horney was right in stating that an essential difference between fear and anxiety is that anxiety is a reaction disproportionate to the actual danger, or a reaction to an imaginary danger. She was also right in pointing out that anxiety is actually tied to the conditions of our civilization, though the dangers to which a person responds with anxiety may remain hidden from him. The anxiety may be proportionate to the situation, but it still may be experienced for unknown reasons. With regard to real and conscious threats, a frequent reaction is to expand them with fables. Americans create fables about the communist peril, just as the communists create fables about the fascist peril, and at that moment anxiety sets in. It is tied to rumors, to the fact that the real situation is inassailable, to the diffuse climate of fear, and to the ricocheting of fear from one person to the next. However that may be, anxiety exists and spreads. It is irrational, and any attempt to calm it with reason or facts must fail. To demonstrate factually in a climate of anxiety that the feared danger is much smaller than it is believed to be only increases anxiety. The information is used to prove that there is reason for fear. Of course, in psychoanalysis, anxiety is often regarded as the source of neurosis, but as we maintain here, that anxiety is a collective phenomenon affecting a very large number of individuals in our society. We do not want to say that all these people are neurotics in the clinical sense. Anxiety provoked by social conflicts or political threats rarely goes so far as to cause neurosis. But such a progression is not impossible. We will simply say that individuals find themselves in a situation in which neurosis is a constant possibility, 
and neurosis can actually become collective when some event throws a whole group into frenzied anxiety or irrational considerations. Man also feels himself the prey of the hostile impulses of others, another source of anxiety. Besides, he is plunged into conflicts inherent in our society, which place him in conflict with himself, or rather, places experiences in conflict with the social imperatives. Karen Horna has described some of these conflicts, but many more exist. Aside from the conflict between the government's proclaimed respect for our needs and their frustration in reality, between the advertised freedom and the real constraints, peace is worshipped in societies that prepare for war, culture is spread that cannot be absorbed, and so on. The experience of contradiction is certainly one of the prevalent experiences in our society, but man cannot endure contradiction. Anxiety results, and man struggles to resolve the contradiction in order to dissolve his anxiety. Finally, as a result of all the threats and contradictions in contemporary society, man feels accused, guilty. He cannot feel that he is right and good as long as he is exposed to contradictions which place him in conflict with one of his group's imperatives, no matter which solution he adopts. But one of man's greatest inner needs is to feel that he is right. This need takes several forms. First, man needs to be right in his own eyes. He must be able to assert that he is right, that he does what he should, that he is worthy of his own respect. Then man needs to be right in the eyes of those around him, his family, his milieu, his co-workers, his friends, his country. Finally, he feels the need to belong to a group which he considers right and which he can proclaim as just, noble, and good. But that righteousness is not absolute righteousness, true and authentic justice. What matters is not to be just or to act just or that the group to which one belongs is just, but to seem just. To find reasons for asserting that one is just, and to have these reasons shared by one's audience. This corresponds to man's refusal to see reality, his own reality first of all, as it is, for that would be intolerable. It also corresponds to his refusal to acknowledge that he may be wrong. Before himself and others, man is constantly pleading his own case and working to find good reasons for what he does or has done. Of course, the whole process is unconscious. Footnote The individual reconstructs his past to demonstrate that his conduct was right, but this is justification rather than explanation of behavior. Man thus lives in seemingly reasonable fiction. Such justification corresponds at least partly to what American psychologists call rationalization, that is, the search for good reasons. But rationalization covers less territory than justification. Rationalization occurs when the individual is prey to the difficulties of social life. The collision with various groups and other individuals provokes tension, conflicts, frustrations, failures, and anxieties for which man has a low tolerance. He tries to avoid all this but cannot. He therefore gives himself excuses and good reasons for avoiding the disagreeable consequences of such conflicts or fabricates a conclusion which explains his failure and gives it the appearance of success. Sour grapes. Or he justifies everything by creating a scapegoat or justifies his conduct by showing that the other party is to blame. Racial prejudice and so forth. Clearly, the individual believes the reasons he gives, all the more so as these reasons are good to the extent that they are shared by a large number of people, if not by everybody. The individual who justifies himself is always scandalized if told that the reasons he gives for his conduct are false, that he has acted for other reasons, and that his explanations are only embroideries to make his conduct acceptable and to win praise for it. This need seems abnormal. On the individual level, it is often considered pathological because it shows a dissociation from the self. But in reality, this judgment was discarded because of its moral implications, the process involved being nothing other than hypocrisy. It was then concluded that there is nothing pathological in this need for two reasons. 
The first is the universality of the phenomenon. Practically everybody justifies himself all the time, to himself and to his group, and it is difficult to call a general attitude pathological. The second is the usefulness of the process. It is generally accepted nowadays that in his psychic life man automatically finds what is useful for him and permits him to exercise economies. Justification is undeniably useful. Through justification man not only defends himself against tensions and anxieties, transforming failure into success, but also asserts his sense of right and wrong, justice and injustice. Often a man's true beliefs are revealed only through this channel, justification. Such hypocrisy has another use. It permits man to cast off some of his inhibitions without having to assert anti-moral or anti-social convictions publicly. Whereas inhibited behavior is damaging to society, an overloud declaration of immoral or asocial convictions is damaging too. Here we encounter the old problem. Is it better to behave badly and hide it, as in 1900, or to behave badly and advertise it, as in 1960, taking into account that the man of 1960 uses different justifications? The process of justification is thus found everywhere because of its great utility. On the collective level, one can say that most ideologies and political or economic theories are justifications. A study by M. Rubel has shown that Marx's rigid and seemingly uncompromising doctrine was one gigantic intellectual justification for sentimental and spontaneous positions taken by him in his youth. Footnote Karl Marx Essai de biographie intellectuelle, 1957 It is difficult, if not impossible, to accept reality as it is and acknowledge the true reasons for our behavior, or to see clearly the motivations of a group to which we belong. If we practice a profession, we cannot limit ourselves to its financial rewards. We must also invest it with idealistic or moral justification. It becomes our calling, and we will not tolerate its being questioned. Even the most pragmatic, such as the Nazis, try to give their actions moral or social justification. For example, the concern for maintaining the superiority of the Aryan race justified the sadism of the concentration camps. Even the greatest materialists, such as the communists, try to justify themselves with ideals. For example, Humanitarian interests will justify a certain tactic. In the conflict between necessity and moral or religious imperatives, everybody covers himself with the cloak of rationalization to assert that no conflict exists. When a man obeys necessity, he wants to prove that such is not the case and that he really obeys his conscience. On the day when the draft is introduced, everybody discovers he has a fervent love for his country. On the day when Stalin allies himself with Hitler, the communists discover the excellence of German socialism. And on the day when the Hungarian government forces the Christian church to make peace propaganda, the church discovers voluntarily that peace is a Christian virtue. Obviously, the prodigious universality of justification makes it so effective. The man who justifies himself and unconsciously plays this farce not only believes it himself, but also has the need for others to believe it. And, in fact, the others do believe it, because they use the same rationalizations and become accomplices of the play in which they are themselves actors. Justification really attains its effectiveness only on the basis of this complicity, which is so all-pervasive that even those who are the victims of justification go along with it. For example, the racist justifies his prejudice by saying that the inferior group is lazy, antisocial, immoral, biologically inferior, and in many instances members of the stigmatized group will accept such judgments and experience a feeling of inferiority that will justify discrimination in their own eyes. That is because they, too, use justifications on other levels. The tremendous diversity of these personal and collective justifications derives from three sources. 
First, the traditional explanations transmitted to us by the group to which we belong and instilled in us through school and so forth. For example, the judgment of the worker by the bourgeoisie, which goes back to 1815 and is carefully transmitted from generation to generation. The worker is a lazy brute and a drunk. Or take France's mission to spread civilization, used to justify colonialism. Second, there are the rationalizations which we ourselves fabricate spontaneously. These usually deal with our own conduct rather than with that of the group. What interests us most here is the third type of rationalizations, which are both individual and collective, which deal with new situations and unforeseen necessities, and to which traditional solutions do not apply. These rationalizations are the fruit of propaganda. Propaganda attaches itself to man and forces him to play its game because of his overpowering need to be right and just. In every situation, propaganda hands him the proof that he, personally, is in the right, that the action demanded of him is just, even if he has the dark, strong feeling that it is not. Propaganda appeases his tensions and resolves his conflicts. It offers facile, ready-made justifications which are transmitted by society and easily believed. At the same time, propaganda has the freshness and novelty which correspond to new situations and give man the impression of having invented new ideals. It provides man with a high ideal that permits him to give in to his passions while seeming to accomplish a great mission. It is precisely when propaganda furnishes man with these justifications, at once individual and collective, that propaganda is most effective. We are not talking here of a simple explanation, but of a more profound rationalization, thanks to which man finds himself in full accord with his group and with society, and fully adjusted to his environment, as well as purged, at the same time, of his pangs of conscience and personal uncertainty. Man, eager for self-justification, throws himself in the direction of a propaganda that justifies him and thus eliminates one of the sources of his anxiety. Propaganda dissolves contradictions and restores to man a unitary world in which the demands are in accord with the facts. It gives man a clear and simple call to action that takes precedence over all else. It permits him to participate in the world around him without being in conflict with it because the action he has been called upon to perform will surely remove all obstacles from the path of realizing the proclaimed ideal. Here, propaganda plays a completely idealistic role by involving a man caught in the world of reality and making him live by anticipation in a world based on principle. From then on, man no longer sees contradiction as a threat to himself or as a distortion of his personality. The contradiction through propaganda becomes an active source of conquest and combat. He is no longer alone when trying to solve his conflicts, but is plunged into a collective on the march, which is always at the point of solving all conflicts and leading man and his world to a satisfying monism. One is always at the point of finishing the war, in Algeria or Vietnam or the Congo, of overtaking the United States of repelling the communist threat, of eliminating all frustrations. Finally, propaganda also eliminates anxieties stemming from irrational and disproportionate fears, for it gives man assurances equivalent to those formerly given him by religion. It offers him a simple and clear explanation of the world in which he lives, to be sure a false explanation far removed from reality, but one that is obvious and satisfying. It hands him a key with which he can open all doors. There is no more mystery. Everything can be explained, thanks to propaganda. It gives him special glasses through which he can look at present-day history and clearly understand what it means. It hands him a guideline with which he can recover the general line running through all incoherent events. Now the world ceases to be hostile and menacing. The propagandi experiences feelings of mastery over and lucidity toward this menacing and chaotic world, all the more because propaganda provides him with a solution for all threats and a posture to assume in the face of them. Crowds go mad when they no longer know what posture to assume toward a threat. 
Propaganda provides the perfect posture with which to place the adversary at a disadvantage. There is no question here of reassuring the people or of demonstrating the reality of a situation to them. Nothing could upset them more. The point is to excite them, to arouse their sense of power, their desire to assert themselves, and to arm them psychologically so that they can feel superior to the threat. And the man who seeks to escape his strangling anxiety by any means will feel miraculously delivered as soon as he can participate in the campaign mounted by propaganda, as soon as he can dive into this liberating activity which resolves his inner conflicts by making him think that he is helping to solve those of society. For all these reasons, contemporary man needs propaganda. He asks for it. In fact, he almost instigates it. The development of propaganda is no accident. The politician who uses it is not a monster. He fills a social demand. The propagandi is a close accomplice of the propagandist. Only with the propagandi's unconscious complicity can propaganda fulfill its function. And because propaganda satisfies him, even if he protests against propaganda in abstracto, or considers himself immune to it, he follows its route. We have demonstrated that propaganda, far from being an accident, performs an indispensable function in society. One always tries to present propaganda as something accidental, unusual, exceptional, connected with such abnormal conditions as wars. True, in such cases, propaganda may become sharper and more crystallized, but the roots of propaganda go much deeper. Propaganda is the inevitable result of the various components of the technological society and plays so central a role in the life of that society that no economic or political development can take place without the influence of its great power. Human relations in social relationships, advertising or human engineering in the economy, propaganda in the strictest sense in the field of politics, the need for psychological influence to spur allegiance and action is everywhere the decisive factor, which progress demands and which the individual seeks in order to be delivered from his own self.